Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour. J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny. With Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with Call Out the Marines. Back in Grandma's day, when Grandma wanted to serve the folks a particularly fine dessert, the dessert she chose was pretty apt to be rich, shimmering jello. And today, housewives still reach for that familiar red-lettered package still depend on Jell-O for their most tempting treats. Yes, Jell-O is now more than ever America's favorite gelatin dessert. Because Jell-O today is better than ever. That famous Jell-O flavor has a new vividness, a new thrill to it. It's now locked in, protected for your pleasure by a new and exclusive Jell-O process. A process that locks Jell-O's intriguing goodness right into the tiny Jell-O particles and gives you an exciting new richness and extra delicious flavor that will have you shouting hurrah for the first time you taste it. But why not prove all this for yourself? Open a package of Jell-O. Notice that there's no sweet, fruity aroma, no sign of escaping flavor. Then dissolve the Jell-O just as you would in making a Jell-O dessert. And notice how the captive flavor rushes out marvelously rich. Ask your grocer for several packages of Jell-O tomorrow and discover for yourself how Jell-O's new process makes Jell-O better than ever. Call out the Marines played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, inasmuch as this evening marks the halfway point of our radio season, I think it only fair that we pay tribute to the man who has contributed his invaluable services to the Jell-O show. Well. A man upon whose broad shoulders rests the burden of maintaining the high comedy level of this program. Gee. And here he is, folks, our sound effects man, Mr. Virgil Reimer. <laughs> Hey, hey, what is this? Jello again. This is Virgil Reimer talking. And folks, I want to tell you this is the happiest wait day. Wait a minute. Of... Wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. What's going on here, Don? Well, Jack, I thought the public might be sort of tired of hearing me introduce you week after week. So for a switch, I thought I'd introduce one of the men behind the scenes. Oh. Oh, you thought you'd pull a little surprise on your old boss, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and you certainly fell for it. I did. I did at that. <laughs> well, Don, um, I've got a little surprise for you, too. Uh, remember one day in New York when I was having lunch with Harry Von Zell? Uh-huh. And you got all upset about it, and I told you not to worry? Yes. Well, knit your eyebrows, brother. The heat's on again. <laughs> Now, let's get going with the program. Okay. Jello again. This is Virgil Reimer talking. And, folks, a funny thing happened to me on the way... Virgil! (laughs) Go away, will you, and stick to your sound effect. Oh, give him a chance, Jack. After all, I introduced him, so let him say a few words. Oh, all right. Go ahead, Virgil, but make it snappy. Thanks, chum. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the studio. I was walking down the street. Hmm. And the traffic was something terrible. Oh, for Pete's sake. When all of a sudden, a panhandler walked up and asked me for a nickel for a cup of coffee, so I gave it to him. (laughs) Oh, fine. Now listen, Virgil. Just then, it started to rain. Rain? The wonder it didn't thunder. Now cut that out! (laughs) All right, Virgil, you gave the panhandler a nickel, so what happened? It was a lead nickel, so he took out his gun and killed me. (laughs) I thank you. That was
was very clever, Virgil. Now get up off the floor and go back to your clinks and clanks. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. What's the sound man doing on the floor? Virgil? Oh, he's just trying to be funny. Everybody working for NBC wants to be a comedian. Well, what's wrong with that? Give the kid a chance. Listen, Mary, comedians are born, not made. Take me, for instance. I got the biggest laughs you ever heard when I was only three months old. <laughs> What'd you do, make off like a fan dancer with your diapers? <laughs> No, I used to stick my feet in my mouth and roll around like a rubber ball. I can go along with a gag, <laughs> sister. <laughs> Jack, uh, Jack, you say comedians are born and not made. Now, did you get into show business as a comedian? No, no. As a matter of fact, Don, I started out as a concert violinist. You started out as a janitor at the Barrison Theater in Waukegan. As a janitor? Yes, I found an old picture of you and you were holding a broom. I was holding that broom because I was cast as a witch in a Halloween play. <laughs> That takes care of the broom. Good. Now explain the dustpan. <laughs> hmm. Well, you got me in a corner again. You know, someday I'd like to broadcast from a roundhouse. You know? <laughs> now, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. How's the old gent with the gray hair? He's fine. I just got a letter from my dad this morning. <laughs> Phil means you. I know who he means. <laughs> Anyway, thanks for asking, Phil. Say, uh, Phil, how are you coming along with your French lessons? Have you learned anything new? Oh, yes. How's our French scholar progressing? Well, remember last week how I learned to say je manger la fenêtre? Yes, you ate the window, yes. <laughs> yes, I remember. Well, get a load of this one. Je dorme don la encrière. Very good. Very good, Phil. What does that mean? I sleep in the inkwell. <laughs> What? What are you talking about? You sleep in the inkwell. He must have had a fight with Alice. <laughs> Look, Phil, as long as you're studying French, why don't you learn something that makes sense? Jackson, it's a tough language. I gotta take it any way I can get it. <laughs> All right, sleep in the inkwell. Eat the window. It's your life. <laughs> All I ask is that you don't show off when Humphrey Bogart gets here. Humphrey Bogart? Is he going to be on the program tonight? Yes, we're going to finish the murder mystery we started last week. And Bogart has had a lot of experience along that line in pictures, so I thought he'd be just the right guy for my assistant. Uh, let me get this straight. Humphrey Bogart is going to be your assistant? Yes. That is, he's going to be one of my assistants. Phil will be my first assistant, and Bogart will help Phil. It'll work out fine. Now, Dennis... Yes, please? Hmm. <laughs> uh, you, of course, are going to be the murdered man, and you'll have to lay on the floor again tonight. I figured on that, so I wore my old clothes. You can't wear old clothes. You're supposed to be Mr. Homer J. Frightwig, a wealthy stockbroker. Have you seen the market reports lately? <laughs> That's not the point. Anyway, take this carnation and put it in your buttonhole so you look a little more convincing. And here's another Say, thing. Say, uh, Jack, he's here. Who? Who's here? Oh, well, hello, Humphrey. Hello, Jack. Glad to see you. Ladies and gentlemen, that star of Warner Brothers Pictures, Mr. Humphrey Bogart. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Humphrey, it's darn nice of you to come over here tonight and help us solve our little murder mystery. I'm glad to do it, Jack. I heard you play last week, and I figured somebody should do something about it. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Say, Humphrey, we'll start casting in a minute, but uh, first I want you to meet the members of my gang. Uh, this great big fellow here is Don Wilson. It's a pleasure, Don. Put her there, Humphrey. Out! <laughs> Watch out, Don. He's as strong as a three-cent cigar. You ought to know. Quiet. <laughs> and, Humphrey, this is Mary Livingston, our little comedian. Uh, say something funny for Mr. Bogart, Mary. Oh, shut up. <laughs> well, shake hands with him anyway. Okay. Glad to know you, Miss Livingston. Put her there. Ouch! <laughs> Mary. And this is Dennis Day, our young tenor, and Phil Harris, our musical genius. Hiya, fellas. Bonsoir. Come on, tally boo, Humphrey. <laughs> Humphrey? <laughs> is that French, Humphrey? <laughs> <laughs> Phil. 
Phil, uh, stop, stop showing off, you know? You know, Mr. Bogart, I took my girl to see you and all through the night, and did you make a hit with her? Did you make a hit? <laughs> Dennis. Ah, oh, she kind of liked me, eh, kid? Well, she talks out of the side of her mouth now, if that means anything. <laughs> well, that's real hero worship. I guess we can get started with the casting, Humphrey. Say, where's Rochester? I'd like to see him. Oh, he won't be with us tonight, Humphrey. He has a cold. He'll be all right next week, though. He's got the strongest cough medicine. <laughs> well... <laughs> uh, let's get started. Uh... You've met everybody. What about me? Am I an old shoe or something? <laughs> Believe me, Virgil, he's not interested in meeting you. But if it'll make you happy, all right. Humphrey, this is Virgil Reimer, our great sound man. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Reimer. I've admired your work on this program for a long time. You see? <laughs> okay, okay. Now let's get on with our sketch. Uh, this evening, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to present the second episode of our mystery melodrama, The Fright Week Murder Case, or That Rug Will Have to Go to the Cleaners. <laughs> now, Dennis Day will be Mr. Fright Week, the victim. Howdy, folks. Lay down. <laughs> Mary will be his wife, who misses him now, but didn't when she shot him. And Don... Yes, Jack? You're going to be Jurgen the butler. Only this week, I wish you'd be a little more highbrow. Can you talk with an English accent? Well, I'll try. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies. the next time you toddle down to your neighborhood grocer, why don't you ask the clerk for a package of jello? <laughs> package? You will find that it comes in six terribly divine flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and pip-pip. <laughs> Don, if it weren't for the fact that you were talking about our product, I'd say that your accent was about as English as Sambo and Tambo, you know? <laughs> now, where are we? Oh, yes. I, of course, will play the part of Detective Captain O'Benny of police headquarters. Phil Harris will be my assistant. And Mr. Humphrey Bogart will be Phil's assistant. Now, in this drama... Just a minute, Jack. Hold it. Would you mind repeating that? Why, certainly. <laughs> I said, uh, I'll be Detective Captain O'Benny, Phil will be my assistant, and you'll be Phil's assistant. Oh, I see. Yeah, well, I'd like to speak to you about that. Uh-oh. -uh. What are you uh on about? Why, what's, uh, what's on your mind, Humphrey? Well, frankly, I don't like the idea of being Phil's assistant. Well, all right, then you can be my assistant, and Phil can be yours. Now, in this drama... Just a second, Blue Eyes. <laughs> Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, what, uh, what is it, Humphrey? Now, let's get this straight. Here's the way it's gonna be, see? I'm the captain, Phil's gonna be my assistant, and you're gonna be his assistant. Hmm. But, uh, but Humphrey... Now, look, I don't want any trouble. I'm a nice, easy-going guy, but I didn't come over here to get kicked around. Well, who kicked you? I mean... <laughs> Did you kick him, Dennis? Did you kick him, Don? You know what I mean. I'm going to be the captain, and that's final. All right, all right. And you don't have to grab my coat while you're talking to me. <laughs> now, let go. And another thing, Mr. Bogart, I'm paying you for being here on this program tonight so you can be a little more civil. Oh, are you going to pay me? Yeah. Well, I'm not exactly paying you in cash, but I was going to send you a lovely present. A fountain pen or... or something. Now, you send me a fountain pen, I'll squirt it right in your eye. <laughs> hmm. Is that so? Oh, Jack, let him be the captain. What else can I do? <laughs> Got a good mind to punch him right in the nose. Well, why don't you? Because he's carrying a gun. He's what? A gad. He's packing a gad. <laughs> well, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Humphrey Bogart will play the part of Detective Captain O'Benny. I want my own name. All right, you'll be O. Bogart. <laughs> and Phil, I will be your assistant. I, I, are you happy? Yes. Oh, well, then let go of me. How many times do I have to tell you? 
Now, this exciting drama, ladies and gentlemen, will go on immediately after a number by Phil Harris and his orchestra. Play, Phil. Here's my part, Humphrey. Get familiar with it. had a pedal rendered by Phil Harris and his orchestra. Render meaning to tear apart. <laughs> That's a Lulu! Virgil! <laughs> now, Virgil, get away from that mic. And stop trying to be funny on my program. What's the matter? Do you see the handwriting on the wall? <laughs> now, listen, Virgil. Virgil, if I have any more trouble with you, you're getting out of here. And I'd also like to get rid of Bogart. What was that? What did you say? I said when I was a kid, I had a go-kart. <laughs> Do you mind if I had a little fun? <laughs> if I hadn't given a quart of blood to the Red Cross, I'd tear him to pieces. <laughs> A quart of blood? Yes. You've been down there ten times and I haven't even found a vein yet. They'll find one, don't worry. Now settle down, everybody. Let me announce our play. Pardon me, Jack. I'm announcing it. All right, announce it. Boy, I never saw such a ham. <laughs> Ought to have my head examined for inviting him over here. And will you cut out that mumbling? Listen, I've been talking to myself for 20 years. I'm not going to stop now. <laughs> Go ahead, announce the play. <clears throat> and now, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to offer the second episode of our mystery melodrama entitled The Fright Week Murder Case, or All Through Tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Had to give his new picture a plug. I like the picture, though, but what I could have done with his part, boy. Jack, pipe down. Oh, poof. <laughs> Now, as you may remember, last week, Mr. Homer J. Frightwick was found murdered in his den. He was shot several times. In fact, his chest looked like a well-patronized punch board. Boy, I'd have gotten a yell with that line. A yell. They'd have screamed at me. Virgil! <laughs> Go ahead, Humphrey, you gangster. Captain O'Benny was called into the case but was unable to make any headway. So this week, I will solve the crime. I'll bet. Go ahead, you thug. As the scene opens, we find Cap Detective Captain O'Bogard and his two assistants... Had to make a mistake. Had to make a mistake. <laughs> Find Detective Captain O'Bogard and his two assistants. Yeah. <laughs> In their office at police headquarters. <laughs> Kirk, music. <laughs> Oh, Sergeant O'Hara. Yes, Captain. What's new on the Fenchel robbery? Did you find out if the chauffeur had anything to do with it? Well, it couldn't have been the chauffeur, Cap. He had an airtight alibi. Alibis, alibis. This is the third month of the investigation and we're no further than we were when we started. Something has got to be done, I tell you. I want action. Do you understand? Action. Yes, sir. <laughs> Not scaring me, I can tell you that. 
I listen, O'Harris. What makes you think the chauffeur is innocent? Well, at the time of the robbery, he was out of town. We traced him as far as Altoona, Pennsylvania. Altoona, eh? Boy, what a hit I used to be in that town. <laughs> Stopped the show every night. Well, what happened after he left Altoona? Well, we traced him as far as Chicago, and then we lost track of him until last week when he turned up in Los Angeles with a blonde. With a blonde, eh? Shut up! Hmm. <laughs> All right, but if you ask me... There's a phone. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. All right, take it. <laughs> Such a little guy, I can't understand why I don't slug him. You're a coward. Oh, yes. <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Police headquarters, Captain O'Bogart speaking. Hello, Bogey. This is Mrs. Homer J. Frightwig. Oh, yes, yes. What is it, Mrs. Frightwig? Listen, Kathy, why don't you come over and investigate my husband's murder? Uh, it's no use. I can't find any clues. Well, drop in anyway. It's a rainy afternoon. Come on over. Okay, madam. But I'm going to find out who killed your husband. Well, if you're real nice, I'll tell you. Come on over. Yes, ma'am. I'll be there in a few minutes. Well, bring some olives. I've got the toothpicks. So long. So long. Who was that, Cap? Yeah, who was it? Fine part I've got. <laughs> Wish I had my violin with me. <laughs> well, who was it? That was Mrs. Homer J. Frightwick. Come on, men. We're going over to her house right away. And I'm going to solve this crime... Or my name ain't Do Bogart. Calling all cars. Calling all cars. Enjoy your ride. You'll soon be walking. <laughs> that is all. Well, here we are, Cap. Yeah, this is the place, all right. Break the door down, O Benny. Yes, sir. Stand back. Open this door, or I'll break it down. Open this door, or I'll break it down. Well, what are you waiting for, Virgil? Break down the door. Please. You won't hear a single splitter until you apologize. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry I bawled you out. Now go ahead with the door. Very good. Well, who's this? Good evening, gentlemen. Did you ring? <laughs> ring? This guy's the butler, Cap. I know who he is. Now listen, you, where's the body? That ain't a bearskin rug grinning at you. <laughs> hmm. That's Mr. Frightwig, all right. And he's laying there just the way he was shot. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> Some tough guy. I bet anything he faints. What was that? Well, come on, Humphrey. Find out who done it. Just a minute, miss. Who are you? I am Fifi, the French maid. Oh, yeah? Now, listen, Fee. My name is Fifi. Well, I'm in a hurry. Sit down, will you? <laughs> Say, let me talk to her, Cap. I speak the language very fluent. Fluent? <laughs> now, listen, Fifi. What do you know about this murder? Je ne sais rien du tout de ce meurtre. Je suis seulement la bonne ici. Et naturellement, je ne l'ai pas commis. Oui, oui. <laughs> Je ne suis dans ce pays que fort peu de temps et je ne connais pas beaucoup de monde. Je menais une vie solitaire. Oui, oui. J'aimerais bien un rendez-vous avec un Américain. Euh, Voulez-vous me rencontrer at the corner of Sunset and Western at 8 o'clock? Hmm, what you say, Harris? I don't know, but I'll be there. <laughs> so will I. She must have a friend. Fine policeman. Why does you get on with the case and grill Mrs. Frightwig? Where is she? Here she comes now! Well, good evening, gents. Pull up my husband and sit down. Now, listen, Mr. Frightwig. You keep out of this. All right, all right. I'm going to take a look around this house, see if I can find some clues. Now, tell me, Mrs. Frightwig, what do you know about this murder? Grill me, Cap, grill me. What's on your mind? Now, I want the truth. Did you shoot your husband? Couldn't have been Cupid. There's no arrows in him. I don't believe you killed him, Mrs. Frightwig. 
And we're going to stay right in this house until we find out who committed the crime. Okay, boys, how do you like your eggs? <laughs> Say, Cap, Cap, I just heard a noise in that closet. A noise? Yeah, there's somebody hiding in there. It might be the murderer. Let me have your gun. I didn't bring it with me. Here, take mine. Now, thanks. Now, listen, you. We know you're in that closet, so come out. And come out with your hands up. Come out, do you hear? Hello, fellas. <laughs> Surprised? Oh, it's you. What were you doing in that closet, oh, Benny? I'll tell you what I was doing there. I can't keep it a secret any longer. I committed that crime. I murdered Mr. Homer J. Frightwood. What are you talking about? I killed him, I tell you. Killed him, killed him. He was a dirty rat and he had it coming to him. And I'm glad I did it, I tell you. <laughs> glad, glad. You did nothing of the kind. You're just trying to build up your part. I am now. <laughs> Confess, slap the handcuffs on me. Take me to jail. What are you waiting for? What a ham. <laughs> Come on, Mrs. Friedwig. Let you and I go out and have a cup of coffee. Okay, Kathy. I'm going with you. No, no, you can't go until you arrest me. I'm a killer. Do you hear a killer? And I also committed the... Oh, I'm nuts. Well, I'll be darned. Hey, where did they go? They went out for some coffee, Mr. Friedwig. Oh. That stupid Bogart doesn't believe I killed you. Well, that's the way it goes. Yeah. Say, do you play gin rummy? Sure. Well, lay down and start dealing. <laughs> okay, hit it, boys. you be proud, won't the family be pleased when you serve this grand dessert? Imperial Peach Mold, a swell jello treat that's bound to win you compliments galore, yet a treat that's delightfully easy to make. All you do is simply dissolve one package of orange jello in one pint of hot water and peach juice and chill until slightly thickened. Next, fold in one cup of canned sliced peaches drained, or if you wish, a box of quick frozen sliced peaches, freshly thawed. Then mold and chill until firm. And there's a mighty attractive, mighty good dessert. Delicious blend of juicy golden sliced peaches and bright shimmering orange jello. So get a can of sliced peaches or a box of quick frozen sliced peaches from your grocer tomorrow and combine them with orange jello for a really delightful treat. But be sure you get genuine jello, friends, because jello's new locked in flavor gives you extra richness makes Jell-O more tempting and delicious than ever. This is the last number of the 18th program in the Courage Jell-O series, and we will be with you again next Sunday at the same time. Well, Humphrey, thanks very much for coming up here tonight. You kind of took over the program, didn't you? <laughs> I did it that. No hard feelings, Jack. No, 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 you were very amusing. Take him out in the alley and give him a couple of pokes. What was... What was that? I said, good night, folks. I always say that. <laughs> good night, folks. Humphrey Bogart appeared on our program tonight through courtesy of Warner Brothers Pictures. The tune called out the Marines is from the picture of the same name. Jell-O puddings, please. Just say that to your grocer tomorrow, friends, and see if you don't make the acquaintance of some of the swellest desserts you ever tasted. Jell-O puddings. Rich, creamy puddings made by the same folks who make Jell-O. There's Jell-O vanilla pudding. Smooth, mellow, and thrillingly rich. Tops for delicate, tempting flavor. And not only grand as a pudding, but perfect as a creamy filling for pies, tarts, and cakes. So tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, get Jell-O puddings, too. They're just like grandma's, only more so. The Jell-O program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI, Los Angeles. Jell-O. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Mama.
Now at last, the gelatin dessert that gives you all the flavor. It's the new Jell-O, the gelatin dessert that keeps all of its full original flavor no matter how long it remains in the package. Up until now, gelatin desserts constantly faded in flavor while waiting to be used, lost much of their real taste and tingle. But the new Jell-O is different. Today, Jell-O's deep, vivid richness is locked right into the tiny Jell-O particles where time can't touch it. Jell-O loses nothing on its way to you. It comes out of the package as rich and full flavored as it went in. Just prove it for yourself. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice that there's no heavy, fruity aroma, no sign of escaping flavor. It's there in all its thrilling goodness. Order several packages tomorrow and look for the big red letters on the box so that you're sure it's the one and only Jell-O. In Jell-O, the flavor never goes away. We put it in and it's there to stay. played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we would like to turn the clock back to last Friday night and show you what happened when Jack and the rest of our gang went out and celebrated Halloween. The time, 7.30 Friday evening. The place, Jack's house in Beverly Hills. Take it away. I don't want to set the world on fire. Rochester. I just want to go where I can get dough. <laughs> Rochester, stop complaining in rhythm and help me get into my Halloween costume. The gang will be here any minute. Hand me those horns. Here you are. Pardon the ignorance, boss, but what character are you struggling to convey? <laughs> my costume is very obvious. I've got on red underwear, a long tail, horns, and I'm carrying a pitchfork. Now, who am I? The man from the finance company. <laughs> I am not. I'm the devil. Now, hand me that mirror. Here you are. Thanks. No, I don't like this effect. These darn horns keep slipping, slipping over to one side. The horns are all right. It's your toupee that slips. <laughs> Something wrong there. I don't know why I picked out a devil costume anyway. Of course, I bought this pair of horns. I should use them. Why don't you put one of them on your nose and go as a rhinoceros? <laughs> no, I can't do that. Phil Harris is coming as Frank Buck and he'd shoot me. <laughs> he'd love the excuse. I wonder if this tail is too long here. See who's at the door, Rochester. Yes, sir. Come in. I could have done that myself. <laughs> Rochester, when I tell you... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Mary, this is Halloween. I thought you were going to dress up tonight. Where's your costume? I've got it on. I'm Pocahontas. Pocahontas? In a mink coat? John Smith was nice to me. <laughs> oh, you're a wampum digger, eh? <laughs> well, at least stick a feather in your hair. Make it believable. Say, what do you think of my outfit, Mary? Don't I look like the devil? Always. <laughs> I mean my costume. I'm supposed to be Satan. Can't you see my horns? Well, straighten up. You look like a toad. <laughs> Who ever heard of a red toad? There. Say, boss, I'm going to a masquerade party tonight myself. You are, Rochester? What are you going to be? I'm going to close my eyes and go as a Smith Brothers cough drop. <laughs> well, that's not a bad idea. Say, Rochester, why don't you keep one eye open and go as a period? How's that? I better keep both eyes open. My lady friends are over. <laughs> all right, do as you please. Jack, what are we going to do tonight? Where are we going? I got it all figured out. Listen to this. First, we'll go to Claudette Colbert's house, and then I'll take a piece of soap and write, Claudette loves Jack all over her window. Oh, you did that last year, and she came out and wrote, Jack who? <laughs> well, this time she'll know Jack who. When Claudette comes out of the house, I've got to grab her and give her a kiss. Now, there's only one guy kisses like Benny. You don't have to tell me, dead lips. <laughs> Mary, I'm going to give you a good jab with my pitchfork if you don't look out. 
Well, anyway, after we live Claudette. Come in, come in. Well, look what's hopping through the door. For Pete's sake, what an outfit. Hello, Jack, Mary. Hello, Don. What are you supposed to be? Why, can't you tell I'm a kangaroo? Well, sure enough, you certainly look realistic, Don, with those long ears sticking up and that great big pouch. <laughs> but say, say, I thought Dennis was coming with you. Where is the kid? Peekaboo. <laughs> Well, I'll be darned, a baby kangaroo. <laughs> Here, climb, uh, climb out, kid. Here, I'll help you. Thanks, Mr. Benny. Imagine coming as a little kangaroo. You know, I was gonna come as a floor lamp. A floor lamp? Yeah, but when I screwed the bulbs in my ears, they wouldn't light up. <laughs> Oh, that's terrible. Huh? Maybe I ought to see a doctor. <laughs> Dennis, you're not supposed to light up. <laughs> you know, Mary, someday I'll have to have a talk with that kid. Huh? By the way, Jack, isn't Phil going to join us tonight? Yeah, he'll drop by as soon as he finishes night school. Say, Dennis, while we're waiting around for him, let's hear that song you're going to do on the program Sunday. Yeah, get over to the piano, kid. Okay. Oh, say, Rochester, did you ask our boarder, Mr. Billingsley, to tune the piano? He's very good at it, you know. We should have never let him monkey with it, boss. Oh, what's he done now? That man's crazy. He cleaned the piano keys with dental floors. <laughs> oh, Mr. Billingsley must think he's a dentist again. It's a fine way to clean piano keys. He said the black ones were decayed, so he pulled them out. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. He broke eight needles trying to give the leg Novocaine. <laughs> well, it's my own fault, I guess. Well, do the best you can, Dennis. Go ahead. Wait a minute, I'll answer it. Hello? Oh, hello, Phil. Are you still at night school? We're waiting for you. What? She's keeping you after school. What happened, Jack? Well, Phil got a zero in spelling, so he gave the teacher a hot foot. <laughs> Look, Phil, is your teacher anywhere near the phone? Well, well, tell her your father wants to talk to her. Yeah, yeah, your father. What are you going to do, Jack? I'm going to pretend to be Phil's father. You know, I'll talk like an old rube. Well, you got the right underwear for it. <laughs> Quiet now, don't mix me up. Hello? Oh, hello, miss. This is Twitch Harris Sr. talking. <laughs> now, look, ma'am, i got to see my boy Philip right away, so I wish you'd let him off tonight. I'll write you a note explaining everything. I said I'd write you a note. <laughs> That's a good one. What'd she say? She wants to know how come I can write and Phil can't. <laughs> well, okay, thanks a lot, ma'am. Say, what are you doing later? <laughs> well, you can't shoot a man for trying. <laughs> Goodbye. Well, it's all set, fellas. Phil will be here pretty soon. You know, that teacher sure had a sweet voice. I could kind of go for her. But, Jack, you don't even know what she looks like. Anything he gets is gravy. <laughs> I don't know about that, sister. Sing, Dennis. See this pitchfork, Mary? You're going to get it. Now, you wait. I'm in a 
heaven when the music begins. I can see the sun when it's raining, hiding every cloud from my view. And why do I see rainbows when you're in my arms? I know why, and so Dennis, that song ought to go over swell Sunday. Thanks, Mr. Benny. Can I have something to eat? Yeah, I'm hungry, too. Haven't you got any sandwiches? I've got donuts and cider. That's all you're supposed to have on Halloween. Uh, bring in the donuts, Rochester. They're right here, boss. Oh, yes. Here, have a donut, Mary. They're nice and fresh. I made them myself. Jeepers, look at the size of the holes you got in them. <laughs> Never mind. They look like ladies' garters. <laughs> Quiet, will you? Oh, what she said. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> no use waiting. I gotta have a talk with that kid. <laughs> Here, Don. Don, have a donut. Have a donut and some of this sweet cider. Thanks. <laughs> I think I'll have a glass of that myself. Pretty strong, Jack. Strong? Let me taste this. Well, I'll be darned. Oh, Rochester! <laughs> yes, boy! <laughs> what did you put in this cider? A little Central Avenue vitamin! <laughs> There's gin in there. Now, now throw that cider out the window. You ain't gonna throw mine out. Dennis, you're not drinking any hard cider. You're a baby kangaroo. Well, oh, I can't hop on milk. <laughs> Let Don hop. Now, you get back in that pouch. Okay. See you later, fellas. <laughs> now, stay there. Gee, I, I wish Phil would get here so we can go oh, ahead. Oh, uh, Jack, look who's coming. Where? Oh, yes, it's Mr. Billingsley. Look, he's dressed like Marie Antoinette. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, hello, Mr. Billingsley. Good evening, Mr. Benny. Having a little party, I see. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, by the way, Mr. Billingsley, uh, you're dressed as Marie Antoinette. Are you going to a masquerade? No, my head aches, so I'm going to have it cut off. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh I, I thought you were celebrating Halloween like we are. You see, I'm Satan, and Miss Livingston is Pocahontas, and Mr. Wilson is a kangaroo. I used to be an alligator once, and now I'm an old bag. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, uh, see you later. Good night, Mr. Benny. Good night. That's one way to look at it. <laughs> Strange fellow. The other morning for breakfast, he swallowed a raw egg and then drank boiling water for three minutes. <laughs> I don't know. Well, there's Phil. Come on in, Phil. Hi, you checked in. Hello, everybody. Oh, hello, Phil. Hi, hi. Hi. I'm glad you got here, Phil. We want to get going. I'm sorry, but I didn't have time to put no costume on. Don't worry, your tailor takes care of that. <laughs> Hey, Phil, uh, what, uh, what happened between you and the teacher? Oh, she got mad at me when we were having our spelling lesson. Oh, what was the trouble? She asked me to spell Pomeranian. Pomeranian? So I said, D-O-G, take it or leave it. <laughs> well, at least you knew Pomeranian was a dog. That's something, huh? Well, we're all here, so come on, fellas, let's go. Hey, Don, you 
put on a lot of weight since last week. That's Dennis. It's a long story. <laughs> Uh, come on, everybody, let's go. Oh, Rochester, Rochester, before you leave, be sure and lock the garage so that nobody damages the Maxwell. Okay. Remember last year, some kid got in there and turned it over. Yeah, we drove around for three days without even noticing. <laughs> I noticed it. It was bumpy as anything. All right, this way, fellas. We'll all go out the side door. Oh, that's... Boy, we really, we really have fun tonight. You know, kids, first we'll go next door to Ronald Coleman's house. See? And then we'll Jack, go... Jack, here comes that little boy you hired as a gag man. Let's take him along. Oh, Belly Laugh Barton, eh? <laughs> ah, hello, kid. Hello, Mr. Benny. Say, Belly, do you uh, want to go out with us tonight? We're going to ring doorbells and raise the dickens. You're a little adolescent, aren't you, bub? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll enjoy ourselves. Sorry you won't come along. By the way, how's the uh, program coming along for Sunday? If I tell you, you won't have any fun tonight. <laughs> well, get busy and concentrate. Come on, fellas. Now, I'll tell you what, kids. First, we'll sneak across the lawn to Ronald Coleman's house and put some white paint on the doorknob, see? Then we'll ring the bell, and when he comes out, we'll run like the dickens. <laughs> Coleman's bell three times. Why doesn't he come out? Maybe he went to a party or something. Couldn't be a big party or I'd have been invited. <laughs> Ronnie and I attend the same affairs. Only he doesn't have to crawl in the window. <laughs> well, these Hollywood parties, who knows whether you got an invitation or not. <laughs> hey, fellas, I've got an idea. As long as Coleman isn't home, let's take this beautiful sundial here and put it over on my front lawn. His sundial? Yeah, it'll be a swell gag. Three years ago, you took his flagpole. When's the gag over? <laughs> oh, get in the Halloween spirit, will you? Come on, fellas, give me a hand with this dial. Hey, Jack, look. There's a policeman walking by the house. A policeman? Uh-oh. Hello there. Is that you, Mr. Coleman? Get this, fellas. Uh, right, Joe. Thanks for asking, old boy. Terribly decent of you. Good night. Tip, tip. <laughs> I, I certainly fooled the blighter. Take that donut out of your eye. You're not Coleman anymore. <laughs> oh, yes. Say, fellas, we'll never budge this sundial. It's too heavy. I'll have to phone for some movers. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. Look, let's, let's go over to Basil Rathbone's. Does he live near here, Jackson? Yeah, right past my house on the other side of the street. Come on. Ooh. Darn this tail I keep tripping on. <laughs> hmm, look at that light in my kitchen. Belly Lap is in there eating me out of house and home. <laughs> All the writers with ulcers, and I had to get him. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh, Jack, look at this. Where? Hey, wait a minute. Who wrote this on my sidewalk? 
Jell-O has that new locked-in flavor. The flavor never goes away. We put it in and it's there to stay. Who did this? Don't look at me. Kangaroos can't write. <laughs> oh, yeah? Now, Don, you go get a rag and wipe it off. I'll tell the sponsor. All right, the big fat paddle tail. Leave it there. <laughs> now, follow me. Follow me across the street, fellas. And we'll go to Rathbone's house. Quiet now. He will fix him good. Which house is it, Jackson? Wait a minute. I don't know whether this is Rathbone's house or the next one. I think it's this one. No, oh, no, it's the next one. This is where Charles Boyer lives. Oh, that's right. Hey, let's pull some gag on him. Yeah, maybe he's got a sundial we can lift. <laughs> now, I'll just sneak up and ring his doorbell. Wait here, fellas. Hey, Jackson, Nick, here comes that cop again. Uh-oh. Hello there. Is that you, Mr. Boyer? Here I go again, fellas. Oh, uh, good evening, officer. <laughs> Beautiful now. Beautiful. Yes, it is. Good night, Mr. Boyer. Bon Sawyer. <laughs> hmm. Lucky I can speak French. <laughs> hey, Jack, let's get away from here. The policeman's liable to come back. He might have said, I'll tell you what. Let's go through this driveway and sneak over to Bathroom's backyard. Now, follow me, fellas. Everybody quiet. <laughs> Well, here we are. Gee, it's dark tonight. Hey, where did Phil disappear to? I don't know. Where is he, Don? He was with us a minute ago. Have you seen him, Dennis? He's not in here. <laughs> Of course not. Here he comes now. Where have you been, Phil? Boy, am I wet. Why didn't you tell me that Rathbone had a swimming pool? Well, why don't you watch where you're going? I swallowed enough water to last me the rest of my life. Well, it didn't hurt you to go on the wagon even for a second. <laughs> now, wait here, kids. I'm going up and knock on the door. When Rathbone comes out, hide in the bushes. Wow, will he be furious? Oh, be careful now, Jack. Don't worry about me. Now, quiet. Get ready, fellas. Yahoo! <laughs> Darn those milk bottles. <laughs> I hope I didn't cut myself. Am I bleeding, Mary? With what? <laughs> With blood, I've got it. The idea of leaving... light just went on, Jack. Quick, pick me up. Here comes Rathbone. Shh, quiet, everybody. Yes, yes, yes. Who's there? Anybody there? <laughs> I say, is anybody there? Ah, must be some of those Halloween pranksters. Now, look here, you children. I don't want any more of this disturbance. <laughs> I've got to get up early in the morning. I'm making a picture. What a ham. <laughs> <laughs> Why? If I catch you around here again tonight, I'll give you all a sound good thrashing. Now go away, all of you. Scat! <laughs> oh, boy, is he, is he burned up. Boy, am I going to make his life miserable tonight. Wait a minute. What do you got against Rathbone? Jack hates him because he can act. <laughs> That's all. I can see him imitate Boyer like I did. Now, fellas, this time I'm going to grab this big rock here and throw it up against the door. Oh, you can't take those steps again, eh, Daddy? <laughs> I can climb, only this will be more annoying. Now, here goes. I'm going to throw the rock. One. Phil, what are you doing back there? Nothing. Well, get away. <laughs> Two. Three. Go! <laughs> Holy smoke, I broke a window. There goes the porch light again. Quick, fellas, run. He's coming out. Whoops. Well, I'll be... Hey, what is this? Come on, Janet, hurry! Run, run! I can't run. That darn Phil Harris tied my tail to this bush. <laughs> Gee, what a spot. Gee, I hope Rathbone doesn't see me. May I ever get my hands on the... Aha! Who's hiding there? Who's in back of that bush? Hmm. <laughs> right now, I'd give $1,000 to be playing Salt Lake City. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, 
Gee, here he comes. Well, may I inquire the name of the moron behind that mask who goes around breaking windows? Who are you? Gee. Come, 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 man, speak up. Gosh. <laughs> ah, Basil, I'm only making the job. It is me, Charles Boyer. Mr. Benny, your accent is revolting. <laughs> Oh, hello, Basil. Hello, how'd you know it was me? You wore that same costume last Halloween when you tipped over my doghouse. Oh. I want that dog back. Where is he? <laughs> well, he had pups today. You're a fine Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> now, look, Basil. I'm sorry I threw that rock. It was an accident. Accident or no accident, you'll pay for that window. All right, all right. I'll pay for it. Time Mr. Day. Benny. What are you doing there? I'm untying my tail. What do you think I'm doing? <laughs> I'm very sorry about the whole thing, Basil. I won't bother you anymore tonight. I'll go and join my gang. I suppose you're going to continue this mischievous business. Well, well, listen. To tell you the truth, we're going over to Charles Lawton's house. You know those flower pots he's got on his front porch? Yes. Well, listen, we're going to tip him over one by one. He'll go crazy when he hears that racket. I dare say, Lawton is a fierce temper. You said it. <laughs> well, so long, Basil. Happy Halloween. Goodbye. Flower pots. Wait a minute, Jack, old boy, I'm going with you. <laughs> what? You gonna join us? I'll tell my wife. Uh, be back later, darling. Hey, fellas, have I got a surprise for you. Come on, Basil. Yippee! Here, listen, well, here's what we'll do. First, we'll go to Lawton's house. Then we'll go over to Claudette Colbert's and ring the doorbell, see? And when she comes out, I'll grab her and kiss her, and you can kiss her, too. Three cheers for three grand puddings. Jello chocolate, jello vanilla, and jello butterscotch pudding. Three delicious desserts made by the same people who make world famous jello. Jello puddings are puddings that even grandma would be proud to serve. Puddings that really taste homemade. Yet they take only just a few minutes to make. With jello puddings, all you have to do is add milk and bring to a boil. Then cool and serve. And there, almost before you know it, You've made the family a smooth, creamy pudding with a flavor unsurpassed by any pudding you ever tasted. So don't wait another day to try these luscious desserts. Try all three flavors real soon. Rich, mellow chocolate, creamy vanilla, and golden butterscotch. You'll find them all equally delightful. And you'll want to keep them handy on your pantry shelf all the time. Tomorrow, order Jell-O puddings and see if you don't say they're just like grandma's only more so. This is the last number of the fifth program in the current Jello series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank Mr. Rathbone for appearing on our program tonight. Also, at this time, I would like to announce that the motion picture drive for the community chess this year starts tomorrow, November 3rd. I'm sure that all of us here in Hollywood will do our bit and I hope all of you will contribute to your local chapters. Good night, everybody. Friends, the name Jell-O is a sure sign of goodness wherever you find it, whether it's on a package of Jell-O or on a package of Jell-O pudding. Jell-O puddings are made by the same folks who make Jell-O. And like Jell-O, they're downright swell. They're simply unrivaled for smooth, luscious flavor. They're easy to prepare just as Jell-O is. And they sell for the same low Jell-O price. So tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, get Jell-O puddings in all three flavors. Chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. Remember Jell-O and Jell-O puddings. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles. J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Captains of the Clouds.
better than ever. Yes, today, friends, Jell-O is better than ever. Richer and more delicious than it's ever tasted before. Because now Jell-O's grand flavor is locked in. It's locked right into Jell-O's tiny particles to give you extra delight and a new high in dessert enjoyment. That same Jell-O goodness is there that you've always loved. That same intriguing taste that always reminds you so delightfully of the juicy ripe fruit itself, but richer, more vivid than you've ever known it. For this new Jell-O process locks in the magic of Jell-O's marvelous flavor. Prove it for yourself. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice that there's no sweet, fruity odor, no telltale aroma to warn of escaping flavor. Then dissolve the Jell-O and notice how its tangy, tantalizing flavor comes gushing out. Deliciously rich, thrillingly good. So ask your grocer tomorrow for several packages of Jell-O. Now that Jell-O's swell flavor is actually locked in, it's better than ever. Captains of the Cloud played by the orchestra. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as is my custom every Sunday night at this time, I bring you a man who... Hold it a second, Don. Jack isn't here yet. He isn't? No, he's been wandering around in a daze ever since last Thursday. Why? What happened Thursday? That's when they had the Academy Award banquet, and boy, was Jack disappointed. You mean to say that Jack actually expected to win the award for best actor? Yeah. <laughs> he even sold that stuffed owl on his mantle so he'd have room for the statue. <laughs> Imagine. So he's still pretty upset about losing, huh? I'll say he is. I was in the drugstore just now, and Mr. Benny was dunking donuts in his coffee. Well, what's dunking got to do with being upset? He was splashing people all around him. <laughs> See this brown suit I got on? Yeah. Well, it was gray tweed when I went in. <laughs> Well, personally, I can see no excuse for Jack being so mad. You'd think that... Uh-oh, quiet, fellas. Here he comes. Well, well, well. Hello, everybody. Sorry I'm late, Don. Well, for heaven's sake, why so cheerful all of a sudden? Why shouldn't I be cheerful? It's a lovely day, the sun is shining, birds are singing. Are you sure that was coffee you were drinking? <laughs> I get it. So you had to tell him about the coffee I splashed on you, eh, Dennis? Well, gee whiz, my suit is all wet. Your suit will dry out. It may dry out, but it will never be gray again. <laughs> all right, brown suits are coming back. <laughs> well, let's get started with the program, shall we, Dunsey? Okay, Jack. But first, I'd like to say right now that you're a darn good loser. You, uh, you mean about the Academy Award? Well, I, I will admit I was a little perturbed at first, but I've got it all figured out, Don. I didn't lose. I was merely an unfortunate victim of circumstance. I don't get it. Me neither. Well, look, kid. The picture I should have gotten the award on is Charlie's aunt. Is that right? Yes, but... Uh, let me finish, Mary. Now, if you remember... <laughs> if you remember, in Charlie's aunt, I played the part of a man, and I also played a part of a woman. And I was exceptionally good in both roles. Well, for heaven's sake, what's that got to do with your not winning the Academy Award? Simply this, the voters were baffled. They didn't know whether to elect me best actor or best actress. <laughs> That's very logical. Then you're not jealous because Gary Cooper won. No, and I'm not jealous of Joan Fontaine either. <laughs> but I must say that I had them both worried there for a while. <laughs> They're a very good friends of mine, too. So you're not jealous of Cooper, eh? Not a bit. <laughs> Tell him what happened at the banquet Thursday night. Never mind. What was it, Mary? Well, all evening, Jack kept smiling at everybody and bowing and pointing to the speech in his pocket. <laughs> That's so. Anyhow, when they announced that Gary Cooper was the winner, Jack jumped up and yelled, Nobody leave the room. We're going to do this over. <laughs> Well, you know how excitable I am. <laughs> anyway, I was the first one to congratulate Gary Cooper. I went right over and put my arm around his shoulder. You're telling me I had to boost you up. <laughs> I could have made it alone, sister. 
Anyhow, I'm glad he won. Gary and I are pals. Pals? After that silly rumor you started about him? What silly rumor? He's much too tall to be a Jap, and you know it. <laughs> I never called him a Jap. I said he was a chap. A full-blooded chap. <laughs> if I don't talk plain, that's his worry. Now, let me tell you another thing. Holy smoke, get this. What's the matter, Dennis? I think my suit is shrinking. You could be growing. Keep still. Forget it. No, sir, my suit is shrinking. So what? It's shrinking. Your sleeves were too long anyway. I know, but my elbows are getting cold. Dennis, what goes up has got to come down. Don't worry. Now, where was I? We were discussing the Academy Award, Jack. Oh, yes. Now, let's get this straight, fellas. I don't begrudge Gary Cooper getting recognition for best actor, but I still think I'm the most versatile. Jeepers, I can do anything. A man, a woman, do comedy, drama. I can play Holcomb. I can play Shakespeare. You can sell Christmas cards. <laughs> That's seasonal. <laughs> <laughs> now, take me as Hamlet. <clears throat> to be or not to be. That is the question. Boy, this suit is cheap material. <laughs> well, I can see I'm wasting my talent around here. Dennis, as long as you had to open your mouth, how about leaving it open and doing your song? Okay. Hold it a minute. Come in. Telegram for Jack Benny. Take it, Mary. Here's a tip for you, bud. A brand new defense stamp. Here you are. Thanks. Just paste it on my head. <laughs> okay. There's an album if I ever saw one. <laughs> now, Scram. Who's the wire from, Mary? It's from your father. He says, uh, My dear son, congratulations on the Academy Award. You didn't do it before, and you didn't do it again. <laughs> Good old dad, he'd have voted for me. Sing, Dennis, before your suit strangles you, will you? I love sung by Dennis Day. Everything I love. There's a beautiful idea for a song. Yeah, sure is. Yes, sir. It's so sentimental. Everything I love. Uh, what do you love, Dennis? Apple pie and Hedy Lamar. <laughs> hmm. Ice cream on the pie. <laughs> All right, ice cream on it. That's a marvelous title, though. Everything I love. You know, a, a song like that... Tutti Frutti. <laughs> uh, 
Forget the ice cream. I'm talking about sentiment. Oh, Don. Uh, yes, Jack. Uh, Don, let me ask you something. Uh, what do you love? Well, I, uh... I love my little ranch out in the valley. Hmm. Just a simple, unpretentious... I know, I know, I know. Uh, what else do you love, Don? Well, uh, I love the little woman. Hmm. Every morning when I come downstairs, she greets me with a cheery smile and a breakfast of piping hot wheat cakes. Wheat cakes, eh? Don, what else do you love? <laughs> well, uh, let's see. Oh, yes. It's about time. I love my St. Bernard dog, Jumbo, we call I don't him. care what you call him. <laughs> Don, are you going to tell us a thing you love that made me start this whole business, or do I have to lock you in? <laughs> oh, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I love Jell-O with its new locked-in flavor. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> Jell-O is not only economical and easy to make, but it's America's favorite gelatin dessert. So look for the big red letters on the box. I thank you. Well... Certainly glad you finally thought of it, Don. And wait till the sponsor finds out that you love your wife and home before Jell-O. <laughs> you better watch out, bub. I'm sorry, Jack. I'll never go home again. Oh, you don't have to go that far, Don, but watch it, that's all. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. How's the old gent with the gray hair? Oh, fine. I saw Frank Morgan at the fights the other night. <laughs> And, uh, he looks swell. Phil means you. I know who he means. I'll tell Frank you asked about him, Phil. Okay, I can go along with the gag. <laughs> you better, brother. <laughs> you know, Phil, when you... Hey, get a load of the kid. Where'd you get them knee pants, Dennis? I splashed coffee on him. It's a long story. <laughs> Forget it. Oh, say, Jackson, I hate to mention it, but that's a pretty tough break you got the other night. What tough break? You know, not winning the Academy Rewards. <laughs> reward If you're talking about the award, Phil In my opinion <laughs> Hey, what's that? Well, there goes my coat button <laughs> Dennis, don't worry about your suit When you get home tonight, throw it away And I'll make you, I mean, I'll buy you another one <laughs> Phil, getting back to the Academy reward, as you so quaintly put it, I am a little bit disappointed, but those things happen. I thought I had friends, but apparently they didn't vote for me. You're right, Jackson. And there's an old French proverb that fits that to a T. It goes, Anisoi qui mal y pense. <laughs> well, that proverb sounds familiar. What does it mean, Phil? Evil to him who says you stink. <laughs> That's, that's evil to him who evil thinks. <laughs> no one said I'm Molly Ponce. They just didn't vote for me. That's all. Eagle. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, it, it didn't bother me. I can take it. It didn't bother you, eh? Not a bit. Well, then why did you try to kill yourself Friday morning? <laughs> I try to kill myself. What happened, Mary? Now, listen. Jack went out in the garage, closed the doors, got in the Maxwell. Oh. Put a rubber hose on the exhaust pipe, the other end in his mouth. Mary. Turned on the ignition, stepped on the starter, the car was out of gas, and here he is. <laughs> Mary, that wasn't me in the garage, so don't make up things. Well, Jack, I don't blame you for being brokenhearted. After all these years of hard work, you should have won that award. Darn right I should. I'd have won it, too, if it hadn't been for a... <laughs> Dennis. Should I get a barrel, Mr. Benny? <laughs> no, pull him up. And I'll tell you something, Phil. I'd have won that award if, I had, if it hadn't been for politics. I'm as good an actor as Gary Cooper any day. What? You're as good an actor as Gary Cooper. Yes, only he's taller than I am. That's why Jimmy Stewart won it the year before. They're both taller than I am. What about the time Spencer Tracy won it? He's shorter than I am. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm five foot nine. So is Paul Muni. Yes, and they gave him the award, brother. Oh, oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, well, let me tell you something. Oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, nuts, I'm going home. 
Wow, that Jackson is really burned up, isn't he? Yeah, he takes everything so seriously. What does he want? Every year at this time, he puts that hose in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> What a guy. Well, Phil, I guess you might as well play something. Okay. I forgot my streetcar transfer. <laughs> oh, here it is. So long. Understand it. How they could overlook me for the award after that magnificent. Oh, well. I don't mind Gary Cooper winning, but. Now, where's that Rochester? Oh, 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 oh! Oh, hello, boss! Ain't you home kind of early? Yes, I am. I'm a little upset, and I. Rochester, what have you got in that cocktail glass? Some water. I was thirsty, boss. Water? With an olive in it? I was hungry, too. <laughs> Don't kid me. That's a dry martini. Hmm. Rochester, is your girl here by any chance? My girl? No, sir. Well, uh, was she here? That ain't Ivy climbing over the back fence. <laughs> I thought so. Well, I'm not going to boil you out tonight. I'm too exhausted. I'm going upstairs to bed. I'm all in. Oh, say, boss, the man from the exterminator company was here. Oh, did he find that mouse? Yes, sir, and it sure was a big one. Put in an awful fight. Oh, well, where's the man now? He went out to get another man. <laughs> Holy smoke, it must be a big one. I wonder if Frank Buck is in town. He could catch that mouse. I'd catch it myself if you only let me put a piece of cheese in the trap. <laughs> no, there must be some other way. <laughs> sure be glad to get to bed. Here, hang this up, Rochester. You need a new one, boss. Just comb it out. It's okay. <laughs> Don't part it in the middle like you did last night. <laughs> Hammy, my... Hey, what's that? What, what? There's someone under my bed. Who's that under my bed? Come on, you, speak up. Good evening, Mr. Benny. Home a little early, I see. <laughs> oh, it's, it's Mr. Billingsley. Now, come out from under my bed, Mr. Billingsley. Come out. All right, you asked for it. As for what? If I come out and see my shadow, there'll be 40 more days of winter. <laughs> oh, my goodness, today he's a groundhog. Now, Mr. Billingsley, you must go to your own room. Very well. Good night, Mr. Benny. Good night. And what's wrong with that, may I ask? <laughs> nothing, nothing. <laughs> Good night, that's all. Gosh, he's so sensitive. I think I'll lie down and relax for a while, Rochester. That Academy Award has got me all worked up. Gary Cooper, a better actor than I am. That's justice for you. Oh, say, boss. Yeah? I put gas in the Maxwell and the hose is still there. Do you want to have a go at it again tomorrow? <laughs> No, no. Next year, maybe. <laughs> Rochester, take Mr. Coleman's hose back to him and thank him very much. He don't know we got it. Good, good. See, I hope I'll be able to sleep. Rochester, sing something, will you? That always lulls me. Okay, boss. See, I'm just a bundle of nerves tonight. 
My mama done told me when I was in knee pants. My mama done told me, son. Uh, Gary Cooper. A woman sweet talk and give you the big eye. But when the sweet talk is done. Those, those tall guys get all the break. A woman's a two-faced, a worrisome thing who leave you to sing the blues in the night. <laughs> I think I'll get out of pictures. I didn't even get one vote. I know I sent it in. <laughs> oh, well. From Natchez to Mobile, from Memphis to St. Joe. St. Joe. How they used to love me there. <laughs> and the food at the old Busy Bee Lunchroom. Wherever the four winds blow. Woman's a two-faced, a worrisome thing who leave you to sing the blues in the night. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 12th Annual Academy Award Banquet, and all of Hollywood's glamorous stars are gathered here in the Busy Bee Lunchroom in St. Joe, Missouri. <laughs> St. Joe. Gee, they, they love me here. I, I can't miss that award. I'm, I'm sure to win. Gosh. Gosh, look at all the celebrities here. There's Wendell Wilkie and Joan Fontaine and Ernst Lubitsch and the, the Exterminator Man. And look, there's Walter Wanger and Barbara Stanwyck and, and Mervyn Leroy. Hey! Hello, Mervyn! Hello, Leroy! <laughs> Gee, he knows me. Here's the old busy bee. Uh, what do you have, sir? Uh, a hot roast beef sandwich with tutti frutti ice cream on it. <laughs> hurry, Miss Lamar. I can't hurry. I'm caught in a mousetrap. Gee, you're a big one. <laughs> God. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the votes are all in for the best actor of the year, and I'll have the results in just a second. <laughs> I'm nervous. Hey, there's, there's Gary Cooper. He's got a pretty good chance of winning, too. Hello, Gary. Hello, Jack. How do you like it here in Memphis? Memphis? We're, we're in St. Joe, aren't we? You're in Memphis. I'm in St. Joe. <laughs> you see, I'm taller than you are. Oh. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. Look. Look, the master ceremonies is getting up. It must be Bob Hope. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That's not Hope, it's Alan. Fred Allen. I'm very happy to be here in good old St. Joe's. They love me here. Listen to him. That Alan's a two-faced, a worrisome thing who leads me to sing the blues in the night. I, I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the votes have been counted, and I have the honor to announce that the best actor of the year is that old gent with the gray hair, Frank Morgan. No! No, no, Benny, me! Jack oh, Benny! yes, 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 Jack Benny, and here's that gold statue for you, Jackie. Ouch! <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> how, how can I speak with this rubber hose in my mouth? But, but I'll try. <clears throat> to be or not to be, that is the question. Here's your hot beef sandwich, mister. Make it a steak. I just won the award. <laughs> Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of... Who's that coming? Who are you guys? Who are you? The Warner Brothers shouting like the others. Benny, a mama to told us. The Warner Brothers? And, and who are you? I am Daryl Zanuck. Jack, you are a panic. Benny, <laughs> my horsey done told me. Gee, Mr. Zanuck, all the studios want me. All of them. From Metro to Goldwyn, from Goldwyn to Mayor, from Mayor to Paramount. Paramount? They love me there. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I can't tell you how happy I am to receive this award. It is the most thrilling night I have ever had. And the most exciting evening. What's the matter? The banquet's over. Everybody's gone but Gary Cooper and me. <laughs> What? what? What are you crying for, Gary? I had my heart set on winning that award. It's, it's not your fault, Gary. I won it because I'm taller than you are. Look, I'm eight feet tall. Not only that, you're still growing. Still growing? That's right, I am. Look at me. I'm nine feet, 10 feet, 12 feet. Whoop, whoop, hold it. I'm tall enough, hold it. I'm going right through the roof. Ah! <laughs> oh, oh, my, my head. Boss, boss, wake up. Gary. Gary, where are you? Boss, wake up! You've been dreaming! Dreaming? Yeah, you got your head right through the foot of the bed. <laughs> oh. Oh, yes. Well, pull me out. <laughs> Thanks. It was a tough dream, Rochester, but I won it. Do you need me anymore, boss? No. Good night, Rochester. Good night. <laughs> what a man. <laughs> Well, here's a treat that just can't be beat for real downright goodness. And one that's sure to become a family favorite the first time you try it. The name of this grand dessert is Cherry Cubes with Pineapple, a brilliant combination of golden canned pineapple and bright crimson cherry jello. It's a dessert that fairly coaxes you to pick up a spoon and begin because it's so good looking. And it's nothing less than a masterpiece of delicious flavor. You'll like the simple, easy way you make it, too. Just dissolve a package of Jell-O imitation cherry flavor in one pint of hot water and hot pineapple juice. Turn into a loaf pan and chill until firm. Then cut into cubes and pile in sherbet glasses, along with three slices of canned pineapple diced. And there's a dessert that's really extra special. Juicy golden nuggets of canned pineapple, temptingly blended with tiny glistening cubes of rich red cherry jello. So get a package of cherry jello tomorrow, and when you buy, be sure to get genuine jello. It's extra rich because its flavor is locked in. The last number of the 22nd program in the current jello series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday at the same time. And by then, I'm sure Jack will find something else to worry about. Good night, folks. <laughs> Of Fred Allen and Gary Cooper were interpreted by Peter Lind Hayes, appearing through courtesy of RKL Studios. The tune Captain of the Clouds is from the picture of the same name. Did you know that the same folks who make take Jello butterscotch pudding? It has a rich golden color, just as tempting as can be. And what mellow delight there is in its creamy butterscotch flavor. So when you order Jello, order Jello puddings in all three flavors. Chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. Jell-O puddings are just like grandma's, only more so. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles, the Earl C. Anthony Station. K-E-L-L-O! The Jell-O program, coming to you from Camp Hahn, California, brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny. With Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Let's Be Buddies. Today, friends, Jell-O gives you more flavor, more real rich enjoyment than ever before. Because today, Jell-O's famous flavor is locked in to bring you added pleasure. By means of a new and exclusive process, Jell-O's grand goodness is locked right into the tiny Jell-O particles. And that assures you of extra rich flavor. Never before has Jell-O been so wonderfully good. 
Never before has its bright, scintillating color looked more beautiful. Never has its tangy, intriguing flavor tasted more delicious. For here's flavor that makes you think of the real juicy ripe fruit itself. Flavor that's better than ever, now that it's locked in. You can prove that it's locked in with your very next package of Jell-O. Simply open the package. Notice that there's no telltale aroma, no sign of escaping fragrance and flavor. Then dissolve the tiny Jell-O particles. And notice how Jell-O's captive goodness comes pouring out in a rush of richness. Get Jell-O tomorrow. You'll find extra delight in Jell-O's grand locked-in flavor. Let's be buddies played by the orchestra. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from Camp Han, California, we bring you a man who pedaled here all the way from Hollywood on the rear end of a tandem bicycle, Jack Benny. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Jello again. This is Jack Benny aching. I mean, talking. <laughs> And, Don, you can joke about it if you want to, but believe me, a tandem bicycle is the way to travel nowadays. You pull into a service station, the attendant checks your tires, wipes off your goggles, you stick your tongue out at the gas pump, and away you go. <laughs> no, it's really marvelous. Well, Jack, you'll pardon me for saying so, but, you know, you and Rochester were certainly a funny-looking sight cruising along the highway on that two-seated bike. <laughs> funny-looking? <laughs> yeah, Rochester in his chauffeur's uniform, and you and that, uh, by the way, Jack, what was that weird-looking thing you were wearing on your head? You looked like Buck Rogers. Oh, that. Uh, well, you see, Don, I've got a girlfriend that's a deep-sea diver, and she lent me her helmet to keep the wind out of my eye. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, really darn nice of her, you know? Deep-sea diver? My goodness, that's a pretty strenuous job for a woman, isn't it? Oh, she's rugged. In fact, um... <laughs> Oh, really, doll? Oh, she is something. In fact, I took Myrtle, that's her name, Myrtle Minkelhopper. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I took Myrtle to the wrestling matches the other night, and on the way home in the cab, she won two falls out of three. <laughs> See, she's got shoulders like Victor Mature. Well, if it... If it isn't the Jell-O oomph girl. Hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hi, you fellas. Whistle at me like you did outside. <laughs> oh, say, say, you're really popular here, Mary. You got a nice hand. That ain't all they're applauding, brother. <laughs> Oh, um, oh, yes, um, your figure is more alluring than the average top sergeant. <laughs> yes, yes, indeedy. Oh, say, Mary, I tried to reach you on the phone early this morning. I was going to give you a lift here to Camp Hahn. I wish you had, Don. I drove in with Phil and the orchestra. They chartered a bus. Oh, the orchestra boys took a bus, eh? Yeah, 18 wolves on a greyhound. <laughs> They, uh, they are a spirited bunch of fellows, you know. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, I'm only kidding, Jack. They behave like gentlemen. In fact, they rehearse their band numbers all the way down here. In the bus? Uh-huh. Boy, is my neck stiff from ducking a trombone. Well, you've got my sympathy, Mary. Phil's orchestra blasting away with that corny music. And you and the driver had to sit there and listen. What driver? He jumped out the window in Pomona. <laughs> Oh, he couldn't stand it, eh? Well, who uh, drove the bus, Phil? No, I did. <laughs> Phil was up on the roof taking a sun bath. <laughs> a sun bath? What a character. Well, here comes the orchestra leader and head waiter of the Biltmore Bowl now. <laughs> Hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Well, here I am, fellas. Make off like I'm Gay Kaiser. <laughs> uh, make... Thank you, boys. Thank you, and hi, y'all. 
<laughs> hey, Thanks that was some like reception, eh, Jackson? Kaiser. What? I said that was a tremendous reception, huh? Yeah, they sure love Kate Kaiser here, I'll say that. <laughs> But I'll say one thing, Phil. You look good today. Your face is nice and tan. You like it? On my way home, I'm going to do my back. <laughs> you didn't get cute enough on that gag. Listen. <laughs> hey, that reminds me, Maestro, uh, when your boys were inside that bus rehearsing, why weren't you down there with them? Me? Yes, you. You're the leader. Don't you want to know what the boys are playing today? Look, Jackson, I just stand in front of them and shake a stick. When they're through, I stop. <laughs> oh. Unless I had a bad night. <laughs> well, you're honest, I'll say that. Oh, by the way, Phil, as long as you rented a bus, I think I'll load my bicycle on it and ride back with you and the boys. A bicycle? You mean you pedaled all the way here on a bike? Why, sure. Over them hills? Of course. With your legs? <laughs> Now, just a minute. What's wrong with my leg? It looks like they should be sticking out of a malted milk. <laughs> Why, what are you talking about? When I played Hamlet in To Be or Not To Be, I wore tights and my legs were gorgeous. Weren't they, Mary? Yeah, but you wore a lot of padding around them. <laughs> Padding. You could have played Hamlet or football. You were all set. <laughs> oh, you're like all the girls in Hollywood, Mary. You're jealous because I happen to have attractive limbs. I've seen better-looking limbs on a crabapple tree. <laughs> Virgil, listen, you, you're only the sound man here, so stop butting in. Oh, are you jealous because I went with Myrtle before you did? <laughs> oh, and any time you want, you can have her back. Anyway, Phil, on the way back to town, I'm loading my bike on your bus. Say, Mr. Benny, on the way home, can I ride in Oh, the... hello, Dennis. Hello. <laughs> well. Say, Mr. Benny, on the way home, can I... Thanks, fellas. <laughs> hmm. Say, Mr. Benny, on the way home... How, can uh... I... <laughs> uh, how, uh, how are you feeling, kid? Oh, fine. That's good. I had a little attack of hangnails, but I'm over it now. <laughs> Good, good. Say, Mr. Benny, on the way home, can I ride in the bus with the rest of the gang? What was that, Dennis? I say, can I ride in the bus with the rest of the gang? On the way home? Of course, Dennis, certainly. Boy, am I glad to hear that. It was so windy coming down here, I could hardly catch my breath. Oh, it wasn't so windy. Don't tell me. I was sitting on the handlebars. <laughs> well, what of it? You had a nice soft cushion under you. Some cushion. Every time Rochester rang the bell, I darn near wiggled off. <laughs> Well, all right, Dennis, you can ride home in the bus, so stop complaining and let's have your song. What's it going to be, kid? I'm going to sing She'll Always Remember. Well, I'm going to sit right down here and enjoy it. <laughs> hey, Virgil! Virgil, my back doesn't squeak, so stop with those silly sound effects. <laughs> Virgil isn't here. He went out for a smoke. Oh. Oh, was that me? <laughs> my goodness, I'll have to have my oil changed. <laughs> Oh, 
not maybe, but you are still a baby. She'll always remember thought of you ever forget. She'll always remember sung by Dennis Day. And Dennis, you're an excellent voice tonight. You know, that bicycle ride down here with the wind blowing in your lungs did you a lot of good. And I'll last longer, too. <laughs> last longer? Yeah, I read in the paper where you're supposed to keep plenty of air in you for the duration. <laughs> Dennis, that's for tires, not human beings. What a kid. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as I announced last week, for our feature attraction this evening... Here we are at Old Camp Horn in the state of California. Wait a minute, Mary. Wait a minute. We don't want any of your corny poems tonight. Well, I wrote one, and I'm going to read it. Sorry, Mary. Nothing doing. You let me read my poem, or I'll tell everybody you're hoarding sugar under your toupee. <laughs> I just put a couple of lumps under there to give me a wave. <laughs> That's all. All right, Mary, if it'll make you happy, go ahead. What's the, uh... What's the title of your little epic? I'm Wacky Over Khaki. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> here we are at Old Camp Horn in the state of California. And the guys here are so handsome, Heidi Ho and Ocha Charnia. So far, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Mary. I met a boy right after lunch. He got me away from the rest of the bunch. He kissed me, then ran like a deer. If he comes back, I'll buy him a beer. <laughs> Still nothing. <laughs> Go ahead. When he grabbed me, I near froze, but his aim was bad and he kissed my nose. Oh, he kissed your nose, huh? However, boys, I'm not complaining. He'd only had his basic training. <laughs> Well, that explains it, I guess. Proceed. We're glad to be here, old Camp Hon. Phil and Dennis, me and Don. What about me? And good old Jack, who is our clown man. And Virgil Reimer, world's best sound man. <laughs> Virgil! <laughs> Virgil, you keep out of this. All right, Mary, let's get this over with. How many more verses? Eleven, but ten are no good. <laughs> then read the last one. Let's have it. You Yankee soldiers can't be beat. You'll run those Japs right off their feet. And when you catch them, don't let go till it says Los Angeles City Limits in Tokyo. The end. Very good. That was a swell poem, Mary. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as I announced last week, our uh, feature attraction this evening will be a new type of quiz show called Try and Get It, in which... <laughs> <laughs> See, they know me In which um, In which I, Jack Benny Will personally give away $24 To each of five lucky people A total of $120 Jackson, you're drunk <laughs> I am not In fact, I have right here in my wallet $120 in $1 bills Here they are well, I'll be darned. They're those old big ones. <laughs> They're legal tender. That's all that matters. Could I see one of those bills, Mr. Benny? They went out before I was born. <laughs> They're just the same as the paper money now, Dennis, only bigger. Now, Virgil, I want you to take these bills and put them in the cash register. Okay. Well, let go of them. <laughs> oh. Oh, pardon me. There. And now, folks, this novel quiz program will go on immediately after... Pardon me, I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. <laughs> oh, uh, hello, Rochester, where are you? 
I went over to that garage in Riverside to put air in the bicycle tires like you told me to. Uh-huh. And I ran into a colored boy whom I haven't knelt down to a good crap game with in years. <laughs> Uh-huh. Uh, Rochester, what are you driving at? Well, I don't know exactly how to phrase this, boss, but you know that nice shiny bell you had on your bicycle? Yes. Well, I just won that back. <laughs> what? The rest of the bike is in escrow. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Rochester, do you mean to say you lost my bicycle shooting craps? Well, I was pretty lucky for the first three passes. Lucky? And then what happened? My dice went into a minuet and my opponent becomes suspicious. <laughs> oh. Well, I don't care what happened. I want you to go to that garage and tell your friend to give you back my bicycle. Without paying for it? Yes, without paying for it. Just grab it. Now, wait a minute, boss. That boy's got a razor that does everything but run out and get the mail. <laughs> well, Rochester, what are you scared of? You carry a razor yourself. Yeah, but it's only a Gillette, and I'm out of blades. <laughs> I can't help it. Now you get that bicycle and come over here to Camp Han. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. What? If I ain't there in a half hour, send a jeep with a jug of new skin. <laughs> All right. So long. <laughs> that Rochester has got to stop again. All right, Bill. Let's have your band number. Tell you something. I'm going to sit down and think up some questions for this quiz. I'll be right back. that you didn't rehearse that number with the boys, you conducted it beautifully. But how did you know when to stop? I saw my piano player taking the cotton out of his ears. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. However, Phil, if you, uh... Uh, come in. Yes? Got a telegram here from Mr. Jack Benny. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> right here, uh... Right here, buddy. Got a sign for it, you know. Got a sign for it. <laughs> All right, I'll sign. Take the telegram, Mary. Company regulations. Got the rules right here in my hand if you want to see them. <laughs> Never mind, I believe you. Here, it's signed. Now, scram. You forgot to give him a tip, Mr. Benny. A tip? Ain't no regulations against that. <laughs> I'll tell you what, mister, instead of a tip, I'm going to give you a chance to make $24 by answering a few simple questions in my quiz contest. What do you say? Ain't no counts to this, is it? No. <laughs> no, have a seat and I'll call you. Uh, who's the telegram from, Mary? It's from Fred Allen. <laughs> from Allen? Yeah, get this. Understand you're giving away money tonight. Are you going to take ether or use a local anesthetic? <laughs> Oh, that guy is so funny. Well, let's forget arsenic and old face and get on with our quiz show. Let's get on with the quiz show. I can hardly wait to give away all that money. Yikes! 
What's that? What's that? Don't get excited, Diamond Jim. I just leaned on the no sale button. <laughs> well, watch it and close that drawer. All right, Don, announce me. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we present for your entertainment and education a brand new quiz program, Try and Get It, featuring Professor Jack Benny, that eminent authority on... <laughs> Good evening, you lucky people. <laughs> now, before we start, folks, I'd like to explain the rules of this simple, simple yet tantalizing contest. Now, each of you participants will be asked three questions and will receive $24 if you answer them correctly. If, meaning you ain't got a chance. <laughs> Mary. Well, shall we get on with our mental taffy pull? Let's. <laughs> now, our first contestant this evening is a lovely young lady... Uh, what is your name, miss? Myrtle Minkelhofer, and I'm a deep-sea diver. <laughs> well, uh-uh. Quiet. Now, Miss uh, Minkelhofer. Yes, Stinky. I mean, Professor. <laughs> now, here's your first question for $6. What tribe of Indians is liable to sue you? I didn't get you. <laughs> Concentrate, Myrtle. What tribe of Indians is liable to sue you? But, Stinky, I don't know no Indians. You don't have to. Sue, sue. Oh, the Sioux Indians. Boy, am I stupid. I guess I'm underwater too much. <laughs> no, no, you're just a little nervous. Now, would you like to try for the $12 question? Hmm. Nah. <laughs> I'm lucky to get the six. Hand it over. <laughs> but, but Myrtle. Give me that six bucks or I'll... All let... right, all right. Put your fist down. <laughs> Please. Well, there goes six dollars. Next time she takes a dive, I'm going to cut her airline. <laughs> now, our next contestant, ladies and gentlemen, is Mr. Phil Harris. Tell me, Mr. Harris... What is your occupation? I'm a sunbather. <laughs> well, you ought to try water sometime. <laughs> now, Mr. Harris... Um, Mr. Harris, here is your first question. What great explorer was Columbus, Ohio named after? Christopher J. Columbus. The J I'm not sure of. <laughs> But you've won $6. Okay, I'll take a shot at the 12. Good, good. Then tell us, Mr. Harris, what great president was Lincoln, Nebraska, named after? Abraham, Nebraska. <laughs> That's Lincoln, but you're close enough. Okay, come on now. Give me that $24 question while I'm hot. Very good. Are you ready? Yeah, shoot. This yeah. question deals with ancient history. At the Battle of Charonia in the year 338 B.C. Holy smoke! <laughs> now concentrate. At the Battle of Charonia in the year 338 B.C., Philip, king of Macedon, succeeded in forcing himself into the Amphitionic Council, although opposed by what noted orator? I'd have punched you right in the nose. <laughs> Temper, temper, sit down, Mr. Harris, or I'll have Myrtle knock you down. <laughs> now, our next aspirant is Mr. Don Wilson. Are you ready, Mr. Wilson? Yes, Professor. And here's your first question. Jell-O has that new locked-in what? Flavor. Correct, for $6. Now, the 12? <laughs> the $12. Jell-O is not only economical, but easy to... Concentrate now. Hmm? Easy to what? Me. Correct. <laughs> now, for the... <laughs> I mustn't let him win I mustn't let him win Now for the $24 question How do you spell Jell-O? Capital J-E-L-L-O Wrong, you left out the hyphen What? <laughs> I'm sorry, sit down, sit down, I'm sorry I'm sorry, sit down, sit down now, our next contestant is Mr... Mr... What's your name, buddy? Percy Kilbride, and I'm a messenger boy also. I see. Now, Mr. Kilbride, here's your first question for $6. 
Who invented the steam engine? Well, I see. Uh, got to got to think it out, you know. Got to think it out. <laughs> Take your time. Now tell us who invented the. Sorry, time's up. Now for our final victim or contestant this evening, we have Mr. Dennis Day. Are you sharp tonight, Dennis? What camp are we at? Good. <laughs> now listen carefully. Here's your first question for six dollars. How many men are George Bernard Shaw? Boy, that's a tough one. One is correct. <laughs> now, now, would you like to... If I say the first thing that comes to my head, I'm liable to get it wrong. <laughs> uh, sit down, Mr. Kilbride. <clears throat> you, you were late. Sit down. Now, tell us, Mr. Day. How many men are Fred Mac Murray? How much have I won so far? One is correct. Very, very good. <laughs> now, would you like to try... I got the answer. I know who invented the steam engine. I told you your time is up, Mr. Kilbride. Now, Mr. Day, how would you like to try for the $24 question? No, I'll take the 12 and quit. You will not. <laughs> Virgil, don't you give him a penny. Now, concentrate, Mr. Day. This is for $24 or nothing. How many men are John Charles Thomas? Oh, I get it. One man. Wrong. John Charles Thomas are three men. Three men? Yes. John Barrymore, Charles Lawton, and Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> and so, folks, try and get it. Wind up the first contest by paying out a total of $6 to Miss Myrtle Minkelhopper. Congratulations, Miss Minkelhopper. Got the answer. Got the answer, Professor. Uh, too late. Too late. Play, Phil. <laughs> Prepare to be praised, friends, when you serve this dessert. Cause it's something mighty grand. Its name? Raspberry cheese dessert. And a more delightful treat you've just never tasted. You'll find it's easy to make, too. It's just as simple as can be. And here's how you do it. Just dissolve one package of Jell-O imitation raspberry flavor in one pint of hot water and turn into a ring mold. Chill until firm. And after unmolding it, fill the center with cottage cheese. Then serve it with toasted crackers and see if it doesn't make an instant hit with the whole family. You'll love the way these two swell flavors blend together. The smooth, creamy goodness of cottage cheese and the rich, tangy flavor of raspberry jello. Pick up this beautiful red and white dessert tomorrow. Order several packages of raspberry jello. And be sure when you do, you get genuine jello. Because jello's new process locks in the flavor and gives you extra richness. This is the last number of the 28th program in the current Yellow series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Meanwhile, I'd like to thank Colonel Cowley, Major Vickery, and Captain Stalkup for a swell time here at Camp Han. Say, Jack. What? That quiz contest of yours was the biggest phony I ever heard of. What do you mean, phony? I paid Myrtle six dollars, didn't I? Why don't you give her four more so she can have her face lifted? <laughs> oh, don't be so catty. Good night, folks. <laughs> The Jell-O program is written by Bill Maher and Ed Beloyd and the broadcast from Camp Hahn, Riverside, California. It's for the entertainment of the Army personnel and does not constitute an endorsement of the product by the War Department. J-E-L-L-O the Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Are You Ready? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, have you a treat in store for you. What a grand surprise the moment you discover Jell-O's new locked-in flavor. Never until now has any gelatin dessert been able to bring you so much delightful goodness. Because up until now, gelatin desserts constantly faded in flavor while waiting to be used and brought you only a shadow of their original richness. But that's all been changed. Today, Jell-O's tempting, tantalizing flavor is locked right into the tiny Jell-O particles, where time can't get at it to steal it away. No matter how long Jell-O remains in the package, it retains its luscious flavor to the very last. Now, you be the judge. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice the absence of any heavy, fruity aroma, the usual sign of escaping flavor. 
then dissolve Jell-O, and presto, there's your flavor, all of it, the full-strength flavor of Jell-O, as rich and vivid as the day it was locked into Jell-O's delicate crystal-like particles. So try Jell-O, now made better than ever by Jell-O's new locked-in process. The flavor never goes away. We put it in, and it's there to stay. played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, next Friday, October 31st, is Halloween and will be celebrated by gay parties throughout the land. Yes, sir. We'll play games and everything. So tonight, we bring you a man who always loses his bridge bobbing for apples, Jack Benny. Thank you. Uh, Jello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And Don, <laughs> that was a very funny introduction. Uh, losing my bridge, bobbing for apples. <laughs> uh, did you think of that all by yourself? Yes, I did, Jack. It was my own little brainchild. Well, it certainly is clever. I mean, the way you expose all my faults and my defects. <laughs> <laughs> People enjoy it, too. Yes, yes, they do. Hmm. You know, Don... They have a program out here where a man sits by himself in a small room and plays phonograph records all night long. Uh, he's called Hank, the night watchman. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, one more introduction like that, and you're going to be known as Don, the Decca Day Man. <laughs> In other words, I don't want to set the world on fire. I just want to start a flame with your contract. <laughs> uh, by the way, Don, uh, getting back to Halloween... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. How are you? Uh, getting back to Halloween... Oh, oh, fine, thanks. Uh, getting back to Halloween... You didn't have to answer me, you know. What's that for? Coming in so mad. What's the matter with you today? Well, you know that new usher they got at the reception desk, that tall, good-looking fellow? Yeah. When I came in just now, he winked at me. Oh, a fresh guy, huh? He's not going to take me out tonight. Well, I don't blame you. I asked him, but he's busy. <laughs> All right, so much for romance. Now, Don, uh, what were we... Uh... Oh, you mentioned something about Halloween. Oh, oh, yes. Uh, are you going out with us next Friday night and have some fun? You know, ring doorbells and everything? Oh, I don't know. You don't have the excitement nowadays that you used to have on Halloween. Ah, I guess you're right. Well, I remember back in Denver when I was a kid, we used to have the time of our lives. Denver? You should have seen the way we celebrated Halloween in a little country town like Waukegan. The old-fashioned pranks we used to play. But kids don't have fun like that anymore. What do you want, plumbing or fun? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> gosh, Don, the, the things I used to do in those days. I'll never forget one Halloween. You know, I was a little boy then, and I, I took the chop suey sign off a Chinese restaurant and nailed it over the front door of our house. <laughs> oh, boy. Huh? The chop suey sign, huh? Was your father mad when he saw it? No, he just hung a tail on his derby and went into business. <laughs> Uh, that's how my sister Florence came to be known as Lotus Blossom. <laughs> we had some restaurant, chopped liver and suey. <laughs> and then the uh, following year, <laughs> the following year, oh, oh, hello, Phil. Are you coming out with us Halloween? Yeah, Jackson, but I can't meet you until after nine o'clock. I got to go to night school. Oh. Well, I'll tell you what, Phil, we'll meet you in front of the school about 9.15. How's that? Okay, I'll bring my long pants with me and slip them on. What? Now, wait a minute, Phil. Don't tell me you wear short pants to night school. Look, Jackson, I'm in third grade and I'm going to dress like it. <laughs> oh, by all means. Third grade, eh? The rate you're going, you'll get your social security and diploma on the same night. <laughs> No kidding, Phil. Uh, why don't you, uh, why don't you give up night school? Nothing doing. I don't want to be a maroon. <laughs> That's moron. <laughs> Look, Phil, just wear your short pants all the time. 
Say, I wonder, um, I wonder if Dennis wants to come along Friday. Where is the kid, anyway? I called him yesterday, and his mother told me that he's been asleep ever since we got back from New York. Well, I'll be done. See, I didn't know the kid was so lazy. What do you mean, lazy? You made Dennis share your berth on the train, then you snored so loud he couldn't rest for four nights. Oh, for heaven's sake, Mary. It's impossible for me to snore because I recently had my adenoids removed. I had an operation. Some operation. Rochester hasn't even got a license. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop. You thought he couldn't build me a barbecue pit either. <laughs> you should see it. Say, Don, speaking of our trip, I meant to ask you, is your wife, um, is your wife still mad at me for putting you both in one berth? Well, I thought she was, Jack, but strangely enough, as I was leaving the house this morning, she handed me a cake. A cake? Yes, she baked it especially for you. Especially... For me, eh? I'll give it to you right after the broadcast. Hmm. Well, especially for me, eh? <laughs> well, thanks very much, Don, but you see I'm on a diet right now and I have to cut out fattening poison. I mean, cake. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, though. Huh? Oh, Jack, don't be silly. Mrs. Wilson wouldn't poison you. She's one of the nicest girls I ever met. Listen, Mary, I saw a show in New York called Arsenic and Old Lace, and two of the sweetest old ladies you ever laid your eyes on bumped off a dozen men. <laughs> Twelve of them. Yes, but they gave them elderberry wine. What you can do with wine, you can do with cake. <laughs> I ain't eating this, sister. Oh, Jackson, don't act like a baby. All right, Phil, let's drop the cake and have a band number. Tell Peggy uh, thanks, Don. Well, how about a number, Phil? What are you going to play? Now, wait a minute, Jackson. You won't laugh if I tell you, will you? No, no. What's it going to be? Port and Peasant Overture. Are you kidding? Well, let's have it. I may be sorry I didn't eat that cake before this is over. <laughs> a special arrangement of Poet and Peasant Overture played by Phil Harris and his peasants. There, there can't be a poet in that bunch. <laughs> that, um, that number was okay, Phil. You liked it, huh, Jackson? Yes, but I have one suggestion to make. If you're going to play a number like that every week, I think I'll have to augment your orchestra. Augment? Yes. Tell him what it means before he puts on his short pants again. <laughs> Phil, uh, augment means to increase or enlarge. For instance, you ought to add a bassoon to your orchestra. 
and a French horn, and a, and a harp. Sorry, Jackson, the harp's out. What do you mean? I had one once, and all the boys hung their socks on it. <laughs> oh, well, if you had a bassoon, you could hit them over the head for doing it. Huh? <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, for our first play of the new season, we are going to... Well, look who's here. Hiya, Mr. Benny. Hello, everybody. Well, you certainly look rested now, Dennis. Boy, oh boy, do I feel good. You want to rattle, Miss Livingston? <laughs> Dennis, behave yourself. Let him alone. I'll give him a toe hole so fast he won't know what hit him. Mary, put your coat back on. <laughs> Be a lady, will you? On this clam bake? How can you call this program a clam bake when Phil just played poet and peasant? <laughs> now, let's settle down. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as I started to announce, tomorrow, October 27th, is Navy Day. So tonight, in honor of this occasion, we will present our version of that stirring drama of the Naval Air Force, that epic of heroism, that sensational Warner Brothers production, Die Bomber. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dive. You're a bomber. <laughs> Hmm. Now, uh, in this sketch, uh, I will play the part of the young flight surgeon as portrayed on the screen by dashing, daring Errol Flynn, which happens to be the most important role in the picture. Now, let's see. But, Jack, I saw the picture, and I thought that Fred McMurray as the test pilot had the most important part. Who? McMurray? Yes, he did some very heroic things. In fact, the audience applauded him the night I saw it. They did? Oh. Well, Phil, then you'll be Errol Flynn, and I'm, I'm going to be Fred McMurray. I'd never drop Flynn that fast. <laughs> never mind. Now, it's all set. Phil is Errol Flynn, I'm Fred McMurray, and Dennis, you're going to be Ralph Bellamy. Oh, boy, he had the best part of the whole darn picture. Who? Bellamy? <laughs> yeah, he was a great doctor, and the whole story was built around him. It was? <laughs> Well, now, let's see. Uh, Phil, you're going to be Errol Flynn. That's settled. Dennis, you'll be Fred McMurray, and I'll be Ralph Bellamy. Yes, that'll work out fine. Now, let's see. Uh, say, Jack. Yeah? If you ask me, Wayne Morris stole the whole picture. What, what? Who? <laughs> Wayne Morris? Yeah, he was terrific. No kidding? Well, fellas, it's all settled. I'm going to be Wayne Morris. <laughs> yeah. Good. He wasn't even in the picture. <laughs> Wait a minute. What's going on here? I'm going to play Ralph Bellamy, and that's the end of it. Mary, you're going to be a nurse, and Don, you're going to be the B-19, so stick your arms out. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, this play will go on immediately after a song by Dennis Day. Go ahead, Dennis. Hold it a minute. Come in. Oh, hello. Hello, Mr. Benny. Can I see you about that now? Uh, yes, wait out in the hall. I'll be right with you. Excuse me, fellas. Say, that little boy looks familiar. Well, don't you recognize him, Don? That's the kid who was on the train with us last week. The one that said he was going to be a gag man for Bob Hope? Yeah, now Jack is trying to sign him up first. I'm going to open up the door and listen. Shh. Sure, sure, kid. I know Bob Hope's a nice guy. But why do you want to work for him? In the <laughs> first place, he's very tough to write for. What are you talking about? I can write a thousand gags about his nose alone. <laughs> You think that's something? Listen, kid, I've got rheumatism and flat feet. And you see this bridge? Yeah. Look, it comes out. <laughs> well, I'm a cinch to write for. Now, what do you say? Well, what's your offer? Now, listen, kid. You're young and you've got your health. <laughs> now, look. Look, money we won't talk about. <laughs> The heck we won't. <laughs> hmm. This kid's gonna be tough, but he's clever. Now look, son, uh, uh, by the way, what's your name? Barton. Belly Laugh Barton. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, uh, well, now, look, Belly. Uh, forget hope. Uh, forget hope, and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you thirty-seven fifty a week and a case of Jell-O every Saturday night. How does that strike you? Well, I don't know. I'll have to talk it over with my manager. What do you have to talk it over for? Look, kid, Jell-O is good for you. It's delicious. And not only that, this year it's got that new locked-in flavor. Huh? Locked in, huh? Yeah. The flavor never goes away. We put it in, and it's there to stay. Now sign here, right here on the dotted line. <laughs> Come on, kid. Okay, let me out of the corner. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's a deal, kid. See you at my house tomorrow morning. Come for breakfast and bring some coffee cake. <laughs> so long. Goodbye. Here he comes, boys. Act nonchalant. Well, sorry to kept you waiting, fellas. Okay, Dennis, let's have your song. Belly Laugh Barton. Gee, I hope he lives up to his name. <laughs> Set the world on fire I just want to start A flame in your heart In my heart I have at one Desire And that one is you No other will do I've lost all ambition for worldly acclaim. I just want to be the one you love. And with your admission that you feel the same, while I've reached the goal I'm dreaming of, believe me, I don't want to set the world on fire. was I Don't Want to Set the World on Fire, sung by Dennis Day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction of the evening, our version of that sensational motion picture drama, Dive Bomber. And I'd like to announce that this production will be done entirely in Technicolor. How, how can you do Technicolor on the radio? We're on the red and blue networks with a green cast. <laughs> And belly laugh better do better than that one. <laughs> now, the opening scene is the laboratory of the famous flight surgeon, Dr. Bellamy, who at the moment is testing the reflexes of that ace aviator, Dennis McMurray. Curtain. Music. Hmm. The uh, Schneider test shows pilot fatigue not far from the chronic line. A silograph negative. What does the Ralph from Fantamps test show? <laughs> what does it show, uh, nurse? Pretty bad, doctor. Look at this chart. Hmm. I don't like it. This man's flying days are over. He's through. Washed up. You mean I'm not going to be an ace anymore? <laughs> To us, you'll always be an ace. <laughs> now, um... Now, let's see. Uh, 
Uh, what, uh, what else is there to check on this man? Uh, why don't you test his knee, jerk? <laughs> That's why don't you test his knee, jerk? I did that already. Well, Lieutenant McMurray, I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do. You're grounded. No, no, you can't do this to me. I belong in the air. I've given the best years of my life to aviation. And when I black out, I want to be up there flying. Understand flying! Hmm. I knew I should have taken that part. <laughs> I'm not beefing. This had to come sooner or later. It's just tough to step out of the ring when the main event may be ready to start. It's tough, I tell you. It's tough. Oh. <laughs> no, I had to be Ralph Bellamy, stand around like a dodo. <laughs> oh, well, I motivate the story, anyway. You gotta give me another chance, Doc. You hear? Because of your All talk. right, all right, I'll give you another chance. <laughs> Stop acting. Get out of here. <laughs> Next time I'll see a picture before I cast it. <laughs> Snap out of it, Doctor. Let's get on with these experiments. Oh, that's right. Uh, what am I working on today? Uh, you're trying to perfect a transparent parachute so you can get suntan on the way down. <laughs> no, that'll never be a success. Come in. Oh, hello, Commander Wilson. Good morning, Dr. Bellamy. I want to congratulate you on your experiments in counteracting aeroembolism. Thanks. What? <laughs> oh, oh, yes. I expect to have the arrows all emboled out before long. <laughs> By the way, Commander, have you located an assistant for me? Oh, yes, Dr. Bellamy. I've discovered a brilliant young graduate of Harvard Medical School. He's uh, waiting in the room right now in the waiting room. Uh, good, uh, good. <laughs> Come in, Dr. Flynn. How do you do? Dr. Flynn, Dr. Bellamy. Dr. Bellamy, Dr. Flynn. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde, while I cry. Please, Miss Crotsmere. <laughs> Please. Hey, uh, she's not bad. I'm pleased to meet you, Dr. Flynn. So you're a Harvard man, eh? Yes, uh, who's the tomato? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Flynn. Uh, Commander Wilson tells me... Yes, I believe I have solved the problem of counteracting aeroembolism. Mm -hmm. For instance, why don't we make a bell? Well, Rubber, don't you... Pneumatic, inflated before the dive. But that would compress the upper part of the body and stop the blood from leaving the brain. It can't miss, I tell you, it can't miss. <laughs> I had to be Bellamy. <laughs> the most important part, play it. Oh, well. That's a brilliant thought, Dr. Flynn. You'll get a medal for this. Oh, I don't want a medal. I'm not doing this for any paltry reward from human beings. Consider it my contribution to the progress of aviation. <laughs> contribution. I knew he'd louse it up. <laughs> now look, Commander Wilson. Flynn's idea seems to be practical, but I've got a better one. What is it, Dr. Bellamy? I'll demonstrate. Hand me a pencil, Miss Crossmere. Here you are. Thanks. Don't thank me. I'm not doing this for any paltry reward from human beings. I gave you that pencil because it'll stop the blood from leaving the brain. A pencil? <laughs> what do I care about a pencil? I've got dozens of them. Dozens of them, do you hear? And consider it my contribution to the progress of aviation. <laughs> Even Crotsmere has a better part. <laughs> well, come on, Dr. Flynn. That bell of yours is a good idea. Let's get busy on it. Okay, Dr. Bellamy. Calling Dr. Kildare. Dr. Kildare, report to surgery. That's the other feature. This is dive bomber. <laughs> oh, pardon me. Come on, Flynn. We'll make that bell, or my name ain't... How high are we, McMurray? 26,000 feet and going up. Good. How does the belt feel? It's a little tight around the ankles. Well, pull it up. 
I tell you, Mac, this experiment is going to make me famous. Well, Dr. Flynn invented it. Why didn't you bring him along? Ouch! I'll twist your other wrist if you keep that up. <laughs> How high are we now? 30,000 feet. You better put your oxygen mask on. I took it home. I'm going to wear it Halloween. <laughs> but I feel pretty... Uh-oh. What's the matter, Doc? I don't know. I... I felt a little dizzy there for a second. But... But I'm all right. How, how high are we now? 31,000. 31,000, eh? I gotta, I gotta snap out of it. I'm feeling, I feel kind of drowsy all of a sudden. Doc, Doc, what's the matter? I don't know, I guess it's the altitude. Uh, I guess this altitude kind of got me. Belt, pneumatic. It'll stop the blood from leaving the contribution. <laughs> Yeah. Doc, wake up. Dr. Flynn, Dr. Bellamy. Dr. Bellamy, Dr. Flynn. Well, here we go again. <laughs> now come the whistles. Gee, he looks so peaceful, I think I'll count sheep and join him. One, two, three, four. No, that's an eagle. Four, five, six. week brings Halloween, and Halloween brings fun and festivities, gay parties that call for good things to eat, like the grand dessert I'm going to tell you about right now. It's a real party treat, and yet an easy dessert to make. All it takes is a can of peach halves and a package of orange jello, and when you have those two items, you're all ready to go. Just dissolve the orange jello in hot water, as you usually do. Then fill six wide sherbet glasses, about one-third full, and chill. When the jello is firm, Place a marshmallow in the center of each glass and cover with a peach ham, rounded side up. Pour the remaining jello over the peaches and chill until firm. And there you have an ideal treat for Halloween, a swell dessert that will make your Halloween guests say, you surely know how to give a party. Get a can of peach halves and a package of orange jello tomorrow and make up this delicious combination. Juicy golden peaches covered with shimmering orange jello. But remember, when you buy Jell-O, be sure to look for the big red letters on the box. Because only Jell-O's new locked-in process gives you all the flavor, always. Tomorrow, when you make out your grocery list, put down Jell-O and write on it, write Jell-O puddings. Jell-O vanilla, Jell-O chocolate, Jell-O butterscotch puddings. Try them and you'll say, yes, Jell-O puddings are just like grandma's, only more so. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles. J-E-L-L-O! The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with Relax. Well, friends, it's not really considered quite fair to open packages before Christmas, but of course there's one package that you can open any day with the whole family's hearty approval, and that's a package of Jell-O. Open a package and serve it tomorrow, and let the folks at your house enjoy Jell-O's wonderful new locked-in flavor. Jell-O's gay scintillating colors add charm to any table, lend a festive touch to any meal. Why, just to look at a bright shimmering mold of Jell-O is enough to set appetites a tingle. And when it comes to flavor, well, Jell-O is simply in a class by itself. There's just nothing that can beat Jell-O's rich, tangy taste. So full of intriguing flavor, so downright good and refreshing. Tomorrow, treat everybody to a tempting dish of Jell-O. Ask your grocer for all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors. They're all locked in and they're all better than ever.
that was Relax, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, once again, the Yuletide season is here with all its joy and gaiety. So without further ado, we bring you a star to place atop your Christmas tree, ah. Jack Benny. <laughs> Well, hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And Don, that was quite a whimsical introduction. A star to place atop your Christmas tree. I suppose you said that because I'm a movie star, is that right? No, Jack, that wasn't my thought at all. Oh. I meant that you actually and physically resemble a star. Well, I don't, uh... I, uh, I don't get it, Don. What do you mean? Well, for instance, you've got a dash of silver in your hair. Yes. And you've always got a merry twinkle in your eye. Yes, yes. And the seat of your pants is always bright and shiny. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And you're wearing the only pair of pointed shoes in Hollywood. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Don. I'm not going to argue about the silver and the twinkle, and I'll even go along with the shiny pants. But these pointed shoes I've got on are very popular. They're French Shriner and Erner's new bayonet model. <laughs> They're, uh, they're very snappy, don't you think? Snappy is right. But personally, Jack, I like a shoe that spreads out. Listen, brother, any shoe you step into is doomed. <laughs> Believe me. Oh, I'm not so heavy on my feet. You're not, eh, Don? Your arches fell the first time your mother said, Come on, Snookums, walk toward me. <laughs> But speaking about these shoes I'm wearing... Wow, get a load of them. Did Vaudeville come back? No, Vaudeville didn't come back. <laughs> Just so happens that for a change, I switched to a pointed, tight-fitting shoe. Then where do you keep your money now? <laughs> I've got a hollow tooth. I can go along with a gag, sister. <laughs> and let me tell you something, young lady. Any more of those Livingston Lulus tonight, and your invitation to my Christmas party next Thursday is automatically canceled. Remember that. Well, Jack, speaking of your party, what are you going to serve for dinner? Turkey, goose, or duck? Ham hocks, and not another word about it. <laughs> Come early, Don. You know, a lot of big, uh, a lot of big movie stars are going to be there. Movie stars? Name one. Now, oh, there'll be lots of them. Come on, name one. Oh, they'll be there. Don't stall. Name one movie star that's going to be at your party. All right, Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> I know he's coming because he already sent me a wire by Western Union. Western Union I heard about, but who was Rodney Dangerfield? <laughs> who is Rodney Dangerfield? Well, I'll be... Mary, did you see the Fargo kid rides the Pony Express on the Santa Fe Trail at the Hitching Post Theater last week? <laughs> did you? No. Well, that was Rodney's greatest performance. If you could have seen him jump out of the second-story window of a burning building and gallop out of town on his horse, blazing away with his six-shooter in one hand and playing tumbleweed girl I love you on his guitar with the other. <laughs> well, what a scene. Pretty thrilling, huh? Was it? A kid sitting in back of me got so excited he beat me on the head with a stick of licorice. <laughs> anyway, you'll meet Rodney at my house next Thursday. Well, who else is coming, Jack? Well, you know, I'm making a picture with Carol Lombard, so naturally I had to invite her... And I also told her to ask Clark if he wanted to come. Gee whiz, is Clark Gable going to be at your party? Well, I'm not sure about him, but I got a definite no from Lombard. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, and the uh, Gary Coopers can't come, and the Henry Fondas had a previous engagement, and Bob Taylor and Barbara Stanwyck have a toothache. <laughs> Between them? How do I know? And then Claudette Colbert can't come. She sprained her ankle. I saw her dancing at the Macombo last night. With that ankle? Poor kid. <laughs> and then uh, Errol Flynn can't make it. He's in New York, you know. Now, well, let's see. Oh, yes, Barney Dean. He's coming. I'm, I'm sure of that. Well, here I go again. Who's Barney Dean? <laughs> Who's Barney Dean? Did you see Sergeant York? Yes. Well, he was a soldier in that. <laughs> That's who. Anyway, Barney Dean will be there. And then I invited 
Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, bub. Sorry I'm late, but I was across the street shooting pool. Shooting pool? Well, let me ask you something, Phil. Who pays you your salary, me or the pool room? Look, Jackson, if I didn't take the salary I get here and double it over there, I'd have to give up me. <laughs> Too bad about you. Hey, Phil, are you and Alice coming to Jack's party? Oh, I don't know. Who's going to be there? Everybody from Barney Dean to Rodney Dangerfield. Don't run him down. Hey, is Rod Dangerfield going to be at your party? Yep. Oh, that guy's terrific. I think he's darn near as good as Hoot Horowitz. <laughs> what do you mean, darn near as good? Did you see Rodney's latest picture, the Fargo kid rides the Pony Express on the Santa Fe Trail? Yeah, I seen it last week. That was a thriller, wasn't it? You said it. I got so excited, I hit some old bird in the front of me with my licorice stick. <laughs> Oh, ho! <laughs> so that was you. You were at the Hitching Post Theater last Tuesday evening. Not so loud, Jackson. I was playing hooky from uh, my night school. Oh. Well, don't worry. I won't squeal. You better not, Sponger. I'll have to drill you. A bang, a bang, a bang. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a drilling me, son, because I'm the sheriff. A bang, a bang, a bang. Uh-uh, bang! <laughs> These two... <laughs> <laughs> These two cowboys come to you through the courtesy of Jello, who are open for suggestions. <laughs> Never mind, we'll talk about the picture later, Phil. Now, how about a band number? Okay. Hold it. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? Am I going to be invited to your Christmas party? My name is Pigeon. Walter Pigeon? No, Dead Pigeon. A bang, a bang, a bang. <laughs> what a head he's got. That's the only grapefruit I ever saw that can take shorthand. <laughs> he's my secretary, folks. Play, Phil. A pedal played by Phil Harris and his Yule Tide Orchestra. Yule meaning you'll have to go a long way to hear a band like this, and Tide meaning I wish they'd go out with it. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, but no kidding, Phil. That number sounded swell. It was really the nut. All right, Don. Phil's number was the nut. Oh, Jack, this one is utterly <laughs> absurd. Don, Phil's band number was the nut. You know it wasn't. That's not the point. <laughs> Come on, Don. Phil's band number was the nut. Oh, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, the nut time you go to your neighborhood grocery. <laughs> you see? Why not ask him for a package of Jello with its new locked-in flavor? Now, here's the clever part, folks. Oh, Jack, I'll never be able to face my friend. Don Nuts! <laughs> oh, very well. So whether your name is Hazel or Filbert, 
You will not regret buying the tempting and economical dessert. Buy hickory. Very good. Very good. There you are, Don. That was one of the most novel things I've ever written. Oh, Jack, you didn't write that. Yes, I did. All by yourself? All by myself. You mean it came to you like a flash? Like a bolt out of the blue. Keep talking, brother. When I get the right lead, I'm going to murder you. <laughs> no, don't be so critical. That was a very clever commercial. Wasn't it, Dennis? Hey, where's Dennis? Here I am. I'm back in Mr. Wilson. Oh. Peekaboo. <laughs> Peekaboo. You gotta humor the kid. <laughs> Say, Dennis, have you got a nice song prepared for today? Yeah, but first I want to thank you for letting me come over to the studio the other day. Oh, don't mention it. That was a pretty hot love scene you did with Carol Lombard, by golly. Yes, it was. Gosh, when you grabbed her and gave her that big kiss, I got so excited I was quivering all over. You were? She didn't even move a muscle. Never mind. What's the matter with that girl? <laughs> I don't know. Look, boy, she kisses Gable when she leaves home in the morning, and she kisses him when she gets back at night. Anything in between is strictly cheesecake. <laughs> well, I don't want to be catty, but oh well, forget it. How about a song, Dennis? What's it going to be? I'm going to sing a medley of Christmas carols. Good. Oh, say, fellas, that reminds me. I've got to go home early tonight and do some work on my Christmas tree. I want to get it all trimmed up for the party. You want to come and help me, Mary? Sure, why not? Phil, after Dennis's song, you can play a few selections and fill out the program. Well, that'll give me a chance to play a couple of high-class numbers like who's this plays. Uh, you know, Andre Costa... What's the rest of this here? Lannis. Andre Costa Lannis. Oh, brother. Well, why do you always embarrass me by making up them big words? <laughs> I didn't make up anything. That's the man's name. He's married to Lily Pond. Her, I can say. Look, Phil, just accompany Dennis a song, then put on your hat and go home. Come on, Mary, let's get out of here. What's that? Come in. Telegram. I mean, special delivery for Mary Livingston. <laughs> right here, bud. Give him a tip, will you, Jack? Okay. Here you are, boy. Here's a half a dollar for you. Thanks. I can go along with a gag. A boom. <laughs> you can louse it up, too. <laughs> He had to put a boom on the end of it. <laughs> Wasn't satisfied the way it was written. Had to put a boom. Anyway, I'd like to see one stooge in this town with hair. <laughs> Come on, Mary. Oh, wait a minute, Jack. This letter's from Mama. You can read it in the cab. Come on. Oh, I'll let her read it now, Jack. Mary's mother's a... She's just a, a riot. Oh, all right. I'm glad you got that out, too. Huh? <laughs> we had an hour program, we'd be very successful here. You know that. Huh? All right, read your mother's letter, Mary. What's the head of Hopper of Plainfield got to say? <clears throat> My darling daughter, Mary, just in line to let you know that Christmas is almost here, and as yet I have not received your X chase. X chase. But don't get me wrong. If your check has been delayed in the mail, I take back everything I'm thinking. How can anybody be so mercenary? Your sister Ethel and her husband are here for the holidays and will spend several weeks with us. Inasmuch as they live right next door, I think this is an imposition. Oh, I don't know. Quiet. You ought to see your sister's new baby. Everybody says it's a regular little doll. And they're right. It looks just like Popeye. Well, no wonder after all your sister is no rose And that husband of hers, does he still sell blueing house to house? No, he's a vanilla extract man now Oh, vanilla extract man, oh, he's going places Come on, finish the letter Speaking of Christmas, I saw your father tiptoeing up the stairs last night With a great big package over his shoulder I was thrilled to death until I found out the package was your Uncle Willie <laughs> Boy, was he full of vanilla. <laughs> no more news, except that your brother Bacardi... Bacardi? Papa named him off a bottle. Oh, oh. Except that your brother Bacardi was turned down by the army on account of flat feet, 
chest and head. <laughs> also, his hands drag on the ground when he walks. Gee, his nails must be a mess. <laughs> Love to all, Mama. Well, I'm glad that's over. Oh, wait a minute. Here's a P.S. Tell Jack I heard him do Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde on the program a few weeks ago. What a pew foreman. <laughs> pew foreman? Let's see that. Well, I'll be darned. Hmm, if I'd have known this was going to happen, I'd have put another cup of water in that perfume I sent her. <laughs> Sing, Dennis. See you Christmas, fellas. Come on, Mary. Let's get over to the house. Right up here, buddy. It's that big white house with the iron reindeer on the lawn. Okay, pal. Boy, look at that meter. A dollar and a half. Hmm. Oh, driver, how much do I owe you? Like she said, a dollar and a half. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, how would you like to match? Three dollars or nothing? Double or nothing? Okay, pal. I'm matching you. Just a second. Okay, here goes. Come on, lift up. Hmm. <laughs> well, <laughs> so long, pal. <laughs> Rochester, why doesn't he answer the door? (laughs) 
I have to stand here all night? Oh, take it easy, Jack. Calm down. What three dollars? It's not the money. I don't believe in gambling. <laughs> don't talk to me. I feel awful. Why don't you take off one of those shoes and cut your throat? <laughs> Mary, I'm in no mood for any... Good evening, boss. Happy Yule time. Rochester, you were late answering the door, and I'm going to teach you a lesson. I'm fining you three dollars. <laughs> You understand? I wish the stock market would come back that fast. <laughs> Never mind. Any messages, Rochester? Yes, sir. Mr. Charles Boyer called and said he won't be able to attend your Christmas party. Why not? You got me, boss. He gave his excuse in French. <laughs> well, that's the sneakiest thing I ever heard of. Any other messages? Yes, Lady Mendel phone. Said she got your lovely invitation, and who are you? <laughs> Does she ever go to the movies, for heaven's sake? Come on, Mary, the tree is in the library. Bring my slippers, Rochester. Your slippers? Yes. Lounging, bedroom, or ballet? <laughs> I'm in no mood for a ballet dance, believe me. Bring in my lounging slippers. Yes, sir. Come on, Mary. While I'm putting the star on top of the tree, you can be hanging popcorn balls on the branches. Oh, is your tree going to have branches this year? <laughs> yes, it's going to have branches. <laughs> well, I think the one you had last... Uh-oh, here comes your border. Yeah. I wonder why he's carrying that hatchet. Hello, Mr. Billingsley. Good afternoon, Mr. Benny. Home a little early, I see. <laughs> yes, yes, I have some work to do around the house. Oh, Mr. Billingsley, what are you doing with that hatchet? Are you a Boy Scout now? No, I'm going out to dinner later, and when I say chopped chicken liver, that's what I mean. <laughs> Oh, uh... Oh, I, uh... I see. Well, goodbye, Mr. Benny. Goodbye. Keep him flying. <laughs> hmm. I can't... I can't understand Mr. Billingsley lately. You know, Mary, he slept under his bed last night. He hung onto the springs like a bat. You know? Weird fellow. Well, there you are. There's my Christmas tree, Mary. Isn't it nice? Yeah, that's the biggest one you ever had. Where'd you get it? Got it just north of Redwood City. Well, let's start with the decorations. Mary, you hang up these candy canes and I'll... Rochester, what happened to that box of popcorn balls we had in the closet? I got bad news, boss. There's nothing in there now but a big, fat mouse. <laughs> Darn it, I'm short of ornaments. Got to have something to hang on that tree. Yes, those socks look awful by themselves. <laughs> the socks are coming off as soon as they're dry. <laughs> I wanted popcorn balls to add a little... Say, I have an idea. How would oranges look there? Oranges? Yeah, I've got a backyard full of them. I'll go out and pick some. Meanwhile, start with those candy canes, Mary. I'll be right back. Jingle bells, jingle bells, yum, bum, 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 bum. Three dollars. I had to match them. Yum, bum, 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 bum. Oh, well. A jingle bells, jingle bells, yum, bum, tea. Let's see. I think there's some big ones in this tree over here. Yeah, these will be fine. A nice, big, juicy one. I'll take about a dozen. Let's see. One, two, three... Four, five... Hello, mister. What are you doing? Hello. Six. Oh. Oh, hello, little girl. Where did you come from? I was just looking around your yard. Where's your polo bear? My polo bear? Oh, he's asleep for the winter. Do you live around here? Yes, we just moved into that new house next to Ronald Coleman's. Oh, next to Ronald Coleman's. Oh, that's well. We're, we're going to be neighbors, aren't we? Uh-huh. You're Jack Benny, aren't you? That's right. That's who I am. Uh, gee, I heard you do Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde on the radio. What a performance! <laughs> <laughs> hey, it was pretty good. Say, little girl, your face is kind of familiar. Haven't I seen you in pictures? You might have. My name's Carolyn Lee. Oh, Carolyn Lee. Yeah. <laughs> wow. 
Well, this is certainly a surprise. So little Miss Lee is my neighbor. Ah, uh, you can call me Carolyn. Ah, <laughs> uh, good. And, and you can call me Jack. Okay, Jack. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, she's cute. Say, Carolyn, are you going to be busy Christmas morning? I don't know. Why? Well, I had a telephone call from Santa Claus last night, and he told me he was going to leave a beautiful present under my tree, especially for you. Well, let's analyze this. How did Santa Claus know you were going to meet me? Oh, he even knows about things before they happen. He knows everything. Then and why that's you... why we've got to be real good, especially around Christmas. Then why are you picking Mr. Coleman's oranges? Look, Carolyn. <laughs> These aren't Mr. Coleman's oranges. What hangs over the fence is mine. Now, let me tell you something about Santa Claus, Carolyn. Every year at this time, he makes a list of good little boys and girls, and when they wake up Christmas morning... Hey, boss, boss, come in here! I'll be with you in a minute. And, Carolyn, if these old boys and girls have been real good... You gotta come in now, boss. Mr. Billsley's chopping down the Christmas tree. What? <laughs> chopping down the tree? See you later, Carolyn. Mr. Billingsley! Mr. Billingsley! Mary, stop him! It's too late now! Timber! Oh, my goodness. I knew I should have taken away his hatchet. What a combination. Golden apricots and rich, shimmering lemon jello. That's the swell blend that makes jello apricot rings such a grand treat. Just sliced canned apricots and lemon jello, deliciously molded into one of the most tempting desserts you ever tasted. And one of the easiest, too. Simply dissolve one package of lemon jello in one and one fourth cups of hot water. Next, add a dash of salt and three fourths cup of syrup from the canned apricots. Then chill until thickened and fold in two and a half cups of the sliced canned apricots themselves. When molded, served with a garnishing of whipped cream, apricot quarters, and green maraschino cherries. And there's a dessert you just can't beat for taste and attractiveness. Juicy sliced apricots blended with the richness of sunny lemon jello. So get them both and make up this delightful treat. Jello makes any gelatin dessert taste extra good because the locked in process protects the flavor for your complete enjoyment. We're a little late, so good night, folks, and Merry Christmas to all. Remember, tomorrow when you order Jell-O, order Jell-O puddings, too, in all three flavors. Jell-O puddings are just like Grandma's, only more so. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles. J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O pudding, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with I Am an American. Year after year, Jell-O keeps getting better and better. And today, Jell-O is richer, more delicious than it's ever been before. The reason for this extra goodness is a new Jell-O process that locks in Jell-O's famous flavor and makes it even more tempting, even more enjoyable. Jell-O is a beautiful dessert, radiant with color and glistening with goodness. And its swell flavor, so tangy and refreshing, makes you think that you're actually tasting the ripe, juicy fruit itself. Yes, Jell-O's marvelous flavor is gloriously good. A flavor that everybody loves. And now that it's locked in, Jell-O's grand flavor reaches a new peak in pleasure. But prove it for yourself. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice that there's no sweet fruity odor, no telltale aroma to warn of escaping flavor. Then dissolve the tiny Jell-O particles and notice the way Jell-O's captive goodness comes pouring out with a rush of delicious fragrance and flavor. Ask your grocer tomorrow for several packages of Jell-O. You'll find that Jell-O is better and richer than ever now that its flavor is locked in.
was I am an American played by the orchestra. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, next Tuesday, March the 17th, is St. Patrick's Day. So instead of my usual hackneyed introduction this evening, uh, you can sit down now, Jack. Hmm? Sit down. Oh, hmm. So instead of my usual hackneyed introduction, it gives me extreme pleasure to bring to you a young Irish lad who has become a great success on this program. Irish? I wonder if he means... No, he told me to sit down. <laughs> Could it be... That... Jack, will you please keep quiet? Okay, okay. And here he is, folks, that golden voice tenor from the Emerald Isle, Dennis Day! <laughs> Well, take a bow, Dennis. Thank you, thank you. Jello again, this is Dennis Day talking. I'm sure it's a grand pleasure to be addressing all you lovely people. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen to the blarney. And folks, right now I'd like to tell you a little story about Pat and Mike. Oh, fine. Well, Pat and Mike were walking down the street when all of a sudden a parrot flew out of a pet shop right in front of them. A parrot, eh? And Pat turned to Mike and said, My, hasn't that thing got beautiful feathers? What do you suppose it is? So Mike said... Sure, I don't know. Let's go and catch it. So? So they chased it and chased it. And finally, the parrot turned around and said, What the heck do you guys want? And Pat tipped his hat and said, Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. We thought you was a bird. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good, Dennis. Very good. Now, uh, go and sit down. Sit down? Gee whiz, Mr. Benny. I thought I was going to do the whole program tonight. No, 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 no. Don, uh... See, Don thought that on account of it being so close to St. Patrick's Day, it would be a nice gesture to introduce you first. Uh, but that's all. Oh. You see, Dennis, uh, you haven't had enough experience to handle the whole program. Well, let's get going. Uh, Jello again. This is Jack Benny talking. What are you trying to do? Hold me down? <laughs> no. No, I'm not trying to hold you down, kid. But for heaven's sake, you can't be master of ceremonies. You're too young. Hmm. <clears throat> uh, Jello again. This is Jack Benny talking. He hates me because I'm young. <laughs> I don't hate you, Dennis. I simply can't take the chance of letting you handle this program. You might be a flop. But Jack, on the other hand, he might be very good. Don, either way, I'm taking a chance. <laughs> Now, let's drop it. <clears throat> uh, Jello again. This is Dennis Day talking. And sure, folks, and... Oh, nuts. This is all your fault, Don Wilson. You had to introduce the kid. You had to be topical. Well, I thought it was a good idea, Jack. After all, our listeners may be tired of the same old thing week after week. Oh. So now I'm an old thing. <laughs> well, Mr. Wilson, I'd watch my step if I were you. Because the time of year is fast approaching when your contract comes up for renewal. I'm glad you brought up the subject, Jack, because I may not be with you next season. I'm sick and tired of it. Oh? <laughs> you may not be with me? Oh, now, here's the situation. I've had a splendid offer to do the announcing on the Baxter Beauty Clay program. Beauty Clay? Yes. They offered me a very nice salary and all the mud packs I can use. Well, Don, after all these years, if a little mud can come between us, well... There's a difference in salary, too. Mud or money, you ain't loyal. <laughs> That's gratitude for you. Hello, Jack. How are you? Hello, hello. How do you think I am? Well, what's the matter with you? You look like somebody just stole your rubber heels. They better not, sister. I've got my license number branded on them. I'm taking no chances. I'll bet your hot water bag is safe, too. And so is my teething ring. I can go along with a gag. <laughs> anyway, if you want to know why I'm upset, it's because I've discovered that my pal Don Wilson is a traitor. A big, fat traitor. <laughs> he wants to leave me for the Baxter Beauty Clay program. Well, why not? They made us a swell offer. What do you mean, us? They want Don, Phil, Dennis, and me. What? Can we put in a word for you, Mr. Benny? <laughs> Keep out of this. Well, Mary, all I can say is that fine appreciation after all I've done for you. After all you've done for me? Yes. When I first met you, you didn't even have a pair of stockings. What are you talking about? There was a whole counter full. <laughs> I mean of your own. And another thing, young lady, who put you in show business? Who started you out in Vaudeville? I started in Vaudeville with my sister, Babe. 
Well, what an act that was. Tumblers, the bouncing living <laughs> A lot of us helped to kill Vaudeville, but you and your sister jumped on it. Now, wait a minute, Jack Benny. You never even saw our act. I did, too, and I'll never forget your sister, Babe. She was so nearsighted, she used to take bows with her back to the audience. She knew what she was doing. Oh, yeah? And furthermore, she's not nearsighted. She's not, eh? Well, I like to have a nickel for every weighing machine she said hello to. <laughs> Fine name she picked out, Babe. She looks more like Babe Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a program to do tonight, and as long as you're all working for me temporarily, you might as well do your song, Dennis. Okay. I'm going to sing The Garden Where the Pretties Grow, and I dedicate it to Mr. Baxter and his beauty clay who is listening in. Baxter's beauty clay. What burns me up, I've been using that clay for years. You must have been growing radishes in it. <laughs> I tried it on my face, too. Anyway, I'm talking about friendship and appreciation and gratitude for my own cast. Should I sing now, Mr. Benny? Wait a minute, Dennis. I just happen to think of a little poem that fits this situation to a T. It's entitled Loyalty and was written by Otis J. Cribblecobbler. <laughs> now, let this sink in. Loyalty. <laughs> Ahem. Hey, where's that music coming from? Like in the movies, it just comes. <laughs> Loyalty. Real friends are few and far between. They'll never tarnish or turn green. They'll stick with you through stormy seas. They'll go through heat or even freeze. <laughs> so when you have a friend who is a friend, do not kick him in. The end. <laughs> Now, remember that, all of you, before you think of deserting me for another program. Sing, Dennis. That poem didn't sink in very well. Maybe I'll have to give the gang more money or something. I don't know. Have you ever been in love, me boys, or have you felt the pain? I'd sooner be in jail myself and be in love again. For the girl I loved was beautiful, I'd have you all to know. And I met her in the garden where the prairies grow. She was just the sort of creature, boys, that nature did intend. To walk right through the world, me boys, without the Grecian bend. Or did she wear a chignon? I'd have you all to know. And I met her in the garden where the prairies grow. Says I, my pretty Kathleen, I hope that you'll agree. She was not like your city girls who say you're making free. So she, I'll ask me parents, and tomorrow I'll let you know. If you'll meet me in the garden where the prairies grow. She was just the sort of creature, boys, that nature did intend. To walk right through the worldly boys without the Grecian bend. Now did she wear a sheen yawn, I'd have you all to know. And I met her in the garden where the prairies grow. Oh, the parents, they consented, and we're blessed with children three. Two boys just like their mother and the girl, the image of me. And now we're going to train them up the way they ought to go. For her to dig right in the garden where the prairies grow. She was just the sort of creature, boys, that nature did intend. To walk her through the world, me boys, without the Grecian bend. Now did she wear a chignon? I have you all to know. And I met her in the garden where the babies grow. The Garden Where the Prades Grow, a special St. Patrick's Day song sung by Dennis Day. And Dennis, that was swell. Stick with Uncle Jack and you've got a brilliant future. Well, I'd love to, but Mr. Baxter has made me some wonderful promises. Promises? If it's promises you want, you're with the right guy now. <laughs> I deliver the goods, too. Dennis's contract called for a raise this month, and he got one. Some raise. You put high heels on his shoes. <laughs> a raise is a raise. 
It all depends on how you look at it. Gosh, I turned my ankles ten times this week. <laughs> well, watch it. Don't be so clumsy. Anyway, Dennis, you better think twice before you listen to anybody else's promises. You know, they don't always... Hmm. Here comes another traitor. How do you do, Mr. Harris? Uh, feeling fine, I trust? Mr. Harris? Why, all the formality. <laughs> If you mean formality, Phil, which is my guess, the reason for my frigid attitude is because I found out that you're a snake in the grass. Well, I haven't even seen grass for ten years. Well, you've seen snakes. That I know. <laughs> snakes, are them those wiggly things that come just ahead of the elephants? <laughs> I don't know the order of their appearance, but that's what you are. Imagine leaving me for Baxter's beauty clay. Jackson, I wouldn't leave you for all the beauty clay in the world, and heaven knows I'm a mess. <laughs> what? Hey, Phil, you mean you're not going to walk out with the rest of us? No, sir. Look, Jackson, I got it all figured out. We don't need to rest this bunch at all. We don't? No, next season we'll have just you, me, and a 100-piece symphony orchestra. A 100-piece orchestra? Yeah, you lead one end, I'll lead the other, and let them bump. <laughs> Well, it's a novel idea, Phil, but offhand, I don't know of a hundred musicians that would stoop that low. <laughs> no, if my gang wants to leave me, I'll I'll just quit radio, that's all. Are you sure you don't like that symphony idea, Jackson? No, no, it stinks, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks just the same. I'll um I'll just quit radio. Now, wait a minute, Jack. I think this has gone far enough. We did have an offer from Mr. Baxter. But we're not going to accept it. Uh, not much. That's the truth, Jack. Why, we couldn't leave you or Jello. We're all locked in together. That's a plug if I ever heard one. <laughs> oh, wake up, Jack. The whole thing was just a gag. Oh, a gag, eh? Yeah, <laughs> God, you fellas really had me going. I've heard about your other offer. You had me so worried all week, my hair was falling out. See? <laughs> I thought that thing was guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good, good, Mary, good. Huh? Well, let's get going on. Let's get going on with the program, shall we? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, immediately after a number by Phil Harris and his orchestra, we are going to present a special surprise attraction in which we will definitely expose for the first time. Excuse me. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. I'm busy. I'm busy now, Rochester. What do you want? Well, boss, I got to send in my income tax by tomorrow night. Yes. And I'm a little short of that green stuff that ain't grass, yet it ain't hay. <laughs> Why, Rochester, do you mean to say you have to pay tax on that small salary you get? I better, Mr. Morgan Paul sent me a blank with RSVP on it. RSVP? Rochester's in Velvet Council. <laughs> Oh, I see. Well, uh, Rochester, uh, tell me, how much does your income tax amount to? It all depends on my dependents. Is it okay if I put my brother down as a dependent? Well, I don't know. Can your brother work? He can, but it's not <laughs> Oh, well, well, look, maybe, uh... Maybe your brother can't work. Maybe he's incapacitated. Uh, beg your pardon? I said maybe your brother is incapacitated. He's too weak. Or well, any man that can stack up turn on his face and eat him like flapjack ain't in for anything. <laughs> well, and in that case, you cannot deduct him as a dependent. Uh -huh. In fact, Rochester, I wouldn't bother with any deduction. If I were you, I'd just send in a check for the full amount. A check? Yes. Well, can you suggest a good bank that can go along with a gag? <laughs> No, but, um, I'll be happy to lend you enough to pay your tax, Rochester. Thanks, boss. Go on. Go on. Oh, say, boss, Mr. Benny. Now what? Uh, can I be up for stock market losses? Why, of course. Wait a minute. What stock did you have? Well, I took an awful beating in African Cubes Incorporated. <laughs> you can't take off for dice. Goodbye. The guy is always in trouble. Play, Phil, and then we'll have our big surprise of the evening. <laughs>
That was I Said No, played by Phil Harris and his Biltmore Bowlers. Biltmore meaning the hotel where the boys are working, and bowlers meaning they should play in an alley. <laughs> And, uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen... Gee, thanks for the plug, Jackson. Hmm. You can't insult the guy. <laughs> it's amazing. It and now, ladies and gentlemen, for our surprise feature attraction. No doubt a few of you heard Fred Allen's program last week, in which Mr. Allen very modestly devoted most of the show to his own life story. Oh, I thought it was very funny. Uh, we won't go into that. <laughs> Now, when Mr. Allen presented this soggy saga of his miserable life, he completely overlooked one very important incident which marked the turning point in his crummy career. <laughs> now, in order to bring to light this hidden chapter of Mr. Allen's drab existence, we are going to present the life of Jack Benny. What's that got to do with Allen? Because I'm the guy that... Be patient, Mary. We'll come to that. <laughs> So here we go, folks, with the life of Jack Benny. First, I am born. Take it, Mr. Wilson. The scene, ladies and gentlemen, is the little farmhouse of Mr. and Mrs. Zeke Benny, located on the outskirts of Waukegan, Illinois. The date is February 14th. The year... Let's go! <laughs> A goo goo. Well, well, what is it, nurse? Boy or girl? Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, Zeke. It's a bouncing baby boy. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's bounce it. <laughs> A fine start I got. Six years later, and Jackie Benny, our hero, is now a handsome little fellow with big blue eyes and long gray curls. <laughs> they were golden, and they came way down to my ankles. You must have looked like a weeping willow. Quiet. We find Jackie practicing on his violin while his old music teacher stands by with a look of rapture on his face. How was that, Mr. Lindsay? A. Hey. I said, how was that? Am I getting any better? A. Hey. I said, am I getting any better? Oh, have you been sick? <laughs> Oh, well, someday I'll be a great violinist. Ten years later. I'm playing it by heart now, folks. <laughs> and then came 1917, the World War, somewhere in France. later, and Jack Benny starts his vaudeville career as a concert violinist. I thank you. Wait a minute. What's all this got to do with Fred Allen? We're coming to that. Continue, Mr. Wilson. The scene changes. It's a cold winter's day in 1927. And Jack Benny, now a vaudeville headliner, is appearing at the Electric Theater in St. Joe, Missouri. St. Joe. They love me there. <laughs> Gosh. 
As Mr. Benny is about to enter the stage door, a ragged, unkempt stranger with icicles on his adenoids approaches him and says... Uh, pardon me, mister, but would you please give me a nickel for a cup of coffee? A nickel? Yes, sir, I'm hungry. I haven't eaten for days. I'm starved, I tell you, starved. Then a nickel won't help you, my good man. Here's a $10 bill. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Oh, stop kissing my hand. It's nothing. <laughs> Poor boy. Oh, but I'll never forget you for this. Never, never. Don't wipe my shoes. It's quite all right. <laughs> Tell me, my good man, what is your name? Sullivan. Fred Sullivan. Fred Sullivan. Remember that name, ladies and gentlemen. And that boy. Remember that Jack Benny gave him $10 when he was starving. And remember his words when he said, uh, I'll never forget you for this. <laughs> Three years later, and Fred Sullivan is now Fred Allen, a successful juggler in vaudeville. See why I told you to remember that name, folks? And it's a cold winter's day in New York City. And Mr. Allen is about to enter the stage door of the Palace Theater when a ragged stranger with a long black beard and a tin cup approaches. <laughs> Pardon me, sir. Would you please give me a nickel for a cup of instant postum? <laughs> Please, get away from me, you bum, or I'll take my gold-handled cane and give you two lumps for your postum. See what a rat he was, folks? But I'm hungry, starved, I tell you, starved. Out of my way, you derelict. Thinks mules are just taking their bow, and I'm on next. Very well, but I'll tell Variety about this. Mr. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan? Who are you? Wait till I pull off this false beard. <laughs> All right, who am I? Jack Benny. That's right, the man who gave you $10 when you only asked for a nickel. And the man who's going to beat you to within an inch of your life. <laughs> Take that, ouch, and that, ouch, and that. Leave me alone, and that. I'll give the money and back. That. Help, and that. ouch, ouch. Well, have you had enough, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> I knocked him silly, folks. And that's how Fred Allen became a comedian. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the incident that Mr. Allen was ashamed to reveal on his program last week. Play Phil. Here's a grand jello treat, friends, that will really bring you compliments galore. A good-looking, swell-tasting dessert that you'll be proud to serve again and again. It's Cardinal Pear Mold, rich, juicy pears embedded in a shimmering mold of bright red raspberry jello. And what a tempting treat it is. A dessert that looks gloriously gay and inviting, and in taste, downright delicious. Yet it's so simple and easy to make. All you do is just dissolve one package of Jell-O imitation raspberry flavor in a pint of hot water and chill until slightly thickened. Then fold in canned sliced pears, mold, and serve plain or with whipped cream. It's a dessert that will lend color and enjoyment to any meal. A bright, shimmering dessert, simply full of delightful flavor. Try it and see what a big hit it makes with everybody. Tomorrow, make up this tangy combination of juicy canned pears and beautiful red raspberry jello. Remember, jello's new locked in flavor makes jello extra rich. This is 
the last number of the 24th program in the current Jell-O series, and we will be with you again next Sunday at the same time. Say, Jack, did you really give Fred Allen a $10 bill when he only asked for a nickel? Oh, it may have been a 20 or a 50. Who knows? I couldn't see very well. It was snowing. You mean to say you took off your shoe in the snow? I carried a wallet then. Good night, folks. <laughs> was written by Bill Maher and Eddie Beloy. The part of Fred Allen was interpreted on our program tonight by the RKO player, Peter Lind Hayes. Remember this name, friends, Jell-O Puddings. It's the name of three grand puddings made by the same folks who make Jell-O. There's Jell-O Vanilla Pudding, a smooth, luscious pudding with the delicate, creamy flavor of real vanilla. Jell-O Pudding is not only swell as a pudding, but ideal for cream pies, tarts, or as a cream filling for cakes. So when you order Jell-O, order Jell-O puddings in all three flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. Jell-O puddings are just like grandma's, only more so. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The following is a delayed broadcast by transcription. The Jell-O program, coming to you from the Marine Corps base in San Diego, brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Puddings, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with Call Out the Marines! Have you noticed how extra rich Jell-O is today, now that Jell-O's wonderful flavor is locked in? Well, there's never been anything like it, just never been anything more delicious. Locking in Jell-O's flavor heightens its goodness, brings it to a new peak of delight. Now, more than ever, Jell-O's shimmering color and beauty hold a promise of rich enjoyment, a promise that is gloriously fulfilled in Jell-O's bright, refreshing flavor. Flavor so thrillingly good that it makes you think right away of the juicy, ripe fruit itself. Let your next package of Jell-O prove to you the extra richness of Jell-O's locked-in flavor. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice that there's no sweet, fruity odor. No telltale aroma to warn of escaping flavor. Then dissolve the tiny Jell-O particles and notice the way Jell-O's captive goodness comes pouring out with a rush of rich, tangy fragrance and flavor. Ask your grocer tomorrow for several packages of Jell-O and see if you don't agree that Jell-O is better than ever now that Jell-O's famous flavor is locked in. <laughs> the Marines played by the orchestra. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I announced before, our program this evening comes to you from the United States Marine Corps base in San Diego. Yes, sir. The Marines who sail the seven seas on our battleships and cruisers, who pitch their tents in the blazing heat of tropical jungles or face the wintry winds of the far north. You said it. So without further ado, we bring you a man who thinks Marine is something to drop in your eyes, Jack Benny. <laughs> That's murine. I know the difference. <laughs> Anyhow, Jalo again. This is Jack Benny talking. And, Don, that was a beautiful tribute you just gave to the Marines. They're a swell bunch of fellas, and they deserve it. They certainly do. By the way, Jack, during the First World War, you were a Marine yourself, weren't you? Me? Uh, no. Uh, no, I was a... Um, a no, no. Forget it, Don. <laughs> anyway, it, um, it sure is great. Well, now, Jack, I'm sure these boys here are interested in your military record. Did you serve in the artillery? Uh, no. Uh, the infantry? With my feet? Are you kidding? <laughs> uh, forget it, Don, forget it. No, 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 I'd like to find out. Which branch of the service were you in? Uh, well, um, well, uh, come here, Don, I'll whisper it to you. Don, I enlisted in the... For three years. Oh, you were a sailor! Quiet! <laughs> 
for heaven's sake, I want to be friends with these boys. <laughs> God. Oh, now there's no need of getting upset, Jack. Nowadays, sailors and Marines are the best of friends. Why, they're pals. Pals, eh? Well, years ago, when I was in the service, they weren't quite so chummy. I'll, uh, I'll never forget one time when I was at the Great Lakes Naval Training Station. <laughs> you know, I was in love with a girl, and so was this Marine, about six foot two. Your girl? No, the Marine. <laughs> My girl was only six foot. <laughs> uh, that is, in her bare feet. <laughs> well, anyway... Oh, uh, didn't she wear shoes? No, no, this was in the summertime. <laughs> uh, well, anyway... Uh, we both came up to this girl's front door one night, and the Marine said to me, uh, uh, where do you think you're going, tight pants? <laughs> so I, um, I said, I'm going to see Eva. Uh, that was the girl's name, Eva Slatko. <laughs> so this, uh... Uh, this Marine said to me, oh, you are, eh? And I said, yeah, you want to make something out of it? And what happened? Um, what was that? What happened? <laughs> oh, the next morning I had three teeth put back in and I haven't seen the guy since. <laughs> I'm sorry, Don, I missed my place there for a minute. I'm... But as you say, Don, there's no reason why sailors and leathernecks shouldn't get along together. They're all fighting for the same cause. And after all... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hi, boys. Well, Mary, here we are in San Diego. Yeah. And let me tell you something. The next time I come down here, it won't be in that Maxwell of yours. What a trip. What's the matter with you? I'm so black and blue, you think I went dancing at the Paris Inn last night. <laughs> Paris Inn? Oh, uh, a dining and dancing spot, eh? Dining, dancing, and wrestling. <laughs> well, I... I, uh, I must go over there later. So you had a pretty tough ride in the Maxwell, huh, Mary? Uh, Don, it, wouldn't, uh, it would have been a very pleasant trip if we hadn't had that blowout at San Clemente. The blowout was at Laguna Beach. We came down in San Clemente. <laughs> All right, for 10 minutes, we were unidentified aircraft. <laughs> all, we, all we had was a blowout. And that silly experiment of yours, that's what held us up. Mary, that experiment may not have worked, but it's ideas like that that the government wants nowadays. What was it, Mary? Oh. Well, Jack didn't have a spare, so he bought a thousand packages of gum and told Rochester to chew them into a tire. <laughs> Listen, if it had worked, I'd be famous. Well, look who's here. Goldilocks and his three curls. Hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Here I am, men. Tear down the roof. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Now I'm happy. Then stop. Then stop bowing. Well, I'm thrilled, Jackson. It's sure great to be down here entertaining all these leatherheads. <laughs> They're leather necks. You're the leatherhead. <laughs> However, I must say, uh, see, I can't understand how I made that mistake before. However, I must say you got here on time for a change. Did you just blow into town, Phil? No, we got in last night, and then Frankie, my guitar player, and me went down to Tijuana. Tijuana, eh? You know, on a Goodwill tour. <laughs> I'll bet. Uh, may I inquire what you boys were drinking? A little Mexican buttermilk. Tequila, they call it. <laughs> tequila? Say, I hear that's pretty strong stuff. You ought to try it sometime, Jackson. First you swallow a glass of it, and then you chew on a lemon. <laughs> I see. And after the fourth drink, if you ain't got a lemon, just chew your glass. It don't make no difference. <laughs> Well, that, uh, that stuff must pack a wallop. Yeah, and on our way home, we were hit by lightning and we bent it. <laughs> oh, stop dreaming it up. Well, Phil, now that we've heard about your adventures in Tijuana, how about playing a band number for the boys? Okay, Jackson. And play something nice, will you? 
Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I was wondering, would you like to join the Marines? Yes, I would. Well, join us. We're going to the Paris Inn tonight. <laughs> Get out of here! <laughs> Silly guy. Gee, I wish I could join the Marines, though. They're a red-blooded organization. They wouldn't give you any whether you join or not. <laughs> I don't want any. Play, Phil. I can't understand how I made a mistake on that first spot. I don't know what happened to my script, you know? Really, it was amazing. understand how I made that mistake. Oh, well. <laughs> that was, uh, that was, he's 1A in the Army and A1 in my heart, played by Phil Harris and his internationally famous orchestra. Internationally famous meaning they're as well known in Tijuana as they are in San Diego. <laughs> and, um, and now, ladies and gentlemen. Tijuana, they love me there. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? You can't insult the guy. <laughs> How I made that mistake. And now, and now, ladies and gentlemen... Hey, Jack, can I read my poem now? Mary, I told you that you can't do any more of your silly poem. Oh, Mr. Benny, here I am. Oh, hello, Dennis. Curtsy. <laughs> well, our little gang is all assembled. Hey, is Joan Bennett here yet? Quiet. That's our surprise. Hmm, what a kid. Well, Dennis, are you enjoying yourself here in San Diego? I sure am. I went to Balboa Park this morning, and what a zoo they got there. What a zoo! You had fun, eh? Yeah, and you know what, Mr. Benny? What? I saw a baboon there that looked exactly like Fred Allen. Like... <laughs> like... Like Fred Allen, eh? <laughs> That's a good one. He has got long arms, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the baboon doing, Dennis? He was picking fleas off another one that resembled you somewhat. <laughs> mm. What do you mean? Uh, here's a peanut, Jack. Catch. Thanks. Now cut that out. <laughs> Say, I must go over and take a look at that baboon that looks like me. I've never seen one with big blue eyes. <laughs> Must be quite a novelty. What else you see there, Dennis? Well, I saw lions and tigers and elephants, and then I saw a great big dinosaur. Dennis, that's impossible. You couldn't have seen a dinosaur. Of course not. She's in New York with Eddie Cantor. That's dinosaur! <laughs> Phil, Phil, that, you're thinking of dinosaur. Can I read my poem now? Not now, Mary. I'm leading up to something. All right, Don. Dinah Shore. Oh, Jack, this one is utterly fantastic. <laughs> Don, I won't go through this every week. Dinah Shore. But, Jack, people are beginning to talk. Everybody says, there goes that goofy Wilson. <laughs> I don't want to hear another word about it. Now, go ahead. Dinah Shore. Oh, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, the next time you have dinner, be sure to serve Jell-O for dessert. Because whether you dine at sea or dine ashore... <laughs> Wonderful. You will find that Jell-O with its new locked-in flavor is America's favorite gelatin dessert. I'm sorry, Dinah. 
Well, personally, Don, I thought it was very, very clever. Too very, Jeff. It's worth it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Day, our tenor, will Wait sing... a minute. I'm going to read my poem to these boys. Oh, my goodness. Well, they can take it. That's one thing. What's the title of your poem, Mary? Uh, tell it to the Marines, but don't get tough about it. <laughs> Say, you've got something there. Proceed. <clears throat> I salute all you Marines, old and young and in between. And I really think you're tops. You're just the guys to stop the jobs. Jobs? Right. Jobs, you mean Japs. Japs, Jobs. Knock the sukiyaki out of them. <laughs> right, uh, continue. You fellas fight on land or sea, in the air, up a tree. They can fight anywhere. And when you boys get liberty, you slug it out over girls like me. <laughs> well, that, that keeps them in condition, I suppose. Uh, go ahead. I've gone with boys from Georgia Tech and Yale and Harvard by the peck. But here's one thing I'll say by heck, I'd rather neck a leather neck. Yes. <laughs> Very good, Mary. You know, Mary, Mary, I'm... Uh... Gee, they're wonderful here, aren't they? <laughs> you know, Mary, I'm sorry I tried to keep you from reading that poem because this one was really okay. It really was. Come in. Well, who's this? It's a Marine. I know it's a Marine, but who? Uh, hello there. Hello, tight pants. I'm glad to see you again. <laughs> Glad, glad to see you again. Well, who is it, Jack? I don't know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Glad to see you. What do you have in the old gang? Oh, you know, same old gang, like you said. You know how it is. <laughs> well, who is he? I'm trying to find out. What, uh, what are you doing here? I'm still in the service. By the way, I see you got those three teeth put back in. <laughs> Three, three teeth. Oh, hey, wait a minute. You're, you're... Remember Eva Slutko? <laughs> yeah, that's it. You're Bullface Hurley. Say, do you ever see Eva anymore? How can I help it? We married and got four kids. <laughs> four kids. Well, what do you know? Well, sit down. We'll talk things over. Go ahead with your song, Dennis. Okay. Say, Bullface, remember the time I caught you and Eva dancing at the Y and I socked you right in the jaw? You hit Eva. I did. <laughs> I was running so fast, I didn't look back. But I... There's no mountain top so high that somehow love can climb. No, no, true love will find no way. There's no river quite so wide that love can cross in time. Please believe me when. are always in my heart, even though you're far away, I can hear the music of the song of love I sang with you, you are always in my heart, and when skies above are gray, I remember that you care, and then and there the sun breaks through. Just before I go to sleep, there's a rendezvous I keep, and the dream I always meet helps me forget where far apart. I don't know exactly when, dear. But I'm sure we'll meet again, dear. And my darling, till we do, you are always in my heart. 
just before I go to sleep, there's a rendezvous I keep, and the dream I always meet helps me forget where far apart. I don't know exactly when, but I'm sure we'll meet My darling, till we do, you are always in my heart. Well, 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 that sure is good news, Bullface. So you named one of your boys after me, eh? Yeah. Yeah, he was kind of a puny kid. <laughs> oh, uh -huh. well, it's good seeing you again, Bull. Say hello to Eva for me. I will. So long, tight pants. <laughs> so long. So they finally got married. Gee, Eva was a cute gal. I wonder if she ever got shoes. <laughs> I suppose so. Anyway, that was always in my heart, sung by Dennis Day. And dedicated to Miss Joan Bennett. Where is she? Well, she ought to be here any minute, Dennis. Well, I hope so. A man can stand just so much, you know. <laughs> what? What are you talking about? Well, Miss Bennett and I got to be pretty good friends on the way down here. Pretty good friends! <laughs> Dennis, the only reason Miss Bennett sat on your lap is because the car was crowded. Say, I wonder what is keeping Joan. I doubt if she shows up at all after that trip in the Maxwell. She'll be here, don't worry. Imagine asking Joan Bennett to ride down here in that broken-down jalopy. She's a big movie star. Well, what am I, a manhole cover? <laughs> huh? You've got about as much hair as one. All right, I'm a manhole cover. And remember that on payday, because I won't be able to sign your check. You keep that up, Miss Livingston. Well, here she is, fellas. Come on in, Joan. We've been waiting for you. Hello, Jack. Hello, everybody. There, you see, Mary? She's here, and she looks wonderful. Well, Joan, I was a little worried about you. Uh, how do you feel after your ride down here in my Maxwell? How do I feel? Now I know what a mold of milk goes through. <laughs> well, you see, you're a little light, Joan. I'll tell you what. On the way back, I'll let Dennis sit on your lap. Put Don Wilson there. That'll do the trick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything you want, Joan. Oh, boy, ain't she a dish. Dennis! <laughs> Dennis, behave yourself. Leave him alone, Jack. You were young once yourself. And I still am, Joni. I still am. He takes a little vitamin B and he wants to skip rope. <laughs> oh, sure. Say, uh, Joan, uh, you remember Phil Harris, don't you? Why, certainly. Hello, Phil. Hello, Joan. Ever hear Alice face? She's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what a guy. Well, Joan, this is certainly, this is certainly like old times, isn't it? You and I working together again. Yes, Jack, it's been over three years now. Remember that picture we made called Artists and Models Abroad? Do I? I'll never forget it. And Joan, I've got a confession to make. Now, you didn't know it at the time, but you were the first leading lady I ever kissed. What do you mean I didn't know it? <laughs> Uh, what? You should have seen him, Mary. He was so nervous he missed my upper lip entirely. Well, I did pretty good considering I had my eyes closed. That would never happen with me, sister. Dennis, pipe down. <laughs> Say, Joan, I've been wondering. I've thought of this often. Why is it you and I have never made another picture together? Jack, you asked me that a dozen times on the way down here, and I told you. But, Joan, I don't eat salami anymore. <laughs> Honest, I don't. Well, I'm glad of that. And I'll say one thing for you, Jack. Your acting has improved. Well, I hit both lips now, if that's... <laughs> if that's what you mean, yes, ma'am. Not only that, but I saw your picture the other night, and I just couldn't believe that Jack Benny was playing Hamlet. That was me, all right. <clears throat> to be or not to be. That 
is the question. Someone give him the answer. He does this every five minutes. <laughs> Mary. So you like me as Hamlet, eh, Joan? I certainly did. And what amazed me, Jack, is the way you looked in tight. Your legs were simply gorgeous. Oh, you're just saying that. <laughs> Heavens to Betsy. <laughs> My, my legs, gorgeous. They really are. Why, everybody in Hollywood is saying they're even prettier than Betty Grable. Prettier than Betty? Oh, so that's why she's been snubbing me lately. <laughs> now I get a jealousy. Well, Joan, getting back to me. Excuse me a minute. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. <laughs> Oh, hello, Rochester. Pardon me, Joan. I'll be with you in a minute. Hello, Rochester. What do you want? I got the Maxwell all gassed up and everything. What time tomorrow morning are we going to take off? Well, we're leaving the hotel at 7 a.m. sharp. But, boss, I won't be getting in till half past eight. <laughs> getting in? Now, wait a minute, Rochester. I let you go to a party last night. You don't have to go to another party tonight. Oh, well, this is the same one. <laughs> Same one. Only we're switching from gin to Mexican buttermilk. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, you know, they got a regular little Harlem down here. I don't care. We're leaving tomorrow morning promptly at 7. I don't want to hear another word about it. But, Mr. Benny. I'm asking him now, honey. But, but, Mr. Benny. Just a second, Rochester. Who did you just say honey to? Me? Yes, you. Who is Honey. He's a cousin of mine, boss. Honeydew Van Jones. What? Junior. Rochester, you're not telling me the truth. You're at a party and you were talking to a girl. And if I don't stop talking to you, I'm a loser. The wolves are closing in. <laughs> Rochester, sometimes I can't understand you. You've got a girl in Los Angeles, haven't you? Uh-huh. For two years now, you've been going steady together. Uh-huh. Well, then let me ask you something. Did you ever hear of Fidelity? Oh, yeah, that's an insurance company, ain't it? I don't mean that. I mean you should be true to one girl. Oh, boss, reconsider. Well, I'm not going to argue any more about it. I want you to be at the El Cortez Hotel at 7 a.m. So long. So long. Well, I tried, honey. I have more trouble with that guy. Always wants his own way. Pardon me, Jack. Yes, Joan. Did I understand you to say that you're driving back tomorrow at 7 a.m.? Yes, I'll uh, have to pick you up bright and early. Well, bring along a first aid kit. I might snap at you. <laughs> good, good. And, Joan, I do want to thank you for coming down here and helping entertain these Marines. I love doing it. And, incidentally, our program is being sent every week by delayed shortwave to our armed forces everywhere. It is? Well then, Jack, if I promise to ride back with you and your Maxwell, will you do me a favor? Why, certainly. What is it? May I say hello to General MacArthur and his men? Of course. Hello, General. Keep up the good work. But who has to tell you? You said it. Play, Phil. Make dinner tomorrow night something really out of the ordinary by serving the family this swell jello treat. It's cardinal pear mold, rich, juicy pears embedded in a shimmering mold of bright red raspberry jello. Nothing could be more tempting to the eye or more delightful to the taste than this grand jello dessert. And nothing could be easier to make. Now here's all you do. Simply dissolve one package of jello imitation raspberry flavor in a pint of hot water. Add one eighth teaspoon of powdered ginger. Turn into mold. Chill until firm. Unmold and garnish with sections of canned pears. You'll say that it's one of the most delicious mouth-watering desserts that ever came your way. A dessert that you'll love from the first spoonful to the last. So tomorrow, when you make up this tempting combination of juicy canned pears and beautiful red raspberry jello, remember, jello today is extra rich thanks to the jello's new locked in flavor. Thanks again, Joan Bennett, and good night, folks. <laughs> program is written by Bill Maher and Ed Beline. The fact that this show was broadcast in the Marine base did not constitute an endorsement of the product advertised by the War Department. Rochester, I'm sure that golf ball sliced over here to the right. No, no, it's not here. Boss, why don't you give up? We've been looking for that ball all week. 
We'll find it. Don't be so impatient. Now, let's see. When I hit it, I know it went over here by these hey, trees. Hey, Jack, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. Hurry up. We've got to get to the studio. It's Sunday again. Oh, my goodness, how time does fly. Come on, Rochester. We better get going. Come on. J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with Deep in the Heart of Encino. <laughs> flavor, flavor, and still more flavor. That's what you get in Jell-O, ladies and gentlemen, thanks to Jell-O's marvelous new process that locks in its delightful goodness. The tang of Jell-O, its swell, intriguing taste, are there for you to enjoy as never before. For today, Jell-O offers you a new high in flavor, a new peak in pleasure. You find that Jell-O is more than ever a glorious dessert, a grand treat that everybody loves. A clear, colorful mold of Jell-O. What an attractive sight it is, and how it glistens with goodness. And never have you tasted anything better than the lively, refreshing flavor of Jell-O. Flavor that makes you think of the juicy, ripe fruit itself. Flavor that is locked in for your added enjoyment. Prove to yourself how much richer Jell-O's locked-in flavor really is. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice that there's no telltale aroma. No sign of escaping fragrance and flavor. Then dissolve the tiny Jell-O particles and notice how Jell-O's captive goodness comes pouring out in a rush of richness. Get Jell-O tomorrow and thrill at the extra delight of Jell-O's locked-in flavor. For you, I'll pine at Sunset and Vine, played by the orchestra. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, as we announced last week, we're going to present our, for your entertainment, Doc Benny and his world-renowned minstrel show. That's right, so let's get going. Uh, is everybody here? I think so. Say, Mary, where's Dennis? Dennis? I don't know. I haven't seen him. He must be around here someplace. <laughs> That's you, you dodo. <laughs> Come here, Dennis. We've got a minstrel show to do. I see you've got burnt cork on your face. Where were you? I was over in the corner practicing how to talk like Amos and Andy. Good. Good nothing. It comes out like Lum and Abner. <laughs> oh. Wonderful world. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. You'll get rolling. Now, Mary, Mary, we have to do this right. So straighten things out and put the chairs in a semicircle. What's a semicircle? Look, put the chairs in a circle and then take half of them away. <laughs> now, Phil, uh, we want some real old-time minstrel music tonight. You know, a lot of loud, corny brass. Uh, do you think your band can do it? Well, it ain't our style, but we can try. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> now, let's see. Uh, where's Virgil? We got to have our props. Is the sound man here? No, I'm in a Turkish bath. Want me to steam some clams for you? <laughs> now, Virgil, Virgil, you don't have to get cute about it. We're doing a minstrel show tonight, so pass out the tambourine. I passed them out already. You did? Yeah, and they're swell, nice and juicy. <laughs> Those are tangerines. Now, Virgil, Virgil, there's a whole pile of tambourines right there on your table. Now, pass them out. Okay, here they are. You didn't have to throw them on the floor. Uh, he's mad because you won't let him be an end man in your minstrel show. That's too bad about him. Well, I guess we're all set, so let's get started. Come on, Don, give us an introduction. Okay. And now gentlemen, here they are, Doc Benny and his world-renowned minstrels, including the incomparable Mary Sweet Stuff Livingston. Yahoo! Mary. <laughs> that sentimental gentleman from Georgia, Phil Honeyboy Harris. Take it easy, gals. I'll get to you. <laughs> hmm. Also our own silver voice tenor, Dennis Sugarfoot Day. Awa, awa, awa. <laughs> 
Very good, Dennis. And last but not least, that ton of fun, yours truly, Don Blubberlip Wilson. <laughs> yes, sir. The time was a bright summer afternoon many years ago. The place, Main Street of St. Joe, Missouri. They love me there. Take it away. All right, everybody. You'll have to clear the streets. The parades are coming. Keep your little boy up in the sidewalk, Mrs. Farrell. Come here, Charles. Stay right close to your mother. Oh, I want to see a parade. <laughs> I see you got some new traveling salesmen sitting on the porch of the mansion house. They ain't you. We just dusted them all. <laughs> <laughs> well, see you at the Opry House, Constable. Follow the parade, folks. The show starts promptly at 2.30. Take you to Simpson's Opry House, where Doc Benny's minstrels are about to begin. Uh, let me see your tickets, please. Uh, B two and four. Uh, first two on the aisle. Thank you. Candy, popcorn, and sandwiches. You can't enjoy these hams without a sandwich. <laughs> sandwiches. Get your Jello here. Pop off your sandwich with a dish of tempting and appetizing Jello. Hey, Mama, I want some Jello. Well, here you are, Sonny. <laughs> Isn't he a cute youngster? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Don, don't overdo it. Uh, stop, please. Right this way. Here you are, sir. B2 on the aisle. There's someone sitting there. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, madam. You've got the wrong seat. I've got the right seat. Well, you've got it in the wrong place. <laughs> Stop, 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 please. Hey, Constable, you can't bring your horse in here. I got a ticket for him. All right, seat one, stall two. <laughs> What's he laughing at? The show hasn't started yet. Stop, stop, please. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please, for a few moments before the big show begins. Now, I have here a selection of the latest song hits of the day. Tools, they're all a whistling in the shade of the old apple tree, on a bicycle built for two, only a bird in a gilded cage, down by the old mill stream, and a zoot suit with a reed fleet. <laughs> Thank you, here you are, sir. All the latest songs, folks. Take me out to the ball game. Wait till the sun shines, Nelly. Hey, have you got that old sweetheart of mine? Yes, and you can have her back. <laughs> Anyone else have a copy of the big song for class change before the curtain goes up? Overture! Overture! The Doc Benny Minstrels! On the Mississippi, on the Mississippi, where those boats go bumping along. Choo, choo. To the Mississippi, dear old Mississippi, that's where I was born. I dream of Jeannie with a light bright. Pick them up, boys. I went up and along. Go down to the levee. I said to the levee. Join that shuffle and call. Hear that music and song. It's simply great. Make a waiting on the levee. A waiting for the robber Thank you, thank you. Gentlemen, be seated. 
Well, well, well. Tell me, Mr. Harris, how are you feeling this evening? Mr. Interlocutor, I am in the mood to mangle some merriment. Well, I must say, Mr. Harris, that you do look good. Well, boss, why shouldn't I look good? I just had myself a Kentucky breakfast. A Kentucky breakfast? What's that? A big steak, a bulldog, and a quart of whiskey. Hmm. Well, what's the uh, bulldog for? Somebody's got to eat that meat. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. It didn't impress me. Now, now, Mr. Day, you mean to say you can do better than that? Ask me what's the difference between a man with asthma, a farmer milking a cow, and an Eskimo fan dancer. <laughs> Well, uh, I don't know, Mr. Day. What is the difference between a man with asthma, a farmer milking a cow, and an Eskimo fan dancer? One is wheezing and one is squeezing. Well, what about the Eskimo fan dancer? She's freezing. Get her a blanket. <laughs> excellent, Mr. Day. Excellent. I ain't convulsed. Why, Miss Livingston? Say, Miss Interlocutor, do you mind if I ask you a riddle? No, no, Miss Livingston, go right ahead. Uh, what's the difference between you and a jackass? Hmm. I don't know. What is the difference? A jackass wears a collar. Well, so do I wear a collar. Well, then I guess there ain't no difference. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Say, Mr. Interlocutor, when it gets to me, I wish to convey that I'm mentally and physically fastidious. Well, Brother Wilson, what makes you so happy? I got a wife and a cigarette lighter, and they's both working. <laughs> very funny, Brother Wilson, very funny. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, our silver voice tenor, Dennis Sugarfoot Day, will favor us with a song and dance. That ever popular ballad, Can't You Hear Me Call in Caroline, and dedicated to Mrs. George Primrose. <laughs> I miss you in the morning when old Papa gives his call, Caroline, Caroline. I miss you at the sunset when the evening shadows fall, Caroline, Caroline. I miss you when the moon beams out on the river Oh, can't you hear me calling? Oh, you Caroline. Can't you hear me calling, Caroline? It's my heart calling, darling. Lordy, how I miss you, girl of mine. Wish that I could kiss your Caroline. Ain't no use now for the sun to shine, Caroline. Caroline, can't you hear my lips are saying? Can't you hear my soul are praying? Can't you hear me calling, Caroline? La la la! <laughs> He's dancing now, folks. <laughs> Can't you hear my lips are saying? Can't you hear my soul are praying? Can't you hear me calling, Caroline? Uh, that was very good, Mr. Day, very good. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. That was rendered with feeling, sweetness, and tenderness. I didn't like it. 
Why, Mr. Harris, I noticed that you and Mr. Day have been quarreling quite a bit of late. What have you got against him? Nothing except his dishonest, disloyal, and hand conscious. <laughs> oh, come now. That's a fine way to talk after I invited you over to my house for dinner. Who cares? Don't you remember that nice fat chicken I served you? Remember, boy, I recognized it. <laughs> Mr. Harris, that's a bold allegation. I think you should apologize. I say he should. I can't believe that Mr. Day has been stealing your chicken. Not only that, boss, he stole my wife. I didn't steal that old thing. She jumped in the bag with the rest of the hen. <laughs> Why, Mr. Day, I'm ashamed of you stealing Mr. Harris's wife and chicken. I'll bring them back. I'll bring them all back. Don't bring back nothing that ain't got feathers on it, son. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Now, you better watch your step, Mr. Day, that Mr. Harris is a bad man when he gets riled up. That don't worry me none. I'm going to walk over there and put some rat smack in the mouth. Who is? I is. How you going to get back? <laughs> Gentlemen, gentlemen, please, let this bickering cease. And now, ladies and gentlemen, yours truly, Doc Bendy, will render that renowned and melodious selection entitled Asleep in the Deep, assisted by the Alabama Four, Music Professor. <laughs> Now, lay the bell blink, 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 blink. in the old tower ring. Blink, 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 blink. Blink, blink, blink. Sing us lit blink, blink, blink. to the warning it brings. Blink, 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 blink. Sailor, take care. Sailor, take care. A danger is near thee. Uh, be aware, uh, be aware. Uh, many brave hearts are asleep in the deep. Show me where. Uh, be a uh, he, a uh, he, a uh, he. Thank you. Uh, say, Miss Interlocutor. Yes, Miss Livingston. I just thought of another riddle. Another one? Well, let's hear it. Uh, why are the Japs nervous like a man on his way to the dentist to get a tooth pulled? I don't know, Miss Livingston. Why are the Japs nervous like a man on his way to the dentist to get a tooth pulled? Because the Yanks are coming. Yahoo! <laughs> Now, that was really brilliant, Miss Livingston. Yeah, Mr. Interlocutor, what's the difference between you and a bag of wind? I don't know. What is it? Virgil, you stay out of this. <laughs> we don't want any more riddles. I'm awful sorry to hear that, Mr. Interlocutor, because I got one that's not only entertaining, but appetizing as well. Hmm. All right, blubber lips, let's have it. When you go down to your neighborhood grocer, what is the very first thing that you ask for? Credit. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Harris, please. I don't know, Mr. Wilson. What is the very first thing you ask for at your neighborhood grocer? Jello. G E L L O. A uh, blubber lips never went to school, folks. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, as a special added attraction, Doc Benny offers for your enjoyment and amusement. <laughs> Doc Benny offers for your enjoyment and amusement that well-known minstrel man, Rochester Van Jones. Yeah, Mr. Interlocutor. Uh, Mr. Van Jones will sing that ever-popular song success made famous by the late Bert Williams entitled, Somebody Else, Not Me. Great moments come to every man some situation where he can attain such fame. Folks acclaim the very mention of his name. The circus played our 
our town one day, three Bengal tigers got away. The manager looked right at me, said he, here's opportunity. Somebody's got to catch them cats. Somebody's got to go. The tiger man is sick in bed. Put on your hat and coat, he said. Now the man who catches them alive, a hero's gonna be. It's a wonderful chance for somebody. Somebody else, not me. <laughs> Two ivory bones with ebony dots. Off time to leave the cemetery lot. A game last night brought on a fight which finished up with pistol shots. I was the furthest from the door. All the others got out before. A body lay on the floor dead, and through the transom somebody said, Somebody's got to stay behind. Somebody must remain. And when the officers arrive, explain how came he ain't alive. The man who stays and sees it through gains notoriety. It was a wonderful chance for somebody Somebody else, not me. Thank you, thank you. That was Somebody Else, Not Me, rendered by Rochester Van Jones. Oh, Rochester. Yes, Mr. Van, Mr. Interlocutor. I, uh... <laughs> Um, uh, that mistake didn't either hurt or help the program, Rochester. <laughs> I noticed that in looking over your expense account for your costume and so forth, you put down a dollar and a half for makeup. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Well, that seems a little unnecessary. Would you mind explaining what you spent that money for? Well, I heard you tell everybody to buy burnt cork for their faces. Uh-huh. And then as much as I didn't need it, I bought a cork with a bottle of gin around it. <laughs> Oh, I see. Well, I, um, I have news for you, Rochester. You may collect that dollar and a half, but it'll be from somebody else, uh, uh, not me. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, every minstrel show has an afterpiece, and ours will be no exception. So tonight, we are going to offer Doc Benny's version of the greatest love story of all time, Romeo and Juliet. The scene is a balcony of the home of Miss Juliet Johnson on Beale Street in Memphis, Tennessee. Curtain music. <laughs> Climb down this ladder. You know, we're going to lope tonight. I can't see you down there. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore is you, Romeo? Here I is, gal. Right below yon balcony. Well, get thee on that ladder, son. For Sue's, honey. I'll be there for Sue's. Yuckum! I'll be right up, sugar. Just a minute, Rummy. Get thee down from that ladder. <laughs> Hush up, son. I'm ascending to my lady friend, Juliet. Ah, uh, then move over because I am the local and this is the express coming through. <laughs> I don't know what you did with that gag. You see? <laughs> I, I, I know you can't be the local and the express. <laughs> I must be the local. Now, wait a minute. I mean, either you is the local or the express. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Who, uh, who is you, anyway? Here's my card. Hmm. Julius Mushmouth Caesar and his orchestra. Mushmouth. Appearing nightly at ye Biltmore Arena. That's me. <laughs> now, listen here, Mushmouth. You ain't got no business around here. Get off this ladder. Don't mess around with me, Romeo. Remember, flowers don't care who they lays on. <laughs> 
Uh, I understand. Uh, 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 Pat's friend. Gazooks. Hmm. Who that? Who that coming up the ladder, Romeo? Somebody else, not me. Now listen, Romeo, is you coming up here or is you ain't? Be patient, woman. Keep thy cloak on. Yuck! <laughs> oh, but sure, that's me. Hey, you, get off that ladder. What, another one? You hear me? Juliet is my gal. Oh, no, she ain't, son. She's my gal. So you better hide thee away, Nave. Or I'm gonna take my razor and you're gonna be grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> Understand? You make one pass of me and you're gonna be playing Love and Bloom on a harp. <laughs> well, in that case, uh, 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 pass, friend. <laughs> Egad. Hey, Romeo, Romeo, what is it pain and thou? I'm caught in traffic, honey. <laughs> well, here I come, Julie. Here I come. I'll be right with you, Julie. Oh, pardon me, brother, but you're standing directly in my path. Now, who that? Who that? Who is you? Othello. Othello who? Othello Jello. <laughs> oh, then you is the Merchant of Venice. Past friend, unhindered. Mm -mm. Look at that ladder, Ben. <laughs> hey, Julie, can it be that you is unfaithful? I ain't unfaithful, honey. I'm going to lope tonight. With me or not with me? That am the question. All these men climbing that ladder. I was regusted. Now, don't be jealous, honey. I'm just raffling off a of Plymouth up here. A Plymouth? Oh, that's right. Where did I put my ticket? Oh, here it is. Here it is. The lucky number, am 987X42. That's me. That's my number. I got it. Here I come, Julie. Here I come. A rhapsodize, Phil. Rhapsodize. <laughs> Here's a dessert, friends, that will make a big hit with everyone because it's so good-looking and so downright delicious. It's jellied plums, a swell, attractive treat that combines luscious plums and rich emerald lime jello. Yes, here's a dessert that is really a masterpiece, a dessert that your family will get mighty excited about because it's so gay and inviting and so thrillingly good. Jellied plums is truly a treat of treats and easy to make. Simply dissolve one package of lime jello in a pint of hot water and chill until slightly thickened. Next, fold in one cup of canned plums. Then mold and serve plain or with whipped cream. And you'll say you've never tasted anything that was more delightful, never laid eyes on a dessert that looked more enticing. Make up this grand treat. Tomorrow, get a package of lime jello. But be sure it's genuine jello. Because Jell-O's new locked-in flavor is extra rich. This is the last number of the 26th program in the current Jell-O series. And we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Jack had to run away and do a show for the Motion Picture Relief Fund. Good night, folks. J-E-L-L-O The Jell-O program is written by Bill Meyer and Ed Beloyan and is broadcast each week by shortwave to our armed forces throughout the world. Brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Puddings, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with the Gay Ranchero. <laughs> to buy Jell-O, ladies and gentlemen, is to get several packages at a time and use them as you want them. And with the new Jell-O, you can do this without any fear that your supply of Jell-O will lose flavor and freshness as it stands on the pantry shelf. 
You can now buy a dozen packages of Jell-O at one time and know that they will all stay at the peak of their goodness until you want them. Because today, Jell-O's flavor is locked in. Locked into the Jell-O particles by an exclusive Jell-O process. The tiny Jell-O particles deliver their full strength flavor to you intact. Now prove it for yourself. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice that there's no telltale aroma, no sign of escaping fragrance and flavor. But the instant you dissolve the Jell-O, you unlock its captive flavor, and out it pours in all its original richness. Tomorrow when you order Jell-O, order several packages. Get all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors, and always have a full assortment on hand from which to choose. You can keep Jell-O as long as you please. The flavor doesn't go away. We put it in, and it's there to stay. The Gay Ranchero, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great honor to bring you a man who last Sunday on this program gave you what was undoubtedly the finest performance of his acting career. That's right, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So without further ado, I give you the only actor in America who can make Jekyll and Hyde sound like Brenda and Cobina, Jack Benny. <laughs> Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, that may be your idea of a funny introduction, but to ridicule my performance of last Sunday, which everyone hailed as a dramatic nugget, <laughs> that really burns me up. Now, take it easy, Jack. I thought you played the part well enough, but I happened to see the picture, and I didn't think you were as good as Spencer Tracy. Oh, you didn't? No. Well, Don, let me ask you something. Uh, who signs your check every week? Spencer Tracy or the Benny Goose that lays the golden egg hunt? <laughs> Take that as my thought for today. But, Jack, you don't seem to understand. Oh, no. When Spencer Tracy played the part, there was a decided difference between both characters. But when you did it, I couldn't tell your Jekyll from your Hyde. <laughs> well, you can't tell your stomach from an igloo. <laughs> So what do you know about it? A fine pal you turned out to be. Not Jack. And don't call me Jack. From now on, you will please address me as Mr. Benny, and I'll call you Mr. Wilson. Is that clear? Oh, I think you're being very childish about the whole matter. Absolutely childish. Don't try to bring my age down. Flattery won't help. <laughs> Remember that, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson? Who's Mr. Wilson? That hulk over yonder. <laughs> Listen, Mary, you witnessed my performance last week. What did you think of it? Well, personally, I thought you were very good as Georgie Jessel. <laughs> I wasn't Jessel. I was Jekyll. Dr. Jekyll. Well, in that case, Fooey. <laughs> Fooey? What do you mean, Fooey? I don't get it. All right. Take the word lovely and fool around with us. Let's see. Lovely. Lively. Low. Low. Mr. Benny to you. <laughs> and let me remind you and Mr. Wilson of something that you both may have forgotten. When I switched from Dr. Jekyll to that horrible Mr. Hyde and that gruesome look came over my face, women in the audience screamed. One of them even fainted. Well, it won't happen today. They caught that mouse. <laughs> All right. Well, then I guess I can take these bicycle clips off my pants. <laughs> As long as you and Don are in such a critical mood, I'd like to point out that Christmas is only 18 days away. Why else did you come in mad at everybody? All right, keep it up, keep it up. You know, I already bought your Christmas present, young lady, but I may exchange it for something cheaper. Something cheaper? Yes. They don't dig a bargain basement that deep. <laughs> well, you worked in more of them than I did. <laughs> I can go along with a... Ouch! You do that once more, Miss Livingston, and there'll be a... 
Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Gee, was that a performance you gave last week? Was that a performance? <laughs> well, thanks, Dennis. I'm glad you liked it. Not only me, my whole family thought you were wonderful. That's nice. I'm glad someone appreciated me. Listen, Jack, the trouble with you is the minute you do something halfway good, it goes right to your head. Mr. Benny was wonderful. Quiet. Uh -huh. Why, to hear you talk, Jack, anyone would think you were the biggest ham in Hollywood. Oh. I'd like to see a bigger one, by golly. <laughs> hmm. Well, thanks, Dennis. You tried. <laughs> anyway, you thought I was good. Oh, marvelous. What a performance. <laughs> Well, look, uh, look, kid, I'm making out my Christmas list today, so before singing your song, how about throwing out a few hints? Uh, what would you like Uncle Jack to get you? Well, I thought of a few things, but they're pretty expensive. Just name them. You're one person in this cast that deserves the best. Wait till I get my pencil here. Now, what do you want, Dennis? Well, I'd like to have a nice gray suit with a pinstripe. Okay. One gray suit with pinstripe. Anything else? Well, I'd love to have a grand piano to practice my songs on. Okay. One grand piano. Are you sure you got lead in that pencil, Mr. Benny? <laughs> yes, yes. Now, uh, what else do you want, Dennis? Well, I've always wanted one of those toy birds on a stick. And when you swing it around your head, the bird goes... Hmm. Okay. One bird on stick. Now, what else do you want? Oh, stop, will you? You're just trying to make Don and me jealous. Dennis isn't going to get all that stuff. Well, he's getting something he wants. Gee, I wonder what it is. I'll give you a hint, kid. <laughs> Don't spoil the surprise, for heaven's sake. Now, go ahead with your song, Dennis. Okay. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I want to congratulate you on your performance as Mr. Hyde last week. I was so frightened, my hair stood on end. <laughs> uh, your hair? Uh, what hair? Right there. Stand up, Herman. <laughs> oh, get out of here. Herman. Well, I suppose if you only got one hair, you might as well have a name for it. Sing, Dennis. Special announcement. The entire regular personnel of the sheriff's and police office has been placed on a two-platoon basis with 12-hour shift. All auxiliary personnel has been directed to stand by for emergency service instructions. 
The regular county defense program is functioning in an orderly manner, and citizens are urged to remain calm and avoid all unnecessary confusion because of hysteria. Citizen volunteers are asked to go quietly to their nearest police or fire stations and offer their services if they wish to help. There is no immediate cause for alarm, and coolness will accomplish more than anything else. a medley of everything I love and all the things you are sung by Dennis Day. Very good, Dennis, but what's the idea of singing two songs today, huh? Well, Mr. Benny, I've got two girls, and I thought I'd dedicate a number to each of them. Two girls? Well, that's modern youth for you. You know, Dennis, when I was your age, uh, I was satisfied with only one girl, Gussie Bagelquist. Ah, <laughs> uh, Gussie was a dream, yeah. Is that the girl you sued because she cut you with her buck teeth? I never sued her. I just told her to get a brace on. <laughs> anyway, I was talking to Dennis. Whatever happened to your girl, Mr. Benny? Uh, Gussie? Oh, I went into vaudeville and she went away to veterinary college. <laughs> we sort of drifted apart. She's one of the biggest horse doctors in northern Illinois now. Uh, doing uh, very well, too. Do you keep in touch with her, Mr. Benny? Do you ever write to her? Oh, once in a while when he has a cold or something. <laughs> yeah, I had a touch of the flu a couple of weeks ago, and she sent me some pills that were as big as baseballs and some liniment to rub on my withers. <laughs> One thing about Gussie, though, I never get a bill from her. That's some... Well, hmm... Look who's here. Hiya, Jackson. How's my pal? Don't Jackson or pal me, Mr. Harris. Let me ask you something. Did you or did you not go into the Brown Derby after last Sunday's show and tell people that my acting was putrid? Last Sunday? Maybe I did. I'd say that lots of times. <laughs> well, you did. You told everybody at your table that I was very bad as Jekyll and Hyde. How do you know? Because I've got a waiter there that spies for me. Naturally, you couldn't tip a waiter just for waiting on you. Mary, that's a little arrangement between Andre and me. Yeah, I should have known that waiter was a spy. His mustache fell in my suit. <laughs> he wearing a false mustache? I told him not to overdo it. Anyway, Phil, you did run down my performance. Yeah, but I changed my mind about that. You know, I met one of the greatest dramatic actors in this town last night, and he said you were great. Orson thought you were terrific. Who, Orson Welles? No, Orson Buggy. <laughs> That settles it. <laughs> if I don't get Glenn Miller in my stocking Christmas morning, I'll never write another letter to Santa. And incidentally, Mr. Harris, you better have a good excuse for coming in late today. Well, I'm sorry, Jackson, but I was out shopping. Say, Mary, you know what I'm getting, Alice, for Christmas this year? No, what? A roaster. A roaster, say. You know, for the oven. <laughs> That's a roaster. Buys his wife a roaster for Christmas and calls it a roadster. All right, I'll put wheels on it. <laughs> hmm. That's a sharpie, eh, Jackson? It's a sharpie, eh, Jackson? Sharpie, sharpie, sharpie. And don't call me Jackson. I'm Mr. Benny to you and to everybody else on this program except Dennis. You mean I can call you Jack? Yes, until I make up with the others. <laughs> What burns me up, I worked my head off on that play last week and did a swell job. You sure did, Jack. And this little episode just shows me who my friends are. That's telling them, Jack. <laughs> After all, I had to follow a pretty good actor in that part, Spencer Tracy. Why, I would never have even tried it if we both hadn't won the Academy Award. Wait a minute. When did you ever win the Academy Award? And another thing. I said, when did you ever win the Academy Award? Hmm. And another thing... Answer my question. When did you win the Academy Award? I wish I had, brother. Would I have you in a spot? <laughs> ha, 
<laughs> I guess that takes care of you. You said it, Jackie. <laughs> Look, Dennis, just Jack, not Jackie. <laughs> Give him a minute, she wants to take a whole foot. <laughs> what a gang. I got a good mind to go home. Oh, for goodness sake, Jack, will you stop acting like a baby? You ought to know the whole thing was a rib. Oh, sure. As a matter of fact, I liked your performance in Jekyll and Hyde so much that I wrote a sequel to it. Well, ain't you the fat little Noel Coward? <laughs> Who cares what you wrote? And Jack, Jack, now get this. As a favor to me, I want you to play the leading part in this drama. <laughs> I'll tell him when he comes in. You can keep your old sequel. But you've got to help me out, Jack. There's no one else in the cast with sufficient dramatic ability to handle it. Look, I'm not going to... Dramatic, eh? Well... <laughs> Well, all right, Don, I'll do it. I thought you were mad at him. Never mind. You'd go over Niagara Falls in a Dixie cup if someone told you it was dramatic. <laughs> What's dramatic about a Dixie cup? Don, you say you've written a sequel to Jekyll and Hyde? Yes, Jack, but my play is called Mr. Hyde and Dr. Jekyll. Oh. Oh, well, that sounds interesting. Here's the script. Thanks. Just a second, Don, I'll give you a build-up. Chord, please. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Don Wilson, that eminent American author, has written another of his famous one-act plays. Take it, Don. The scene is the residence of Mr. and Mrs. Homer D. Hyde in the thriving little town of Upper Plate, Indiana. It is 7.30 p.m. Curtain. Music. <laughs> Dear, it's 7.30 and Homer isn't home yet. I wonder if his horse and buggy broke down. <laughs> Gee, I hope it's one of his moods. Ah, here he comes now. <laughs> Good evening, Homer, dear. You're a little late, aren't you? All right, I'm late. And I'll be late any time I feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you going to kiss me, darling? Kiss me, kiss me. Every night a kiss. I'll kiss you with this umbrella. Ouch! <laughs> I'm going to bed. Good night. But, Homer, you haven't even said hello to the twins, Otto and Blotto. <laughs> Say hello to Daddy, children. Hello, Daddy. Hello, Daddy. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> also, I want to keep out of you kids and I'll kick your teeth out as soon as they grow in. <laughs> I'm going to bed now. But, Homer, darling, you haven't had your dinner yet. Dinner, dinner, every night dinner. I don't want any dinner. But, Homer, dear, at least have some dessert. What kind of dessert? I won't tell you, but I'm sure you like it. Here, have a dish. Very well. I'll try it. But if I eat it and decide I don't like it, someone will be dead. Murder. Murder. <laughs> He's eating the dessert. I do hope he likes it. If not, what will happen to me and Otto and Blotto? <sighs> Gee. Oh, boy. Homer! Homer, speak to me! Speak to me! Oh, my darling. That tasted so good. What is the name of that tempting and economical dessert with a new locked-in process? Hmm? <laughs> Dear, and it comes in six delicious flavors. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and wine. <laughs> My sons, at last I love you. Congratulations, you wrote a wonderful play. But, Jack, without you, it would have been impossible. 
You were even better than last week. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Well, how about a band number, Phil? Oh, Tay Dowdy. <laughs> Hold it. Come in. Well, Mr. Benny, you did it again. Were you scared? Look at Herman. He just won't go down. <laughs> What a head he's got. That's the only persimmon I ever saw with brown eyes. Play, Phil. Another war bulletin. Shanghai. The Japanese took over the American Shanghai Power and Light Company this morning. A bulletin from New York. The Japanese news agency broadcast tonight the Japanese foreign minister, Shinginori Togo, summoned U.S. Ambassador Joseph C. Gru and handed to him Japan's reply to Secretary of State Cordell Hull's terms for peace in the Pacific. This news came hours after the bombing of Honolulu. We return you now to Hollywood. Mango from Weekend in Havana, played by Blotto Harris, and that goes for the whole orchestra. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce that next week is a special attraction. Gee, Mr. Benny, I can't get over the way you played Mr. Hyde just now. Was that a performance? <laughs> it thrilled you, eh, Dennis? I'll say. That crazy laugh just sent shivers right through me. Well. The kid's right, Jackson. How'd you ever learn to do that? Well, Phil, you just have to get into a, the mood and feel it. You have to imagine that you're a raving maniac. When was the first time you ever did that crazy laugh, Jack? Last year at Tananiti, lost three races in a row. <laughs> Never mind. When they caught him, he was chewing down the grandstand like a beaver. <laughs> well, you'd be mad, too. So let's forget it. Now, as I started to announce, ladies and gentlemen, next week is a special attraction. You know, Mr. Benny, I'd like to learn how to do that laugh so I can scare my girlfriend. Oh, it's easy, Dennis. Yeah, I wish you'd show me how to do it, Mr. Benny. Oh, I don't Come care. on, Jackson, do that laugh for us again. Well, look, Dennis, here's the way you do it. You've got to screw up your face and get it all distorted. Then you rip open your tie and shirt. Well, don't you have to muss up your hair a little? My hair? You know, those three Hermans. <laughs> That's not important. Anyway, Dennis, once you're in this mood, you read a menacing line and then laugh. Now, get this. I'm going out for a walk now. A nice long walk. And when I come back, someone will be dead. Murdered. Murdered. <laughs> Ooh. What's the matter, Jack? My jaw. My jaw first out of place. Look at her. His what? His jaw. His jaw slipped out of place. Get a doctor. Get a doctor. Hurry up. What a performance! Don't call my room and let me call my doctor. Dusty Bagelquist, Waukegan, 8362. Not her, just hold on the phone. Now take it easy, Jack, take it easy. Oh, it hurts. Just hold still, Jack, and I'll snap your jaw back in place. All right, hurry up, John. Now brace yourself. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Dennis, the next time you want me to show you something, wait till the program's over. Well, it's your own fault for showing off. I wasn't showing off. Phil! Well, I got a few left over from last week. <laughs> Put those fish back in the piano. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, as I started to announce before I dislocated my jaw, next week as a special attraction, the Benny Stock Company is going to present... The... Oh, now what? Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. What do you want? Boss, there's no use. I tried and tried, and I can't get Carmichael to go to sleep. Rochester, that polar bear's got to go to sleep. He's supposed to have been in hibernation over ten days ago. Uh-huh. 
If Carmichael doesn't get to sleep by the middle of this month, he'll be a wreck in the spring. Where is he now? Sitting up in bed reading Esquire. <laughs> Esquire? Well, take it away from him. Oh, come now, boss. He's been around. <laughs> I mean, he's got to get to sleep. Now, Rochester, use a little, a little psychology on him. Give him some warm milk. Give, give him some warm milk, put out his pajamas, and brush his teeth. Would you mind repeating that slowly, please? I said, give him some warm milk. Uh-huh. Put on his pajamas. Uh-huh. And brush his teeth. Uh-uh. Rochester, what are you afraid of? That bear is as gentle as a lamb. He wouldn't bite you. He wouldn't, eh? No. Then why am I the largest single user of Band-Aids in the USA? <laughs> Rochester, listen, Carmichael doesn't hate you. He likes you. He likes everybody. Then what happened to the gas man? <laughs> Nothing happened to the gas man. Carmichael doesn't eat people. You ought to see that letter he wrote Santa Claus. What letter? Dear Santa, please send a fat boy to read the meter. <laughs> oh, stop making things up. Now, you keep Carmichael in bed, and when I come home, I'll sing rock baby to him. That'll put him to sleep. Okay, so long. So long. Oh, say, boss. Now what? Are you coming home for dinner tonight? Yes. Well, that'll finish up the wild up. <laughs> good, good. So long. I gotta get that bear to sleep before Christmas or he'll want a present. Play, Phil. Ooh, my jaw. <laughs> Friends, while you're looking through the December magazines in search of an idea for Aunt Martha's Christmas present, keep an eye open for this month's Jell-O page. A full page of Jell-O treats illustrated in such rich glowing colors that it makes your mouth water just to look at it. One of the desserts is called Jack Benny's Special Apricot Ring, and honestly, friends, I think it's just about the grandest-looking dessert Jell-O ever made. It's an easy recipe, too. Just dissolve one package of lemon Jell-O in one and one-fourth cups of hot water. Next, add a dash of salt and three-fourths of a cup of syrup from the canned sliced apricots. Then chill until thickened and fold in two and a half cups of the sliced apricots themselves. When molded, serve with a garnishing of whipped cream, apricot quarters, and green maraschino cherries. And there it is, a golden glistening mold of juicy sliced apricots and sunny lemon jello. Canned apricots and lemon jello are being featured by many grocers all next week. So get them both and make up this delicious treat. Jell-O makes any gelatin recipe taste extra good because its locked-in flavor gives you all the flavor, always. This is the last number of the 10th program in the current Jell-O series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Oh, well, Mary, you want to have dinner at my house tonight? No, thanks. I've had so much of that duck, I'm a bigger quack than Gussie. <laughs> Don't pay any attention to her, Gussie. Good night, folks. Phil! Tomorrow, when you visit your grocers, look at the shelf where you always see those familiar packages of Jell-O. Right beside them, or very near them, you'll spy another Jell-O product. Jell-O puddings in three grand flavors. Chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. You might try Jell-O butterscotch pudding. It's as smooth as cream and simply full of rich golden butterscotch flavor. A pudding that your whole family will want to enjoy again and again. So when you order Jell-O, order Jell-O puddings, too. They're just like grandma's, only more so. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Jell-O program, coming to you from Camp Callan, California, presented by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with The Real American. Jell-O, friends, is a word well known to dessert lovers everywhere. 
It's a trademark, the property of General Foods, and the name of America's favorite gelatin dessert. For years, J-E-L-L-O has stood for Grand Dessert Flavor, and today those big red letters on the box mean more flavor than ever, because now, by means of a new Jell-O process, Jell-O's delightful goodness is made extra delicious. Nothing, you know, is more attractive than a big glistening mold of rich, radiant jello with its bright beauty and scintillating color. And you've never enjoyed anything more than you'll enjoy the swell, tangy flavor of jello. Flavor as lively and refreshing as the juicy ripe fruit itself, and locked in for your added pleasure. Prove to yourself that jello's flavor really is locked in. Open a package of jello. Notice that there's no telltale aroma, no sign of escaping flavor. Then dissolve the jello. And notice how Jell-O's captive flavor comes pouring out. Gloriously rich, thrillingly good. Get Jell-O tomorrow, friends, and enjoy its extra rich, locked-in flavor. The Real American Played by the Orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from Camp Callan, California, we bring you a man who, in my opinion, is the greatest comedian in the world, which is also his opinion, Jack <laughs> Benny. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don... That was a very nice introduction, but you didn't have to make such a ham out of me. I'm a, I'm a great comedian. Let it go at that. Say. Well, Jack, you are a little hammy at times, but it's just my nature to be frank and outspoken. I see. Well, Don, one more introduction like that, and you're going to be outspoken on some other program. <laughs> So, uh, so watch it. Oh, for heaven's sake, Jack. What's the matter with you? Can't you take a rib? Only if it's got meat on it. <laughs> to, hear, to hear you talk, Don, we're the only two people alive who think I'm clever. Oh, I don't mean that you're not clever, Jack. All I say is, in this great big country of ours, there must be some people who don't like you. Hmm. The man is obviously out of his head. <laughs> Listen, Don, now listen, I want to ask you something. Would you say that these 1,200 soldiers sitting here are a typical cross-section of the American people? Why, yes, but what's that got to do with it? Just this. I'm going to prove to you that there isn't one guy in this audience that doesn't think I'm great. All right, fellas, everybody here that likes me and hates the Japanese, raise your hand. <laughs> They are done. They love me here. <laughs> Thanks, fellas. I appreciate your loyalty. Now, wait a minute, Jack. All that question proves is that these boys don't like the Japs. That's my analysis. Oh, you and your big fat analysis. <laughs> I, really, I, I never... I never saw such a stubborn guy. Here we are at Old Camp Callan. All right, boys. Come on. Start yelling. Now, Mary... Well, listen to that. Thank you, boys, from Livingston, Crestview 4, 6881. <laughs> Mary, what's the idea of shouting out your telephone number in front of all these fellas? The sharp ones will write it down. <laughs> I don't care, and you can put that silly poem away, too. I'll let you read it later. You better. Or I'll tell everybody what happened when you were in swimming at La Jolla this morning. <laughs> I, just, I just took my usual plunge in the surf, that's all. <laughs> what happened in La Jolla, Mary? Well, Jack was out swimming when all of a sudden a big wave hit him and he started yelling, help, help. Oh, quiet. So a lifeguard went out, grabbed him by the hair and swam for shore. The lifeguard saved him, huh? Only his hair. Another guy had to go out for Benny. <laughs> Mary, it's nothing to joke about. I darn near got drowned. But, Jack, a fellow who can't swim too well shouldn't go so far out in the ocean. 
Oh, I'm a good swimmer, Don. This was uh, one of those silly accidents that could happen to anybody. What do you mean? Well, I was paddling along, and all of a sudden, my left foot got caught in the right sleeve of my bathing suit. <laughs> it was a terrible experience. Sleeves? Do you mean to say that it has sleeves? And that's another thing. Imagine being at a ritzy beach like La Jolla. Never mind. And wearing a bathing suit that says, Chew Paw Boy on it. <laughs> Oh, don't pay any attention to her, Don. Now, Mary, you know darn well that bathing suit is plenty modern. Well, there's no cuffs on the pants, if that's what you mean. <laughs> I mean, it's got a two-way stretch and everything. <laughs> of course, the uh, top piece is a little baggy there. Didn't that annoy you when you were in swimming? Uh, not so much when I was in the ocean, Don, but when I took it off in the locker room, about four buckets of grunion fell out. <laughs> A policeman told me I'd either have to get my suit fixed or a fishing license. <laughs> the beach there is wonderful, though. I imagine it is. By the way, Jack, where are you stopping? In La Jolla? I'm at the La Jolla Auto Court. <laughs> it's a lovely place. Jack, that's not La Jolla, it's La Jolla. That's how you pronounce it in Spanish. Oh, oh, I didn't recognize it in print. <laughs> I'm, uh... I'm usually very good at Spanish. As a matter of fact, I used to go with a Spanish girl, Estralita Fink. <laughs> <laughs> Swell gal. Is that the one that used to duck baseballs at Ocean Park? She sold the baseball. Get it straight, will you? That's all she did. Hey, Mr. Benny, I tried and I tried, but... Oh, oh, hello, Dennis. Hello. Well, thank the boys, Dennis. Thank you, boys. Say, Mr. Benny, I tried and I tried. But... How, um, uh, how do you feel, kid? Oh, fine. Good. I thought I had dandruff yesterday, but it turned out to be rice from a wedding. <laughs> from a wedding? Who got married? My girl. She's trying to make me jealous. <laughs> well, don't, uh, don't fall for it. Just... Not me. Say, Mr. Benny, I tried and I tried. Yes. But nobody wants to buy those grunions you caught. I didn't, I didn't tell you to sell them. I told you to clean them. We're going to have a big fish fry tonight. I couldn't sell any tickets to that either. I mean a fish fry for our own gang. Anyway, kids, the, uh, the boys here are all waiting to hear you sing, so how about it? All right. Say, where's Phil Harris? The maestro? Oh, he'll show up. I tell you, Jack, Phil's been in the clouds all week. Well, why not? He's a daddy. Just think, a seven-pound baby girl. You know, when I was born, I weighed seven and a half pounds. You did? I weighed eight. I weighed almost nine pounds. Well, I weighed 43. <laughs> He's not kidding, fellas. The stork that brought Wilson had to make a forced landing. <laughs> Sing, Dennis. The memory of this moment of love Will haunt me for A sleepy lagoon, a tropical moon, and two on an island. A sleepy lagoon and two hearts in tune in some lullaby. Fireflies gleam, reflects in the stream, they sparkle and shimmer. A star from on high falls out of the sky and slowly grows dimmer. The leaves from the trees all dance in the breeze. And float on the river We're deep in a spell If nightingales tell 
of roses and dew. The memory of this moment of love will haunt me forever. A tropical moon, a sleepy Sleepy Lagoon, sung by Dennis Day. <coughs> Say, Dennis, while you were singing, I noticed something flopping around in your coat pocket. What is it? A grunion. <laughs> a grunion? Yeah, I picked the best one out for a sample. Well, put it with the others. We're going to fry them. And now, ladies and gentlemen... You're not going to fry this one. We're pals. <laughs> All right. And now, folks, I've got a very important announcement to make. You'll have to save it, Jack. Look who's here. Well, the proud father. How are you, Daddy? Hiya, Jackson. Hello, fellas. Applaud loud. The baby's listening. Hey, ah, that's the truth, folks. Mr. and Mrs. Harris are the proud parents of a bouncing baby girl. Well, Phil, congratulations, but you know it's customary for a proud father to pass out... Oh, yes. Come on, fellas, have a cigar. Here you are, Jackson. Well, a Corona Corona. Say, they're expensive. Have a cigar, Don? Thanks, Phil. You marry? What? No, thanks. I chew plowboy. <laughs> well, Phil's so nervous. Here you are, Dennis. Have a cigar. No, thank you. Hmm. Go ahead, kid. Take one. <laughs> but I don't smoke, Mr. Benny. Hmm. Now, Dennis Day, you take that cigar. Oh, let the kid alone, Jackson. If you don't want a cigar, that's up to him. You stay out of this. <laughs> now, Dennis, are you going to take that Corona Corona or not? Okay, but you'll have to smoke it for me. All right. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, Mary, stop staring at me. <laughs> Ooh. And now, ladies and gentlemen... As I... And now, ladies and gentlemen, as I started to announce... Say, Jackson, I was going to bring the baby down here to watch our program, but Alice wouldn't let me. Well, naturally, the child is only five days old. My goodness. What are you talking about? When I was five days old, I could lace my own shoe. <laughs> well, the reason I know that's a lie, Phil, is because you didn't wear shoes until the day after I hired you. <laughs> I dragged your whole band over to Floor Shine. Remember? Oh, yeah. It took four salesmen to hold my guitar player down. That's right, but you can't blame Frankie. He thought they were going to brand him. <laughs> <laughs> and when they put the shoes on your piano player, he tried to gnaw his right foot off at the ankle. <laughs> he thought he was caught in a trap. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Tuffy. Yeah, what a bunch. <laughs> and now, fellas, for that announcement I was going to make. It's a very important message about next season. So everybody pay attention. You too, Dennis. Okay, hold my grunion. <laughs> <laughs> Put that back in your pocket. Now get this, fellas. As you all know, next Sunday will be our last performance for Jell-O. And beginning October 4th, we will be on the air for a different product. Great Nuts Flake. Hey, oh, well, what do you know? Great Nuts Flake. Yes, what sir. Is... It's for the same company, General Foods, and we'll be on at the same time every Sunday night over the same network. And we'll have a lot of fun. Say, Jackson, I just happened to think of something. How are you going to identify yourself with this new product? What do you mean? Well, you always start off with Jello again. What are you going to do with Great Nuts Flakes? Yeah, that's right. Hey, Great Nuts Flakes. Gee, I, I can't say grape again. <laughs> Or flakes again. Why don't you say nuts again? (laughs) 
Now, no, that, uh, that wouldn't work, would it, Don? Don't ask me, Jack. You know, I'm pretty upset about leaving Jell-O. But, Don, folks will still be buying Jell-O, and there'll be another Jell-O program. We're just going on for another General Foods product. Well, maybe you're right. I guess I'm just a little bit too sentimental. You certainly are. Now, you still have this week and next to talk about Jell-O, so go ahead. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the next time you go down to your neighborhood grocer, why not ask him for a package of tempting and appetizing Jell-O? It's not only economical and easy to make, but with its new locked-in flavor, you will find... That Jell-O is America's favorite Jell-O top dessert! There we go! Oh, for heaven's sake. Don, control yourself! Don! Don't be such a softy. Oh, leave him alone, Jackson. The guy has the right to be lugubrious. <laughs> what? Lugubrious. That means sad. I know it does, and you got it right. Where'd you ever get hold of a word like that? My baby taught it to me. <laughs> oh, stop with that. He's so proud of his child. Say, Dennis, you want to come out to the house and see the baby the stork brought me? Well, if it's all the same to you, I'd like to see the stork. <laughs> Dennis. No use waiting. I got to have a talk with that kid. <laughs> now, Don. Now, Don, dry your eyes. <laughs> Don, dry your eyes. <laughs> dry your eyes either from laughing or crying. I don't know which. And, Phil, let's have a band number and brighten up the atmosphere around here. Okay. Hold it. Come in. Well, I'll be a... Hey, you Buck! Andy DeBuck! <laughs> well, Andy, this is really a surprise. Hello, Mary and Dennis. Hey, congratulations, Phil. What is it, a boy or a girl? Seven-pound girl, Andy. Well, girls are all right, but don't get in a rut like Eddie Cantor. <laughs> That's a fib. Say, Andy, uh, you forgot to say hello to Don Wilson. Oh, yeah. Hello, Don. Glad to see you, Andy. You, you put, put on, on a little weight, weight haven't you? you? <laughs> oh, golly. That's the second time that gag was good, wasn't it? <laughs> you, ought to get a, you ought to get a load of this pair, folks. They look like a couple of barrage balloons in civilian clothes. <laughs> say, Andy... Andy, what are you doing around here? Well, I was fishing down at San Diego, and I thought I'd drop in and say hello. Oh, fishing, eh? Have any luck? Nope, didn't catch a thing. You should have had Jack's bathing suit on. <laughs> Never mind. Say, Andy, how are your folks? Are they still battling? Yeah, they're at it worse than ever. Pa came home with a snootful the other night, and Ma knocked him cold with a welcome mat. <laughs> oh, my God. Won't your father ever learn to behave? Well, Buck, I figure if they ever ration gasoline in California, he'll straighten right out. Why, Andy, you don't mean to say your pa drinks gasoline. He's got to. He swore off a liquor ten years ago. <laughs> what? He's working out at Lockheed as a blowtorch. <laughs> well, that's the worst yet. Stick around, Andy. Phil's going to play a band number. Then we'll go out and have something to eat. Well, I'd love to, but I gotta go now. My girl's waiting for me out in the car. What, your girl's outside alone with all these soldiers around? You're liable to lose her. Oh, no, I won't, Buck. I got her chained to the front bumper. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. So long, Andy. So long, Buck. It was good to see Andy again. Doggone it, I should have sold him a bucket of grunion. Play, Phil.
I was three, three little sisters played by Daddy Harris and his 18 musical diapers. <laughs> musical meaning what the boys think they are, and diapers meaning I'm going to change them. <laughs> Not bad, eh, Phil? That's a fine way to talk after I went and named my baby after you. What? You... you named the kid after me? Certainly. Alice J. Harris. J is for Jacqueline. <laughs> J for Jacqueline. After me. J for what? You heard him. <laughs> Jacqueline. Well, thanks, Phil. That's quite an honor. And now, folks... Oh, Camp Callan, oh, Camp Callan, near La Jolla, Wait I... a minute, wait a minute, Mary. If you insist on reading a poem about Camp Callan, do it right. What's the title of it? Can't you hear me, Callan, Caroline? <laughs> 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 well, <clears throat> I guess that's silly enough. <laughs> Go ahead. Huh? <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, Camp Callan, oh, Camp Callan, near La Jolla by the sea. Where Jack Benny goes in swimming and catches fish for you and me. That's right. There's plenty for all. I met a soldier here last eve who had chevrons on his sleeve. He kissed me, and I must confess, if he's not a bugler, I miss my guess. <laughs> Mary, do you have to kiss every soldier you meet? Well, I'm not stuck up like you are. <laughs> what's, what's that got to do with it? Go ahead. We went walking neath the moon. I said to him, come on, let's boon. But he wouldn't even quench. You'd think I was an oozle finch. Oozle finch? What's that? A goofy-looking bird. It's the mascot of the coast artillery. Oh, oh, I see. That's first. Good, good. Here's to the coast artillery. You defend us by the sea. If Jacks come near, you won't be nice, because Akak guns ain't filled with rice. You said it. <laughs> Mary, that's one of the finest poems you've ever written. Thanks, bub. Go on, go on. My daughter can write a better poem than that. <laughs> well, your daughter's only five days old. Well, I don't care. She's very talented, and when she grows up, she's going to be a musician. Well, she'll be the first one in your family. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. Since when ain't I a musician? Since any time. That since when. At a boy, Jacqueline. <laughs> Dennis, take your grunion out for a drink of water, will you? <laughs> and now, <clears throat> and now, ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, Next Sunday will be the last broadcast of the season. So for this occasion, we have arranged a special... I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. <laughs> oh, hello, Rochester. Where are you? I'm over here at the Lajala Auto Court. <laughs> Uh, Rochester, I found out that's pronounced La Jolla. It turned out to be a Spanish word. Doggone, I should have known that. You? Yeah, I used to be a Toreador in the washroom at the McCampbell. <laughs> Never mind that. Uh, what, did you, uh, what did you call me about? I'm having a little trouble packing your bag, boss. What do you mean, trouble? After I got all them fish in, I didn't have room for your blue suit. <laughs> What, you put those grunion in my brand new alligator bag? But boss, alligators love fish! <laughs> Only if they're alive. This alligator happens to be a suitcase. Well, just the same. Every time I snap it shut, it snaps back at me. <laughs> now, Rochester, take those fish out of that bag. Okay. Then get in the Maxwell and come right over here to Camp Callan. But, Mr. Benny, that's about a 12-mile trip, is it not? Yes. And it's uphill, is it not? <laughs> yes. Now, when will you be here? Boss, that's a mechanical and a military secret. <laughs> well, start right now, and you ought to be here before sundown. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? I took your bathing suit down to the surf and rinsed it like you told me to. You did? This time, one of them little Jap submarines fell out. <laughs> 
Oh, my goodness. What did you do with the Jap? They're in the suitcase with the grunion. <laughs> nice going, Rochester. So long. So long, boss. Well, that is news. Maybe I ought to turn my bathing suit over to the government. I think I will. Play, Phil. Think of spring and you think of strawberries. Think of strawberries and quick as a wink, your thoughts turn to strawberries and Jell-O, one of the grandest of all desserts. Just try Jell-O's new recipe, Fresh Strawberry Supreme, and see if you don't agree. It's gloriously good and so simple to make. All you do is dissolve a package of Jell-O imitation strawberry flavor in one pint of hot water. Chill until cold and syrupy. Then place in a bowl of cracked ice and whip with a rotary egg beater until fluffy. Next, fold in one half cup of heavy cream whipped. Then arrange sweetened sliced strawberries in sherbet glasses and pile the whipped Jell-O lightly on the berries. Chill and serve and you'll have one of the most delightful, flavorful desserts you ever tasted. Rich, juicy red strawberries covered with a creamy topping of whipped strawberry jello. Order strawberry jello tomorrow and try this marvelous treat. And be sure when you buy to get genuine jello, because jello gives you the extra goodness of locked in flavor. This is the last number of the 34th program in the current jello series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Now I'd like to thank General Hardaway and Captain Westerfield and all the boys here at Camp Callan for a swell time and a thrilling visit. Don't forget to tune in next week, ladies and gentlemen, for our last broadcast of the season. I know I will. Good night, folks. <laughs> The Jell-O program is written by Mill Barr and Ed Beline and is broadcast each week by special facilities to our armed forces throughout the world. The presentation of this program from Camp Talon has been for the entertainment of the personnel stationed here and does not constitute an endorsement of our product by the War Department or its personnel. Say, have you tried those new Jell-O puddings? They're made by the makers of Jell-O. And like Jell-O, they're swell. Try Jell-O butterscotch pudding. It's gloriously smooth. A rich, mellow pudding that simply tops for golden butterscotch flavor. And so creamy and good. Jell-O puddings require no additional sugar to make. So tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, order Jell-O puddings too. In all three flavors. Chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. Jell-O puddings are just like grandma's, only more so. The program came to you from Camp Callan. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Do you know the reason why Jell-O today tastes richer, more thrillingly good than it ever has before? Well, it's all because of Jell-O's wonderful new process that locks in Jell-O's grand and glorious flavor. Yes, today, Jell-O gives you more of the richness that for over 40 years has made Jell-O America's favorite gelatin dessert. Because now this richness is locked right into the tiny Jell-O particles to bring you extra enjoyment. Try all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors. Rosy pink strawberry, crimson raspberry, ruby red cherry, golden orange, sunny lemon, and emerald green lime. All of these tempting Jell-O flavors offer you bright, brilliant beauty and flavor that makes you think of the juicy ripe fruit itself. Flavor that is locked in for your added pleasure. To prove how swell Jell-O's locked in flavor really is, open a package of Jell-O. Notice that there's no telltale aroma, no sign of escaping fragrance and flavor. Then dissolve the tiny Jell-O particles and notice how Jell-O's captive goodness comes pouring out in a rush of richness. Get Jell-O tomorrow in all six delicious flavors and thrill to the marvelous new delight of Jell-O's locked in flavor.
was the fleet sin played by the orchestra. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we turn back the clock and take you to the drugstore across the street from the NBC building here in Hollywood. The time is exactly 15 minutes before this broadcast. Take it away, drugstore. Hurry up and order your sandwich, will you, Mary? We'll be on the air in a few minutes. A sandwich? Yes. I'm a growing girl. I want meat and potatoes. <laughs> well, all right, order a meat sandwich. And the potato chips here are very crispy. Every Sunday, we have to eat in the drugstore. Why don't you take me to the Brown Derby once in a while? Mary, I'm not going into the Brown Derby until they hang my picture in the main dining room with the rest of the big movie stars. They can't treat me that way. What do you mean? Every time I want to see that drawing of myself, I've got to go in and wash my hands. <laughs> well, it's... It's not right. Oh, stop complaining. <laughs> Say, Jack, look at this item on the menu. Jack Benny special, 35 cents. A Jack Benny special? What is it? A minute steak with a transfusion. <laughs> oh, these soda jerks think they're so smart. Hey, Gilroy, what do I have to do to get a little service around here? Take it easy, blue eyes. <laughs> Hello, Mary, what'll it be? I'll have a hot roast beef sandwich, mashed potatoes, lettuce and tomato salad, and apple pie with tutti frutti ice cream. Mary, you haven't got time to eat all that. Okay, don't toot the fruity. <laughs> oh, save that stuff for the program. Say, Gilroy, I think I'll just have a cup of coffee and a donut. A what? A donut. One of those over there with the powdered sugar on it. That's a plain donut. I forgot to dust them off this morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, well, then never mind. Maybe I'll just have a cup of... Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, Mary. Hello. Hey, Jack, get a load of Phil, uh, Phil's slacks. Uh, they button on the side. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll be darned. I put on a pair of Alice's. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Why don't you open your eyes when you get up in the morning? They're open, Jackson, but they don't work till noon. No. What a beach, Twitch. Well, uh... <laughs> uh... Smart guy. Give me a Phil Harris special. Okay. One ham omelet. Put a wave in it. <laughs> hmm, put a wave in it. It's the most egotistical thing I ever heard. Here's your order, Mary. Thanks. <laughs> oh, Jack, look who's down the other end of the counter. It's Virgil Reimer, our funny sound man. That's what he thinks. Nobody speak to him. He's getting too fresh. Hello, Virgil. What do you have? Get long distance on the phone. I want a Denver sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's... He's so clever. Say, Virgil, you sure got a lot of laughs at Camp Hahn last Sunday. You were the funniest thing on the Benny program. Yeah, and imagine what I could do if old Poison Puss didn't hold me down. <laughs> hmm, Poison Puss? That's a fine way to talk about our sponsor. He means you. I know who he means. <laughs> Wise guy. No kidding, Virg, you're terrific. Do you get many fan letters? I'll say. Remember that little poodle that used to run out and bring in my mail? Yeah? <laughs> Well, I got a St. Bernard now. That's positively the worst joke I ever heard. <laughs> I thought it was kind of cute. Me too. Yeah? Hmm. You know, Virgil, I thought you had a lot of fun working for Benny. Fun? That old slave driver does everything but chase us across the ice. Well, that's the last straw. Now, listen here, Virgil. Oh, hello, Mr. Legree. Where's your whip? <laughs> Never mind the wisecracks. You get over to NBC and set up our props for the program. Now, scram. See what I told you, Gil? <laughs> All right, get going, get going. Hey, Verge, should I slip my moth in Mickey? <laughs> you stay out of there. Hey, where's my omelet? Here you are, Twitch. You want something to drink with it? No, thanks. I'm on the wagon. Hmm. He never heard a coffee in the morning. <laughs> Hurry up with mine, will you? Say, Mr. Benny, I just got on the weighing machine, and how much oh, do you think... Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello. Say, Mr. Benny, I just got on the weighing machine, and how much do you think uh, How, I... uh, how are you feeling, kid? All right, I guess. Good, good. I thought I had fallen arches for a while, but I wasn't pulling my socks up. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, I see. Thank heaven my girl can use those arch supporters I bought. Why don't you buy them, Jack? Because I don't need them. What makes you think I got flat feet? Plop, plop, plop. <laughs> All right, all right, young lady. Just for that, I'm not going to pick up your check today. I can carry it over to the cashier myself. 
I was going to pay it, too. Say, Mr. Benny, I just got on the weighing machine and... Yes? How much do you think I weigh? How much, Dennis? 141 pounds, stripped. <laughs> stripped? I took the scale in the phone booth. <laughs> Oh, oh. Well, you better watch yourself, young man. Huh? And you know what else, Mr. Benny? Uh, when I put a penny in the machine, I got one of those little cards with my fortune on it. Oh, your fortune, eh? What did it say, kid? You're lucky you can sing. <laughs> now, there's a machine that knows its business. Hey, Gilroy, where's my coffee? Did you send a Brazil for it? Si, si, senora. <laughs> Smart Alec. I wouldn't even eat here if the Brown Derby wasn't so careless about where they hung my picture. Uh, you ought to wash your hands here sometime. <laughs> Well, I'll be done. Hey, kids, you better snap into it. We're on the air in a few minutes. Okay, Don. See you later, Jackson. I'm going to run ahead and find out what my boys are going to play today. What? You mean you don't know what numbers you're doing? Weren't you at rehearsal? We didn't have a rehearsal. Frankie left the cards and chips home. <laughs> oh. See you in the joint, fellas. Be right up. Oh, say, Don. Don, come here a minute, will you? Yeah. Uh, when you introduce me today, I wish you'd do me a favor and say I just started my new picture at Warner Brothers with Ann Sheridan. Well, are you making a picture with Ann Sheridan? Yes, and it might be on the program today. You know, it might be a nice subject to talk about. You know, inject a little romance. What do you mean, romance? You're playing the part of her father, aren't you? I had that out with the director, and I'm now her husband. My new role will be great for the picture. It won't hurt the makeup business, either. <laughs> All right. Now, don't forget, Don... Uh, Warner Brothers, huh? Yeah. Be with you in a second, Mary. I want to get a tube of shaving cream. Hey, mister, um, uh, give me a tube of shaving cream, will you? Got to turn in an old tube, you know. Got to turn in an old one. You know. <laughs> Look, I haven't got an old tube. Now, hurry, will you? Government can... regulations. <laughs> but look, look. I don't make the laws, you know. Now, look, look. <laughs> Come on, look, Jack. We'll be late for the program. I'm coming. Now, uh, look, mister, forget the shaving cream. Just give me a cigar. Gotta have an old one, you know. Never <laughs> mind. Forget the whole thing. Come on, Mary, let's go. Jersey Bounce, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a man who has just started his new picture for Warner Brothers with lovely Ann Sheridan, Jack Glamour Boy Benny. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again. This is Jack Benny, your Glamour Boy, like Don said. <laughs> uh, heaven knows I'd never go that far. <laughs> Uh, Don, how in the world did you ever find out about my new picture with Ann Sheridan? Did you uh, read about it in some column? Hmm? 
Did you? No, Jack. As a matter of fact, I haven't seen anything about it in the papers. Well, then, how did you ever hear about it? I was trying to keep it a secret. Uh, how'd you find out, Don? Did a little bird tell you? Yeah, an old gray canary. <laughs> Mary. But it's the truth, Don. Uh, Ann Sheridan is my new leading lady, and she sure is a peach to work with. Oh, I can imagine. I mean, her... her... her enunciation is so clear and bell-like, and her... her diction is simply marvelous, you know? And her... her... That's Benny for you. With him, it's her diction. <laughs> well, she is beautiful, I'll admit that. And confidentially, Don... I think her husband, George Brent, is a little jealous of me. You know? What do you mean? Well, he happened to visit the set uh, the other day, just as Ann and I were doing a love scene. And right in the middle of a kiss, he got mad and walked out. Well, naturally, why did you kiss him? <laughs> I didn't kiss him, I kissed Miss Sheridan. Pay attention, will you? Anyway, Don, um, I think that this picture will be one of my best screen efforts to date. In fact, uh... I'm already getting fan letters on it. Really? Yep. He gets a bill from Bullocks and he calls it a fan letter. <laughs> I'm talking about real movie fans that write in. Don, you know that little poodle that used to run out and bring in my mail? What poodle? <laughs> well, I got a great day now. <laughs> uh, pretty clever, eh, Dossie? Some ad lib. Now, wait a minute, you. That's my gag. You said St. Bernard. I said Great Dane. It's a different gag altogether. You steal any more of my stuff and I'll play ring around your nosy. <laughs> oh, go sit down. Say, Jackson, do you think there's a chance of getting me in that new picture you're making? Well, I don't know, Phil. I'm Ann, he I'm Ann Sheridan's husband. And what part could you play? Well, if you're her husband, she's got to have a sweetheart. <laughs> Listen, maestro, I wouldn't make any more cracks like that if I were you. Lest next season, when I say play, Phil... I'll be addressing Phil Spitalny. <laughs> so watch it. Oh, you couldn't fire me, Jackson. I got too much on you. Oh, yeah? Well, listen, Phil. If you're referring to that night in Phoenix, that young lady was my aunt... I've never been to Phoenix. Hmm. Why don't I keep my big mouth shut? <laughs> anyway, Phil, don't think I can't get along without you. Say, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, Dennis. You met me in the drugstore, remember? Oh, <laughs> Oh, yes. Say, Mr. Benny, can I come out to the studio and watch you work on your picture someday? Why, certainly, Dennis. Anytime you feel like it. That's swell. And say, while I'm out there, would you mind introducing me to a... to a certain somebody? <laughs> As if I didn't know, huh? Uh, who do you mean, Dennis? Oh, you'll tease me about it. No, no, no. Who do you want to meet? Edward G. Robinson. <laughs> well, that I never figured. Hmm, what a, well, it's about time for your song, kid, so let's have it. Okay. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? Would you be interested in a toupee with no cuffs on it? Get out of here! <laughs> you ought to see his head, folks. The only thing he can part on it is his eyebrows. Sing, Dennis. <laughs>
Uh, that was I Remember You, sung by Dennis Day, who would rather meet Edward G. Robinson than Ann Sheridan. And now, folks... I only wanted to meet Robinson so he would introduce me to Miss Sheridan. Well, why go to all that trouble? I could introduce you to Ann. Well, I wanted to meet her for nothing. <laughs> It wouldn't cost you anything. And now, folks... You charged me 25 cents to meet Barbara Stanwyck. <laughs> you met Barbara Stanwyck and Robert Taylor. <laughs> and now, folks... That isn't worth a quarter, then I don't know what. And now, folks, Mr. Don Wilson, that eminent American author, has written another of his famous one-act plays. Take it, Mr. Wilson. The scene, ladies and gentlemen... Don't run off, Dennis. You're in this. You're going to be an old prospector. Okay. Here, Phil. Hold my yo-yo. <laughs> Dennis, put that away. Go ahead, Don. The scene, ladies and gentlemen, is the home of Mr. and Mrs. Rufus Lemaire, who live in a cabin on the edge of the Mojave Desert in a desolate part of the West. They're just finishing their evening meal. Music, please. Well... Well, Sari, I thought our supper tonight was fine. There's nothing like barbecued coyote. Not only that, I got a fur coat out of it. Yep, and that, uh, that jello we had for dessert was mighty tempting. Where did you get it? I walked 85 miles to our neighborhood grocer. Well, it sure was worth it. Say, Ruth, I seen a newspaper in town, and guess what? What? It says that men ain't gonna wear cuffs on their pants anymore. He ain't, eh? Say, I wonder if I got cuffs on my pants. Why don't you take off your boots sometime and find out? One of these days, I'm a going to. I wonder who that is. Come in. Hmm. Hello, stranger. Who are you? I'm a prospector. And for three weeks now, I've been lost in the desert without food or drink. I'm starving, I tell you, starving! Be calm, old timer. Sit down. Okay, hold my yo-yo. <laughs> Hmm. A fine prospector. I'm starving, I tell you. Starving. Uh, don't worry. We'll take care of you. Yes, I'll fix you a nice hot dish of beef stew. Beef stew? Yep. No, thank you. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> hmm. I'm starving, I tell you. Starving. Be patient. We'll think of something, stranger. Say, would you like a nice lettuce and tomato salad? What kind of dressing? French or Thousand Island? <laughs> No, thank you. <laughs> hmm. I'm starving, I tell you, starving. Well, you've got to eat something. Isn't there anything you'd like? Yes. Have you got some tempting and delicious jello? Jello? I'm sorry, partner. We had some, but we ate every bit of it. I'm going to make it again tomorrow, though. Okay, I'll be back. So long. <laughs> so long, stranger. I'm starving, I tell you, starving, starving. Hmm. Ah, folks. What other product can command such loyalty? Uh, that little drama, ladies and gentlemen, was written by our own Don Wilson. And Don, that's the best one yet. Oh, I don't deserve too much credit for it, Jack. You see, that was a true story. I believe you. <laughs> now, um... Now, go over to your chairs and sit down. And now, folks... And now, folks, I would like to announce that our program next Sunday will originate from San Francisco, where we are going to dedicate the brand-new NBC studios. In fact, we're going to do their very first broadcast. Well, I guess a new building can take it. Don't worry. If I can just get my writers out of Hurley's Bar and into a Turkish bath, we'll be okay. <laughs> Now, kids, I uh, gave all of you your railroad tickets, so I better check them over to see if everything's all right. Phil, what's your uh, Pullman reservation? I'm sleeping in car 19, lower five. Check. What's yours, Dennis? Car 19, lower five. Check. Now, wait a minute. Never mind. <laughs> uh, what's yours, Don? Car 19, lower five. <laughs> Uh, check. What's, uh, 
What's yours, Mary? Upper five. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> Don't mention it. Well, everything's okay, so remember, fellas, be at the station one half hour before train time. Now, take it easy, Jackson. Three of us can't sleep in one berth. Oh, of course not. We won't be comfortable. Listen, Don, in the days of Vaudeville, the four Marx brothers slept in one berth, and they had a harp besides. <laughs> so stop beefing. Well, Jack, if I was as thin as the four Marx brothers, I wouldn't complain. Don, the tickets are bought, and that's the way it's going to be. That's a lot of hooey about the Marx brothers. How do you know they all slept in one berth? Jack was in the baggage car with Fink's mule. <laughs> You said it. In those days, when I said I was going to hit the hay, I meant it. <laughs> anyway, fellas, it's a short trip, so don't worry about it. Say, Mr. Benny, where are you going to sleep? Well, Dennis, on account of my insomnia, I think I'll just sit up in the chair car and read. I'll get a magazine. Well, buy a popular mechanics and find out how three guys can lay down in one berth. <laughs> Who said lay down? Lay down, or, or lie down, which is correct. A lot of good that'll do us. <laughs> Listen, kids, will you please stop being so fussy? Say, how am I going to get up to San Francisco by carrier pigeon? Virgil, you're not going to be with us next week. You can tune in and listen. I wouldn't listen to this program if it was the pot of gold and I had the only telephone in the country. <laughs> oh, you, uh, you wouldn't, eh? That's topping him, Jack. I wasn't trying to top them. I don't want to hear any more about our trip. We're going there. We're going to open up the new studios. And immediately, as soon as... Hmm. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. Oh, hello, Rochester. What do you want? Well, boss, he did it before and he did it again. What? What are you talking about? Carmichael just came out of hibernation and I can't find the gas man. <laughs> You mean my polar bear woke up already? Why, he's not supposed to come out of hibernation till May 1st. He's early. So was the gas man. <laughs> Stop dreaming things up. Tell me, Rochester, was Carmichael in a good mood? Well, yes and no. What do you mean, yes and no? When he first got up, he came over and hugged me and squeezed me and he even tried to kiss me. Well. And then he put salt and pepper on me. <laughs> Oh, that cute little rascal. I bet he's as thin as a rail. Uh-huh. Uh, you better give him something to eat, to Rochester. A lot of nourishing food. Uh-huh. Uh, what that bear needs is something fattening. I know one hunk of fudge you ain't gonna get. <laughs> oh, Rochester, stop. You know he loves you. Now, here's what you do. Give Carmichael a nice cold shower and then comb his hair out. Might be all uh, matted, you know? He don't like it when I comb his hair. Well, then give him a slap on his nose and make him behave. Let him know who's boss. I let him know once, then he let me know, and now there's no question about it. <laughs> well, all right, Rochester, just leave him alone. When I come home, I'll take care of everything. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? I'm going up to San Francisco with you, ain't I? Yes, of course. Well, on this trip, am I going to be under 12 or a Pullman Porter again? <laughs> You're getting a ticket. Now, goodbye. Mm, darn that Carmichael. Every year, the gas company wants to take my meter out. Oh, well, play, Phil. Here's a gay glistening dessert as bright and beautiful as spring itself. Jello cubes with strawberries. It's an enticing treat that will lend a grand touch of color and flavor to any meal you serve it with. Our folks will enjoy it. And just listen to how easy it is to make. Simply dissolve one package of orange jello in a pint of hot water. Next, turn into a shallow pan and chill until firm. Cut the jello into cubes and then arrange them in sherbet glasses with sweetened sliced strawberries using quick frozen strawberries if you wish. Serve either plain or with cream. What a dessert. So rich and inviting to look at, so gloriously good. Make the family this wonderful combination of sweet, juicy red strawberries and clear golden cubes of orange jello. Get several packages of orange jello tomorrow. But be sure when you do to get genuine jello because jello's flavor is locked in for your added enjoyment. This is the last number of the 29th program in the current Jell-O series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time, broadcasting from the new NBC studios 
in San Francisco. So long, Jack. See you at the train. Wait a minute, Mary. We've all got to stick around today and put on a little entertainment for men in uniform. They'll all be coming in here in a few minutes. Oh, well, I'll just have time to write a poem. Oh, soldiers, sailors, and Marines, you're the nicest guys save I've it, ever seen. Save it, save it, save it. Good night, folks. <laughs> Friends, the same folks who make Jell-O make another wonderful dessert. Jell-O puddings. Three luscious puddings that you make with milk. Try Jell-O chocolate pudding. A smoother, mellower pudding you never tasted. And what a world of rich, homemade goodness it has. A grand chocolate flavor developed especially for Jell-O puddings by the famous Walter Baker chocolate people. So tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, ask for all three Jell-O puddings. Chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. They're just like grandma's, only more so. The Jell-O Show, the orchestra is a program with me and my buddy next door. What is it, friends, that makes Jell-O America's favorite gelatin dessert? Well, the answer is Jell-O's all-around goodness. For Jell-O is a perfect dessert, a dessert that has everything. There's Jell-O's ease of preparation and its low, thrifty price. There's Jell-O's inviting color, its bright, beguiling beauty and attractiveness. There's Jell-O's famous flavor, a flavor that reminds you of the juicy, ripe fruit itself. And now, today, there's Jell-O's new and exclusive locked-in process. This wonderful new process locks Jell-O's delightful goodness right into the tiny Jell-O particles and gives you extra richness, extra pleasure every time you enjoy a swell-looking, swell-tasting Jell-O dessert. Let your next package prove it. Open a box of Jell-O. Notice that there's no sweet, fruity aroma, no sign of escaping flavor. Yet the instant you dissolve the Jell-O, you unlock its captive flavor and out it pours for your enjoyment. So get several packages of Jell-O tomorrow in all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors. See if you don't enjoy Jell-O even more than ever. Now the Jell-O's glorious flavor is locked in. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Don Wilson. Jack Benny will not be with us tonight, but he hopes you will enjoy the program we have prepared for you. Jack wants you to know that he will be back with us again next week. In the following half hour, you will hear Malin Merrick, his orchestra, his singing chorus, the Sportsman's Quartet, and Dennis Day.
that lovely land we knew. his orchestra with La Comparsita.
funny looking booba. He plays the rumba on the tuba down in Cuba. Or any type of telling apple with the shuffle, grab it, grab it with the loompa, oompa, oompa, they prefer it to the hoopa doopa doopa. He's on the rumba on his loompa down in Cuba. It doesn't take him long to get a tumble. For all the rumba love is love is rumble. For how I love to see a double for the dollar bit of trouble with his loompa, oompa, oompa. He can knock eleven ladies for the loompa. He loves the rumba on his loompa down in Cuba. He's not a green horn, he goes a green horn. I love the green horn, oh he's a whiz. You bet your fist, he surely is. You bet he is. Oh no, Havana loves this booba. Oompa, oompa. Who plays the rumba on the tuba down in Cuba. Oompa, oompa. I guess they lay the bell, they tell us every peanut bed is jealous of his oompa, oompa, oompa. They prefer it to the hoopa, doopa, doopa. They love the rumba on the tuba, they do. They love the oompa, oompa, oompa on the tuba, they do.
you heard a fill the fluter of the town of Ballymuck? The times were going hard with him, in fact the man was broke So he just sent out a notice to his neighbors one and all As how he liked their company that evening at a ball And when right now he was careful to suggest to them If they found a hat of his convenient to the door The more they put in whenever he requested them The better would the music be for dancing on the floor With the toot of the flute and the twiddle of the fiddle-o Hopping in the middle like a heron on the griddle-o Up, down, hands around, crossing to the wall Oh, hadn't we the gaiety until the fluters fall? And little Mickey Mulligan got up to show them how And then the widow Cafferty stepped out and makes her bow I could dance you off your legs as she as sure as you were born You'll only make the piper play, the hair was in the corn So Phil play, he's up to the best of his ability The lady and the gentleman begin to do the share Faith, Pat and Mick, it's you that has agility He got a Mrs. Cafferty, you're leaping like a hare With the tooth of the flute and the twiddle of the fiddle-o Up and in the middle like a heron on the griddle-o Up, down, hands around, crossing to the wall Oh, hadn't we the gaiety at Bill the Fluter's ball? Then Bill the Fluter tipped a wink to little crooked Pat I think it's nearly time, says he, for passing round the hat So Patty passed the hat around and looking mighty cute Says you've got to pay the piper when he tutors on the flute and all joined in with the greatest joviality Covering the buckle and the shuffle and the cut Jigs Wofford danced of the very finest quality But the widow beat the company at handle in the foot With the toot of the flute and the twiddle of the fiddle-o Up and in the middle like a heron on the griddle-o Up, down, hands around, crossing to the wall Oh, hadn't he the gaiety at Bill the Fluter's ball The orchestra brings you Blue Room from the musical score of The Girlfriend. Is you who makes my friends and foes Is you who makes me well 
grandma flows. Here you are, so near my nose. So tip her up and down she goes. Yuck, 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 you and me. Little brown jug, don't I love thee? Yuck, 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 you and me. Little brown jug, don't I love thee? When we're alone, my wife and I, we tip our jugs and drink them dry. I like butter. Oh, so do I. Boy, boy oh boy, you must be right. Well, down the hatch. Little brown jug, don't I love thee? The rose is red, my nose is too. The violet's blue, and so are you. Yet I guess before I stop, I'd better have another drop. One more drop. When our jugs are empty dry And the world is spinning by We holler out for lemon drink To come and have some jug music Ladies and gentlemen, may we remind you again that Jack Benny will not be heard on this afternoon's Jell-O show. He will be back, however, next Sunday afternoon at this same time. Long ago when the world was gray, I strolled away from the throng. From the plans that were once so gay, and gone the hopes held so long. Dusk was slowly falling on the leaves. The birds were hushed in every tree. Suddenly, so sweet, so strong, down from the hill came a song. La 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 la. I heard a lonely shepherd play. It was a haunting melody. I heard the music clearly saying, la 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 la, that he was happy as could be. He played and he played, the world was forgotten, like castles in air, my every care began to fade. La, 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 if he would Dennis Day, the mixed chorus with Malin Merrick's orchestra singing a hymn. A hymn of praise for our land of the free, America the Beautiful. Oh, beautiful for me. 
for dinner, delight the folks at your house with one of the easiest desserts you ever made and one of the best desserts they ever tasted. Cherry Flake Jello, one of Mary Livingston's own special favorites. All you need to make it is a can of grapefruit sections and a package of cherry jello, because here's how simple it is. Just dissolve your package of jello imitation cherry flavor in one pint of hot water and grapefruit juice. Turn into a shallow pan and chill until firm. Next, break the glistening jello into tiny flakes with a fork. Then pile lightly into sherbet glasses, garnish with grapefruit sections, and serve. What a treat it is. The tangy goodness of golden grapefruit, deliciously combined with rich crimson cherry jello. So get a package of cherry jello tomorrow and make up this swell treat. Just be sure when you buy to get genuine jello, because jello gives you extra richness, extra enjoyment, thanks to jello's new locked in flavor. Tune in again next week, won't you? And listen to the Jell-O show when Jack Benny will be back with us with his Jell-O gang, Mary Livingston, Dennis Day, Phil Harris and his orchestra, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Good night, everyone. J-E-L-L-O Jell-O and Jell-O puddings, two of the grandest desserts that ever brightened a meal. Jell-O, America's favorite gelatin dessert. And Jell-O puddings, smooth, luscious puddings with a swell homemade flavor that everybody loves. There's Jell-O butterscotch pudding. This rich, creamy treat is full of golden butterscotch goodness. And it has a delightful, old-fashioned flavor that you'll really enjoy. So tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, get Jell-O puddings in all three flavors. Butterscotch, chocolate, and vanilla. Jell-O puddings are just like grandma's, only more so. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI, Los Angeles. J-E-L-L-O! The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Be Young Again. It's new, it's better than ever. It's the new, better than ever Jell-O. Now made even more delicious by Jell-O's wonderful locked-in flavor. A flavor that is locked right inside Jell-O's crystal-like particles where it can't escape. No need to be afraid that your gelatin dessert will leak flavor while waiting to be used. When you open the package, you can be sure that every last luscious bit of Jell-O's grand goodness will be right there, untouched by time, unchanged in any way. By means of a new Jell-O process, all of Jell-O's full, vivid flavor is held captive in the tiny Jell-O particles. Locked there till you dissolve the particles and let their rich flavor pour out into a swell dessert. So get several packages of the new Jell-O tomorrow, friends, and see what a big difference Jell-O's locked-in flavor makes. In Jell-O, the flavor never goes away. We put it in, and it's there to stay. was Be Young Again, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, there being only 24 shopping days till Christmas, we bring you that 24-carat comedian with a heart of gold, Jack Benny. <laughs> um, um, hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, that was very sweet of you. Gee, I'm a 24 karat comedian with a heart of gold. Did you like my introduction, Jack? Yes. In fact, if I was an imbecile, I'd fall for it. <laughs> Every year at this time, you give me that same hooey. You know, Don, you're about as subtle as your stomach. <laughs> if you get what I mean. Well, maybe so, Jack, but Christmas will soon be here, and you know the old saying, a word to the wise is sufficient. Don, here's another saying that's not quite so old. Don't count your presents until Benny gets off the nest and cackles. <laughs> but now that the subject's come up, uh, what would you like for Christmas, Don? Something for the house or something personal? Oh, anything at all, Jack. But I do hope it's more practical than what I got last Christmas. Oh, I've forgotten, Don. What did I give you last year? A sarong. 
<laughs> a sarong? Oh, my goodness, then I, then I must have given Dorothy Lemoore your present. Oh, no wonder she hasn't spoken to me since. What'd you give her, Jack? Oh, Don, I'm so embarrassed, I can't tell you. <laughs> oh, go ahead. What was it? Well, Don, you know how you were gaining weight last year. Uh-huh. So Dorothy got a 54-inch girdle. <laughs> And, Don, here's the payoff. When you pull the zipper, it plays. Why don't we do this more often? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, kid. Isn't that... I kind of surprised you there, didn't I? <laughs> no, really. Isn't that awful? <laughs> Hello, Jack. What are you blushing about? Mary, I just found out that by mistake last Christmas, I gave Dorothy Lemoore Don's girdle. Can you imagine that? Well, don't worry. She probably thought it was a hammock. <laughs> yeah, I never thought of that. Say, Jack, I want to get one thing straightened out right now. What? Before I buy your Christmas present, what are you going to give me? <laughs> well, that's a fine spirit. Mary, half the pleasure of getting Christmas presents is a surprise. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Remember how thrilled you were last year when I gave you that brand new Plymouth? You gave me a ticket on a Plymouth. <laughs> All right, I was just as mad as you were when you didn't win the drawing. <laughs> just as mad. Matter, you wanted Congress to investigate. Well, what are they down there for? Anyway, I'm not gonna tell you what I'm giving you this Christmas. Well, give me a clue. Is it big or little? Oh, it's not so little. <laughs> well, is it heavy or light? Oh, <laughs> medium. <laughs> well, do you wear it or eat it? Well, you can wear it or you can eat it. Jeepers, a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Say, Mary, have you got Jack's present all picked out? I sure have. What are you going to give me, Mary? Well, Jack, you know how crazy you are about swimming. Yeah. Well, I'm getting you a bathing suit with short pants. <laughs> Oh, goody, now I won't trip when I die. <laughs> I can go along with a gag, sister. <laughs> you know me. Say, Mr. Benny, you know what I'm going to give you for Christmas? Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello. Uh, what are you going to give me for Christmas, kid? Is that what I said? <laughs> yes. What are you going to give me? Oh, well, you've been so nice to me, Mr. Benny. I'm going to give you a brand new photograph of myself. Hmm. A photograph, eh? Yeah, and I'm going to write on it with gratitude from your tenor, Dennis Day. Hmm. Well, look, kid, unless that picture is surrounded by a silver frame, you better write E-X in front of that tenor. <laughs> Put a frame on it. Well, I'll have to think it over. You better not. That's how Kenny Baker happens to be with Fred Allen. <laughs> Gee, you're hot today, aren't you? <laughs> you said it, huh? Why, Jack, I understand Kenny left you because Alan offered him more money. Well? I wouldn't leave you for more money, Mr. Benny. Well, thanks. I wouldn't leave you for all the money in the world. Well, thanks. <laughs> thanks very much. You're my dream man. Oh, shut up! <laughs> he never knows when to stop. And furthermore... To... Hiya, Jackson. Boy, are you lucky I'm here today. Oh, hello, Phil. What do you mean, lucky? Well, me and the boys were playing down in San Diego last night, and my fans just wouldn't let me go. You mean you went over great, eh? Great. Jackson, would you believe me if I told you we turned away over 10,000 people? No, I wouldn't. Uh... <laughs> oh, you see, Frankie, I made it too big. <laughs> you certainly did. And on our way back this morning, we played Laguna Beach, Seal Beach, and San Pedro. Now, hold on, Phil. There are no ballrooms open at that time of the day. Who needs ballrooms? They got street corners, ain't they? <laughs> what? You play street corners? Sure. We get out of the bus, give out a couple of tunes, and take whatever the people drop in the hat. Hmm. Well, that's a great system if you're not too proud. How'd you do in Seal Beach, Phil? Oh, terrific. We got 20 dimes, 8 quarters, and 15 halibut. <laughs> halibut? Say, that's my favorite fish. Speak to the piano player. 22 cents a pound. <laughs> Oh, you've got the fish in the piano, eh? Well, this will be the first time Charlie will be able to play a scale. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a Lulu. <laughs> Say,
Hey, Dennis, I was wondering what was... <laughs> I was wondering what was dripping out of the piano there. Say, Dennis, uh, how about a song? Who, me? No, my Aunt Molly. Now, let's have your song. Okay. Wait a minute. Come in. Say, Mr. Harris, what do you want this bucket of ice? Ice? Yeah, bud, just dump it in the piano. I've got to keep them fish cold. Well, if that isn't the most... <laughs> Phil! Phil, what's the matter with you? That'll ruin the piano. <laughs> and get a load of that sign. Phil Harris and his orchestra. It's the fish that smell, folks. <laughs> Well, that's just protection. Sing, Dennis. And the guy's been with me five years and wants to charge me 22 cents a pound. <laughs> Magnolias in the Moonlight, sung by Dennis Day. Excellent, Dennis. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction this evening... Say, Mr. Benny. What? Have you seen those bamboo frames they've got for pictures? They're very novel. I don't want a bamboo frame. You said you were full of gratitude. Say it with silver. I want a nice, heavy silver frame. Not too heavy, Jack. You'll have to take a cab to the hock shop. <laughs> I'm not going to hock it. And now, folks, as I started to announce, this evening... This evening, we are going to present our version of that immortal drama, that outstanding Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, thank you, boys. You can go back to the Samaritan Institute now. Now, in, um, in this epic, in this epic, I will play Spencer Tracy's part, the dual role of Jekyll and Hyde, Dr. Jekyll, the kind, gentle, lovable character, who, after taking a certain powerful drug, changes into Mr. Hyde, the fiendish, horrible maniac. <laughs> 
He is, Jack. That's pretty hard to do, isn't it? Yes, especially Mr. Hyde, but I'll be all right. I was rehearsing out in the hall before the show. Uh, didn't you see me with my face all screwed up and my, my tongue hanging out? Was that Mr. Hyde? I thought your feet hurt. <laughs> Mary, my feet kill me, but not that much. Now, let's see. Oh, Jack, here comes your gag man, Belly Laugh Barton. Oh, yes, yeah. Hello, Belly. Hello. Did you send for me, Grandma? Uh, yes, um... Uh, we're, uh, we're doing a play tonight, and I want you to act in it. What do you mean, act? I'm a writer. Listen, Belly. Hmm. Now, listen, Belly. You've got a three-way contract with me, writing, acting, and publicity man. You know that. Publicity man? Yes. What does he do, draw your picture on fences? <laughs> no, he's supposed to get my name in the papers. And incidentally... Bill, will you please stop selling fish during the program? <laughs> Now, please. Well, that lady in the first row wants some. <laughs> Madam, you'll have to wait until after the show. <laughs> <laughs> now, Belly. Uh, Belly. <laughs> I have to get him another name. <laughs> now, Belly, in our play tonight, you're going to be a newsboy. Okay. By the way, did that rabbit gag get a laugh? Oh, it was all right, but you'll have to do better next week. Well, maybe Miss Livingston didn't put the gag over. Maybe she didn't sell it. Listen, Junior, I punched my brains out on that gag. <laughs> Mary, leave him alone. Writers don't grow on bushes. Sorry, Billy. All dames are alike. They're always beefing. <laughs> yeah. You said it. Man's best friend is his dog. <laughs> Ah, folks, what other program takes time out from the hokum to bring you such pearls of wisdom? That reminds me. Say, Pearl, why don't you go down to the neighborhood grocer and ask him for a package of Jell-O? Who's Pearl? My cook. Oh. She knows that Jell-O has that new locked-in flavor. Oh, oh. Goodbye, Pearl. Hmm. <laughs> well, Don, you're certainly quick on the trigger tonight. Now, getting back to our play, folks, this will go on immediately after a... <laughs> Phil, take off that rubber apron. It's time for a band number. <laughs> Now, go ahead. Okay, Jackson. What a guy. Dennis, remember, that bamboo frame is out. Keaton Smiling played for the first time on the air by John Philip Harris <laughs> and his orchestra. You know something, Jackson? The boys in the army camps all over the country were listening to that song just now. Well, I hope they enjoyed it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our play, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Take it, Don. The opening scene, ladies and gentlemen, takes place in Dr. Jekyll's office in early morning. As the curtain rises, we find his two secretaries seated at their desks. Curtain. Music. Hello, Dr. Jekyll's office. This is his secretary speaking. No, but I expect him any minute. Thank you, I'll tell him. Goodbye. Hello, Mr. Hyde's office. <laughs> Yeah, this is the secretary talking. Now he isn't in if he wants heaven help you. <laughs> what? Goodbye yourself. <laughs> Gee, 
Gee, I hope Dr. Jekyll is himself today and not that horrible Mr. Hyde. Well, I hope he is Mr. Hyde so he'll think I'm beautiful. <laughs> Shh. Here he comes now. Ah, good morning, Miss Jones. Good morning, Dr. Jekyll. Are there any messages? Yes, Doctor. Mr. Allen called and said he couldn't pay his bill. Mr. Allen, will you tell Fred not to worry about it? Any time at all will suit me. You see, Miss Jones, the poor boy doesn't earn much on the radio. He gets paid by the laugh, you know. <laughs> Anyway, don't press him for the money. All right, Doctor. In fact, Miss Jones, just tear up his bill. See how sweet I am, folks, before I take the drug? <laughs> hmm? Uh, by the way, Doctor, there's a patient in the waiting room. He's very anxious to see you. All right, send it in. Ah, good morning, young man. Good morning, Doctor. My name is Fingerwave, Otis J. Fingerwave. <laughs> Well, uh, sit down, Mr. Fingerwave. Uh, what seems to be the trouble? I've got a terrible affliction, Doctor. I walk in my sleep. You do? Uh, how often does this occur? Every night. Every night I walk in my sleep. Hmm. Well, where do you live? All over. <laughs> That's too bad. Well, look, young man, there really isn't a cure for your condition, but as long as you're here, I'll check you over. Now, stick out your tongue and say, ah. Come on, say, ah. Ah. Mm, that'll be two dollars. <laughs> Next. Next patient, please. Next. Can I try for the four dollar ah? <laughs> no, that'll be all, young man. Goodbye. Goodbye, doctor. Anyone else, Miss Jones? Oh, yes, Dr. Jekyll. Miss Carol Lombard just called and wants you to come over to her house right away. Carol Lombard? What's wrong with her? Uh, she's making a picture with Jack Benny, and she can't keep a thing on her stomach. <laughs> hmm. Kay Francis had the same trouble. I'll run over later. Oh, Doctor, your newsboy is here. Oh, Johnny? Hello, Johnny. Hello, Dr. Jekyll. You want a paper today? Yes, yes. Here you are, sir. And here's a dollar. Keep the change. Gee, a 95-cent tip. Thanks, Dr. Jekyll. That's all right, Johnny. <laughs> I'll be back later, Miss Jones. Uh, uh, wait for me, will you, my dear? Yes, Doctor. Gee, he's a sweet man. It is midnight, and we find Dr. Jekyll returning to his office after a busy day calling on his patients. Oh, what a hectic day. And goodness, look at the hour. Any calls, Miss Jones? No, but Mr. Fingerwave came by a few moments ago. Oh, was he walking in his sleep? I think so. He had a Do Not Disturb sign pinned on his pajamas. <laughs> well, he must get his rest, you know. Miss Jones, I've had a very bad day, and I'm frightfully tired. Will you give me a glass of water, please? Yes, Doctor. And have you seen my powders around anywhere? Oh, here they are. Yes, my powders. Oh, well, Dr. Jekyll, Dr. Jekyll, please don't take those powders. It's all right, Miss Jones. Don't worry. But, Doctor, you know what they always do to you. Please don't. Quiet, Miss Jones. Quiet. There. Please, please don't take that stuff again. <laughs> oh, Dr. Jekyll, Dr. Jekyll. <sighs> your desk before I break every bone in your body. <laughs> Get back, you little worm. Where's my other secretary? Here I am! <laughs> oh, you are, are you? Where have you been? None of your business. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'll take a letter to Fred Allen. Dear rat. So you can't pay that bill you owe me, eh? Well, you get that money here by tomorrow morning, or I'll put your adenoids back in. That's all. 
Oh, it's you. You want a paper, Mr. Hyde? Yeah. That'll be five cents. Take it out of that dollar I gave you when I was Jekyll. <laughs> now hand over that change or I'll kick your teeth out. <laughs> I'm going out for a walk now, a nice long walk, and before I come back, someone will be dead, murdered, murdered, <laughs> and it may be that fish peddler. <laughs> Scene three, Dr. Jekyll's office the following morning. Yes, yes. I'll tell him as soon as he comes in. Goodbye. Good morning, Dr. Jekyll. Boy, have I got a hangover. <laughs> um, any calls, Miss Jones? Yes, Doctor. There's a gentleman waiting in your office. Thank you. Wow, what a head. I gotta go back to liquor. Those powders are killing me. <laughs> Oh, well. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, doctor. My name is Beaumont. Tex Beaumont. Tex Beaumont. That name is familiar. What can I do for you? Well, doctor, I'm in a horrible predicament. You see, I'm a cowboy actor, a star in Western pictures. But unfortunately, I work very little. Yes, yes, go on. The reason for that, doctor, is my speaking voice. My voice is much too beautiful for a cowboy. Uh-huh. In fact, I'm not at all convincing. Even my horse laughs at me. <laughs> well, that is unfortunate. But I don't see how... But you must help me, you must. You see, when I go out a-shooting and they're killing, no one's a-believing it. <laughs> well, as I say, Tex, I'd like to help you. But I'm afraid changing your voice is a little out of my... Out of my... Hey, wait a minute. Maybe I can help you. You see this powder here? Yes. Well, by mixing it with water, an unusual thing sometimes happens. It may even help you. Doctor, doctor, what are you doing? I'm not going to take it. Not the way I feel. <laughs> now, Tex. Yes, doctor? I want you to drink this. It may change your voice. Your personality. Maybe your whole career. Oh, Doctor. I don't know how to thank you for what you're... You can thank me later. Drink. Drink. Drink it all. That's it. Now, just a little more. Good. He's twitching. Now, Tex, how do you feel? Tell me. How do you feel? Well, to tell you the truth, Doctor, I feel kind of dizzy. What? What was that? Say that again. I beg your pardon? Quick, quick, drink some more. Okay, here it goes. Never mind, you don't have to. Well, Tex, you sound like a real cowboy now. Yeah, but my teeth are a little long, ain't they? Don't worry, they'll stop growing when they reach your chest. <laughs> okay, thanks, Doc. I'll never forget you for this, for it's blood on the saddle. <laughs> That man's voice was strangely familiar. I wonder if it was... Oh, no, it couldn't have been. Play, Phil. Friends, make this test. First, open a box of the new Jell-O and smell it. Notice there's no sweet, fruity odor, no telltale aroma to warn of escaping flavor, because Jell-O's delicious flavor is locked inside the Jell-O particles where it can't leak out. Second, put a few of these magic Jell-O particles on your tongue and taste them. Notice how moisture unlocks their glorious flavor and lets it gush out, just as it does when you dissolve the Jell-O in a dessert. Third, actually make up a dessert and see the wonderful richness that Jell-O's locked-in flavor gives it. 
Try Jell-O's peach and banana mold. Make up one package of lime Jell-O as you usually do. Then arrange one half cup of canned sliced peaches on the bottom of the mold and pour the Jell-O over them. Slice a banana into the Jell-O and chill until firm. And there you'll have the final proof of how extra good a treat like this can be made with Jell-O's locked-in flavor. Remember, Jell-O is different because Jell-O gives you all the flavor always. This is the last number of the ninth program in the current Jell-O series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce that the man who sounded like Andy Devine on tonight's program was Elliot Lewis and Andy Devine. <laughs> See how I clear things up? Uh, good night, folks. Oh, Phil, uh, 19 cents a pound. No use getting stuck with them. <laughs> This is the time of year, folks, when pies are most popular. So why not serve a delicious pie as one of your desserts next week? Try a banana cream pie made the quick, easy, inexpensive way with Jell-O vanilla pudding. This grand pudding makes the smoothest, creamiest filling you ever saw. And when you blend it with sliced bananas, well, there's just nothing better. So tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, ask for Jell-O vanilla pudding, as well as those two other Jell-O puddings, chocolate and butterscotch. Jell-O puddings are just like grandma's, only more so. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles, Earl C. Anthony Incorporated. J-E-L-L-O! The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis A. Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Marine's Hymn. Jell-O spells grand enjoyment, friends, whether you find it on a box of Jell-O or on a package of those other wonderful dessert flavors. Jell-O puddings, Jell-O chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch puddings, you know, are made by the makers of Jell-O. And like Jell-O, they're easy to prepare, thrifty to serve, and delightfully good. They give you all the mellow richness of homemade puddings, the tempting old-fashioned goodness of Grandma's creamy masterpiece. Yet how much less time and trouble they take to make. You can make such a variety of desserts, too, with Jell-O puddings. Butterscotch pie, for instance. All you do is prepare a package of Jell-O butterscotch pudding according to directions. Then cook, cool, and turn into a baked 8-inch pie shell. Serve plain or garnish with whipped cream. And you'll say you've never made an easier butterscotch pie or tasted one more delicious. So get a package of Jell-O butterscotch pudding and make the family this rich golden butterscotch pie for tomorrow night's dinner. In pie or in pudding, you'll find Jell-O butterscotch pudding a swell treat. Just like Grandma's, only more so. Marines hymn played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, yesterday, February 14th, was not only Valentine's Day, but also the birthday of Jack Benny, who was exactly years of age. <laughs> so let us show you what happened. The time, 7 o'clock last night. The place, Jack's home in Beverly Hills. Take it away. My mama done told me when I was in knee pains, my mama done told me, son, a woman of sweet talk and give you... Gee, the it's, my, it's my birthday, and I don't know what to do tonight. Why don't you go to a movie, boss? That's an idea. Let's see. Now look in the paper and see what's playing around. A woman of sweet talk and give you the big eye. But when the sweet talk is done... Maybe, maybe there's a bank night someplace. <laughs> no, not on Saturday. Now, let's see. A woman's a two-faced, <laughs> worrisome thing to leave you to sing the blues in the night. 
Gosh. Gosh, I don't know where to go. Now the rains are falling here. The train are calling wooey. My mama done told me. Here, that lonesome wit. Say, here's a movie I could see. Uh, I could see Ball of Fire. Yeah, Miss Barbara Stanley's in that. Oh, yes. I saw her in the Brown Derby today, and she walked right by me. Well, what other picture can I see? <laughs> Here, that lonesome whistle blow and cross the trestle. Hooey! <laughs> My mama done told... Oh, here's... Here's Ida Lupino in Ladies in Retirement. Now, she never speaks to me either. <laughs> now, what else? From Natchez to Mobile, from Memphis to St. Joe. St. Joe. What a hit I used to be in that town. <laughs> Boy. Wherever the four winds blow. Very good, Rochester. I wish Johnny Mercer could have heard that. Now sing Rose O'Day. Oh, boss, come now. <laughs> Rochester, I said, sing Rose O'Day. Well, Mr. Benny, if you're in the mood for entertainment, why don't you turn on the radio? The radio's out of commission. Did you kick the tubes out of that thing again? Well. What a temper you got. Every time Mr. Allen has a funny program, crash, bang, zowie. <laughs> Listen, Rochester, Fred Allen hasn't had a funny program since the night his pants fell down and he had Portland's underwear on. <laughs> They live in a very dark room, you know. <laughs> oh, say, uh, <laughs> say, here's a, here's a swell double feature tonight at the Bijou. Gary Cooper and Sergeant York and Jack Benny and Charlie's Ann. I think I'll go there. But, Mr. Benny, you've seen Charlie's Ann over 20 times. I've never seen it at the Bijou. <laughs> I might as well take a girl along with me. Uh, give me my little red book, Rochester. The one Mr. Harris sold you when he got married? <laughs> no. No, no, my red book. The one I've always had. Oh, the thin one. <laughs> uh, never mind the book, Rochester. I know who I'll call. Uh, she'd like to go to a movie. From Natchez to Mobile, from Memphis to St. Joe. St. Joe, they love me there. Wherever the blows, I've been in some... Hold it, Rochester. Now. Hello? Uh, LaBelle Tour Apartments? I'd like to speak to Miss Scheherazade Crump. <laughs> yes, please. I've been in some big home and her... Hello? Hello, Scheher? <laughs> This is Jack. Uh, Jack Benny, Blue Eyes. <laughs> Say, honey, how would you like to see Gary Cooper and Sergeant York tonight? The other feature, Charlie's aunt. Okay, some other time. So long, Shahar. <laughs> I don't blame her. She's seen it so often, you know. Oh, well, I'll go to a movie alone. On your birthday, boss? Why don't you call that girl you took roller skating last week? Oh, yes, Thelma Stronic. She might be, she might be home now, yeah. From Natchez to Mobile, from Memphis to St. Joe. St. Joe, I can still hear that applause. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever the four winds blow. Hold it. Hello, say, Thelma, how would you like to go to a movie tonight? Oh, oh, goodbye. <laughs> hmm. Didn't she want to go, boss? How do I know? A man answered. <laughs> Oh, well, I'll think of somebody to take along. I wish I could remember some... Say, Mr. Benny, look who's here. Well, if it isn't little Miss Lee. Well, well, well. For heaven's sake. Hello, Carolyn. Hello, Jack. Happy birthday. Thank you, honey. Say, what have you got in that box? Some candy for you, and I made it all by myself. Oh, some candy, a present. Isn't that thoughtful? My, it's fudge, isn't it? Uh-huh. Well, I'm going to eat a piece right now. Hmm. I, it would taste better, but my mommy told me I mustn't use sugar. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it certainly is delicious. 
Here, Rochester, have a piece. It ain't my birthday. <laughs> Howard. Well, Carolyn, it, it sure is tasty. And, oh, look, here's a piece with a nut in it. Where? Right here, see? Well, thank heaven, that's the eye I lost out of my dolly. <laughs> oh, oh, here, take it, Carolyn. Thanks. Well, I gotta go home now. Goodbye, Jack. Good night, sweetheart. See you tomorrow. Gee, she's a cute kid. She comes in every day. Hmm, 7.30. Well, if I want to take a girl to a movie tonight, I'd better get going. Oh, I know. Why didn't I think of it before? Rochester, get me Miss Ginger Rogers home. Miss Ginger Rogers? Yes, yes. Don't be so surprised. Never mind. I've got a number around here someplace. I'll find it. My mama done told me when I was a knee pain. My mama done told me some. da 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 Hello? Hello, is this Ginger Rogers' house? Good, I'd like to speak to Miss McGuire, please. Jack Benny calling. <laughs> I said, uh, Miss McGuire. Oh, she's not working there anymore? Oh, okay, goodbye. Guess she must have married that policeman. <laughs> Well, I can scratch Ginger Rogers' name out of my book. <laughs> I'll just... I think I'll just stay home and read. Hand me that Radio Guide magazine, Rochester. Here you are. Oh, by the way, boss, there's a story about you in there. I know. I mean, there is? <laughs> well, let's see it. Say, Rochester, while I'm sitting here reading, you might as well give me a haircut. Then you won't have to do it tomorrow. Uh, get the scissors and everything. Right with you, boss. Let's see, what page is that interview on? Mm. Oh, oh, here it is. Jack Benny, the real him. Good title there. <laughs> All set, boss. Hold still. Okay, don't take too much off the sides. Sir. Get a load of this, Rochester. Jack Benny, the sophisticated comedian, is in real life just an assuming country boy from Waukegan. That's me, all right. And this may come as a surprise to you readers, but Mr. Benny is so modest that he has yet to see himself on the screen. Well, <laughs> Rochester. <laughs> when interviewed at his Beverly Hills home, we found... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Many happy returns. Thanks. Well, for heaven's sake, what are you doing with that bowl on your head? <laughs> I'm getting a haircut. What do you think? Rochester, leave my sideburns long. I'm taking rumba lessons. Oh, <laughs> oh, Jack, will you stop trying to look like Cesar Romero? I'm not trying to look like my Romero. My goodness, just because I'm an unassuming country boy from Waukegan, I don't have to look like a hick. Oh, you read that article, eh? What article? Right there in that magazine. Jack Benny, the real ham. That's him. <laughs> the real him. It's a pretty good story, but I don't know where they get those photographs of me. Get a load of this one. Look like I've got a double chin. Well, you have got a double chin. I have not. And what's that hanging under your jaw, a cocoon? <laughs> no, it's not a cocoon. All I say is, woo, woo. Say, Roger, woo. Roger, there's something tickling me on top of my head. What is it? Wait a minute, boss. Well, how could I ever be so careless? What's wrong? I left a goldfish in the bowl. <laughs> a goldfish? Well, get him out. Take the bowl off. If I do that, I'll lose my place. <laughs> uh, 
I don't care. Take this goldfish bowl off my head. It's stuck, boss. Stuck? Well, take the handle of the scissors and tap it a little. Yes, sir. Well, you did it. Are you happy? Now, where'd that goldfish go? Never mind the goldfish. <laughs> Finish cutting my hair. I can't understand how that bowl got stuck. I can. Every time you read an article about yourself, your head swells two inches. <laughs> that all depends on whether the article is good or bad, Miss Livingston. <laughs> Hurry up, Rochester. I want to go to a movie. A movie? Oh, oh, Rochester, will you please come in the other room? I want to talk to you a minute. Yes, Miss Livingston. What do you want to talk to him about? Never mind. Look for the goldfish. I'll be right back. Uh, now, Rochester, the gang's coming over here pretty soon, and we're going to throw a surprise party for Mr. Benny. A surprise party? Yes. Now, it's up to us to see that he stays right here in the house. Oh, he won't go out tonight unless he gets a date. Then what am I worrying about? <laughs> Come on, let's go back. All right, Mitzi, if you got to work, you got to work. Goodbye. Hmm. Oh, oh, say, Mary, would you like to go to a movie tonight and see Gary Cooper and Sergeant York? I saw that. What's the other feature? Oh, I don't know. Let's take a chance. I thought so. <laughs> well, it's a swell double bill. Are you all through with my haircut, Rochester? Yes, sir. Good. Now, just put a little bay rum on so I'll smell sweet. Uh-oh. Rochester, what became of the bay rum? The which? The bay rum. Where is it? Well, the uh, bay is in San Francisco. I don't know what happened to the room. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I wish you wouldn't drink everything in this house. Well, I'm going to the movies, even if I have to go alone. Oh, wait a minute, Jack. Why don't you let me give you a manicure? I don't want a manicure. I'm going to a movie. It's Saturday night, and I... Oh, oh hello, Dennis. What are you doing here? Happy birthday, Mr. Benny. Surprise, surprise, Dennis. Am I too early? Dennis! <laughs> Surprise? What are you talking about? Well, uh, he's surprised because you've got long sideburns and you look just like Cesar Romero. Oh. Oh, thanks, kid. You're welcome. Gee, I nearly spilled the beans, didn't I? Quiet! <laughs> hmm. What are you doing here anyway, kid? Oh, nothing. Say, Mr. Benny, you and Abraham Lincoln both have the same birthday, don't you? Well, not quiet, Dennis. You see, my birthday is February the 14th and... Abe Lincoln's is February the 12th. Yeah, Lincoln is two days older than Jack. <laughs> Mary, we weren't born in the same year. In fact, I barely remember them. <laughs> well, thanks again, Dennis. Oh, say, that reminds me, Mr. Benny. You know what I'm going to sing on the program tomorrow? What? Jerome Kern's new song, Abe Lincoln Had Just One Country. Well, that's very appropriate, Dennis. What's well, so wrong, kids? I'm going to a movie. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Don't you want to hear the song? Sing it for him, Dennis. I can hear it tomorrow. You'll hear it right now. Come on, Dennis. Okay. I'm sure sorry I left the cat out of the B-A-G. Dennis, will you please sing your song? What's all the mystery about, for heaven's sake? Oh, ho. I think I get it. I smell an R-A-T. <laughs> Take a lesson from old Abe Lincoln in times of stormy weather. Take a lesson from old Abe Lincoln. Let's face the storm together. Abe Lincoln had just one country and one banner to wave. One union of brave brothers no brothers and slave others we're still marching along with Lincoln with one banner to wave this union was born in freedom and this union must live in freedom and this freedom is worth saving and worth fighting we 
That was positively thrilling. Well, if I'm going to a movie, I might as well get started. Or maybe I should stay at home in case uh, anybody drops in. Hmm? Yeah, let's stay here and play bridge. I don't feel like bridge. What else can we play? Might I suggest a few rubbers of ivory gin rummy? <laughs> Rochester, put those dice back in your pocket. Let's go to a picture, Mr. Benny. Come on. I am not going to leave the house until the gang gets here and surprises me. So there. Well, you see, Dennis, you spoiled everything. Oh, yeah, I was wise. Well, then there's no use keeping it a secret. The gang will be here in a few minutes and bring you a present. Oh, a birthday present, eh? Well. Say, Rochester, go out in the kitchen and fix up a big tray of sandwiches. Yes, ma'am. Don't you cut one slice of bread. Listen, Mary, when your friends give you a surprise party, they're supposed to bring the food. <laughs> now do it right. <laughs> Gonna do it at all. <laughs> well, don't worry. We bought cold cuts, cheese, bread, and lots of stuff. Oh. And here's a nickel. We may need water for coffee. <laughs> The coffee I'll furnish. And I'll also contribute some homemade fudge. All I say is that... Hey, Jack, look who's here. Oh, yes, it's Mr. Billingsley playing soldier again. <laughs> Company! Oh! Well, uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Billingsley. Good evening. At ease, man. <laughs> good evening, Mr. Benny. Still up and about, I see. Yes, yes, I didn't feel like going to bed. I'm a little disappointed in you. I blew taps over an hour ago. <laughs> yes, I... I know, but you see, uh, some visitors dropped in, and we... Visitors, eh? May I see their passes? <laughs> oh, oh, they're on our side, Mr. Billingsley. They know the password and everything. Give them the password, Mary. I am not gonna bray like a jackass for anybody. <laughs> All right, I'll do it for you. Hee-haw. Pass, friend. <laughs> oh, oh, say, Mr. Billingsley, I notice you're wearing a sun helmet. Are you headed for the tropics? No, I'm eating at Chasen's tonight. <laughs> good, good. Well, see you later, Mr. Billingsley. Good night. Good night. Company, forward, dance. Dance? <laughs> Well, there he goes. Some soldier is carrying a flit gun. It works out, Mary. To him, moths are airplanes. But it keeps him busy. You know, one thing about Mr. Billingsley... Hey, hey, that must be the gang now. Now, for heaven's sake, Jack, don't spoil it. Act surprised. Don't worry, I'm an actor. Say, I wonder who that is. Come in! Surprise! boys. Well, oh my goodness, what is this? What's going on here? It's a surprise party for you, Jack. Yeah, Jackson, a surprise party for our good old boss. For good old me? <laughs> Gee, fellas, I don't know what to say. Here I was, just spending a quiet evening at home, never dreaming that... Don't overdo it. <laughs> never, never dreaming that you, you fellas were going to throw a surprise party. Just, <laughs> just, just for me. <laughs> Shall we give him his present now, Don? <laughs> no, let's give it to him later. 
Give it to me now while I'm sentimental. <laughs> Hand it over. That's the fast, Jackson. A speech goes with this. Take it, Don. Speech, speech. Where's the present? <clears throat> Jack, on behalf of Mary, Phil, Dennis, Rochester, and myself... Yes, yes. ...and all the boys in the band, Frankie, Charlie, Mitch, Sam, Skippy... Yeah, look, Fletcher, you don't have to name them. Look, I, I know the boys. And on behalf of Jell-O and those delicious flavors... This I can't stop. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime, I would like to present you with this lovely token of our esteem and affection. Well... Here you are, Jackson. Open it up. We hope you like it. Oh, boy... Gee, here I, here I was sitting at home, never dreaming that. Oh, for Pete's sake! Oh, fellas, you shouldn't have done it. You like it, Jack? Like it? Why, it's just what I needed. What is it, boy? A can of crab meat. <laughs> And the big size, too. You know, that stuff is hard to get nowadays. Oh, Rochester, get the can opener and we'll taste it. There's a can opener with it. Oh, for, well, wonders never cease. <laughs> Crab me. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's have some fun. Yeah, for I'm a jolly good fellow. I'm a jolly good fellow. For... Oh, someone at the door. Come in. Come in. Well, it's a Western Union boy. Hello there. Hello, stranger. Schlepperman! Well, Schlepperman, this is a surprise I didn't figure on. What's the idea of wearing a Western Union uniform? Quiet. I told my wife I'm drafted. <laughs> Oh, well, what's this all about, Schlepp? Have you got a message for me? Have I got a message? A singing telegram delivered in person by Bing Schlepperman. Bing, eh? With him, it's horses. With me, it's our bicycle. Well, let's have the greeting, Schlepp. Go ahead. All right. Hit it, boys. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jack Benny. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh sabotage, eh? Huh? <laughs> Happy birthday, Jack Benny. Happy birthday. was wonderful, slap wonderful. Now stick around, we're all gonna have some fun. Bring the sandwiches, Rochester. Yeah, first we'll eat, and then we'll, woo, woo, and then we'll, woo, woo, woo. Jack, what's the matter with you? I found that goldfish and went down my back. <laughs> woo, woo, grab it. Darn you, Rochester, the next time you give me a hair, woo, woo, watch out what you're doing. And here's something every dessert lover will certainly be interested in hearing about. Lots of folks are discovering how much richer, how much more delicious Jell-O is today than it's ever been before. Never in all the years since it became America's favorite gelatin dessert has Jell-O been so gloriously good. And it's all because of Jell-O's new locked-in flavor. By means of a marvelous process exclusive with Jell-O, Jell-O locks its famous flavor right into the tiny Jell-O particles, protects it for your enjoyment, gives every dessert you make with it a livelier extra goodness. As much as you've liked Jell-O before, you'll like it even more now that Jell-O's swell, intriguing flavor is actually locked in. For here's Jell-O at its delicious best. The same Jell-O you've always known and loved, but better, richer, more of a tempting treat than ever, thanks to Jell-O's locked-in flavor. Prove for yourself that Jell-O's flavor really is locked in. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice that there's no sweet, fruity odor, no telltale aroma to warn of escaping flavor. Yet the moment you dissolve those tiny jello particles, out pours their captive flavor in a rush of richness. So treat yourself and your family to the thrill of jello's new and greater goodness. Order several packages of jello from your grocer tomorrow and see if you don't agree that jello's new locked-in flavor makes jello better than ever. 
This is the last number of the 20th program in the current Jell-O series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday at the same, at the same time, broadcasting from the U.S. Army Post at the Presidio in San Francisco. Good night, folks. The Jell-O Show is written by Bill Morrow and Eddie Beloyne. Tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, be sure to order Jell-O puddings, too. Jell-O puddings are rich, luscious puddings that you make with milk. And they come in three swell flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. There's Jell-O chocolate pudding, delightfully smooth and mellow, a pudding that simply tops for grand, creamy taste, with a distinctive chocolate flavor developed exclusively for Jell-O puddings by the famous Walter Baker chocolate people. So tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, ask for Jell-O puddings. They're just like grandma's, only more so. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles. K-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Jump for Joy. <laughs> What rich, thrilling enjoyment you get from today's new Jell-O. Now made better than ever by Jell-O's wonderful locked-in flavor. Here's one of the biggest improvements ever made in gelatin desserts. A new scientific method by which Jell-O's full original goodness is locked right into the tiny Jell-O particles. The gelatin desserts you use to buy continually lost flavor during the days they spent in the package. They became flat and tasteless as time stole away their freshness. But the new Jell-O is different. Today, all of Jell-O's bright, tingling flavor is locked into Jell-O's crystal-like particles, locked in for keeps where time can't touch it, no matter how long your Jell-O remains in the package. Just prove it for yourself. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice there's no heavy, fruity aroma that tells of escaping flavor. Then dissolve the Jell-O, and presto, you unlock its captive delight, and out pours a delicious flood of flavor. Don't wait another day to try it, friends. Order several packages of the new Jell-O tomorrow. The flavor never goes away. We put it in, and it's there to stay. was Jump for Joy, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, next Thursday is Thanksgiving, and no doubt most of you will have turkey for dinner. That's right. So this evening, without further ado, we bring you a chestnut for your dressing, Jack Benny. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Jello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, thanks so much for that introduction. <laughs> It was not only topical, but floppical. <laughs> Chestnut for your dressing. Well, in my opinion, Jack, it was a very clever gag. I thought of it all by myself while I was shaving this morning. And you didn't cut your throat? <laughs> I can't understand it. <laughs> Anyhow, Don, it'll uh, soon be Thanksgiving, and I love you. By the way, uh, would you and the little woman like to come over to my house next Thursday for a nice wild duck dinner? Thanks, Jack. We'll be very glad to. Wild duck, huh? Yep, I went hunting yesterday morning, and as usual, I brought home the limit, three ducks. Beauties, too. Huh? But, Jack, the limit is ten ducks. Oh, I mean on one shot, Don. I... <laughs> <laughs> you see, I don't go out hunting and bang away like it's Fourth of July, you know. Three ducks with one shot. My goodness, I had no idea you were such an expert hunter. Oh, sure, Don. For me, that's nothing, you know. Well, I'd say that's darn good. By the way, Jack, what kind of a gun do you use? My, my gun? Oh, it's just a plain, ordinary, double-breasted shotgun. <laughs> it, uh, it does the trick, though. You mean double-barreled, don't you? What? Oh, oh, yes, double-barreled. It's a Westchester. Well, this I is I never miss with it. You know, I really never, never miss it. This certainly is news. Benny the Sportsman. Tell me, what'd you get yesterday, mallards or canvas bags? I... I beg pardon, Don? 
Uh, what was that? I said, what did you get, mallards or canvas bags? Yes, sir. Hmm. <laughs> but uh, I want to tell you something, Don. <laughs> well, what were they, mallards or canvas bags? They were ducks, quack, quack. <laughs> if you don't want to come to dinner, say so. Hmm. I suppose every time I shoot a duck, I have to go up to him and say, my name is Benny, what's yours? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. Well, I'm sorry, Jack. I didn't mean to... Okay, okay, forget it. But believe me, Don, there's no thrill in the world like letting, getting out at five in the morning, hopping into that rowboat and waiting for those ducks to fly by. Yes, there's no question about it. That's real excitement. By the way, Jack, uh, do you use a retriever? <laughs> well, I, uh... Beg pardon, Don? Do I use a what? A retriever. You know, a dog that swims out and gets the ducks after you shoot them. A dog, a dog that swims... Say, that's an idea! <laughs> That'll save Rochester from getting wet all the time. <laughs> Wait till I tell him, huh? Why, Jack, you don't mean to say that Rochester jumps into that cold water. Yes, and he brings back those ducks without a tooth mark on them. <laughs> Except once when I accidentally hit him on top of the head with an oar. <laughs> anyway, Don, be sure and come to dinner and you'll taste the finest. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hello, Don. Hello, Mama. Mama? Yeah, she finally got a radio set. Oh. Hello, Mama. Keep up the payments. <laughs> Gee, now she can listen to us. Oh, say, Mary, I went out hunting yesterday and I brought you a little present. Here you are, some beautiful duck feathers. Here. What do I want with duck feathers? You can put them on a hat or something. What can I do with them? Glue them on your chest. It's going to be a cold winter. <laughs> uh, they'll just fit on my tattooed eagle. I can go along with a gag, sister. <laughs> anyway, if you don't want them, I'll give them to Dennis. He'll think of something. Where'd you get those feathers anyway? I told you, I went hunting yesterday. I go every year. Remember last year when, uh, Paul, when you were with me? Oh, yes. <laughs> Did you tell Don what happened? Never mind. What was it, Mary? Jack was in a rowboat when some ducks flew by, and boy, was he excited. Oh. So he pulled the trigger too quick, shot a hole in the boat, and came home with 18 trout. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were delicious, fried in butter. And the way you explained that hole to the owner of the boat. Well, it could have happened. It could not. It could, too. How can a boat be torpedoed in Lake Henshaw? <laughs> All right, forget it was years ago. And that's the last time I'll ever take you ducking. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Well, kids, here's your tickets. Front row center, best in the house. Tickets? What tickets? Here, Mary, now look, hold them to Wednesday night and get there early. I don't want you to miss a thing. Wait a minute, Phil, what are those tickets for? Well, it says right there on them. And you guys don't think I can act, huh? Well, I'll be darned. Get a load of this, fellas. The Hollywood Night School, third grade dramatic club. <laughs> Invite you to a special Thanksgiving play entitled The Courtship of Miles Standish. Well, who are you, Phil? Miles Standish? Now, let her read it. Go ahead, Mary. This play stars Willie Shapiro as Miles Standish. Hmm. Butch Peterson as John Alden. Go on, go on. <laughs> and Philip Harris as Priscilla. <laughs> Priscilla? That's me. I'm the heroine. <laughs> That's heroin. Heroin. So, uh, Phil, um... <laughs> Phil, uh, you take the girl's part, eh? Yeah. Ain't that a novelty? Well, not exactly, Phil. If you remember, I recently played the female lead in Charlie's Aunt. Yeah, but you were an old bag. I'm young and tender. <laughs> Listen, Harris, I'll put on a sweater with you any day. <laughs> any day, brother. The courtship of Miles Standish. Eh? Say, that ought to be very interesting, Phil. Yeah, now look, fellas, get this plot. Miles Standish is the captain of the soldiers in Plymouth, Mass., and he knows plenty about fighting them Indians. But when it comes to clinching with a blonde, the kid ain't half. 
<laughs> uh -huh. Anyhow, Captain Standy sees this beautiful doll, Priscilla. That's me with my curls combed out. <laughs> hmm. And I'm sitting by the window in my cottage spinning the wheel. What are you doing, playing roulette? I don't know, I don't say. <laughs> Isn't that awful? Anyhow, Phil, don't tell us the plot now. You'll spoil the surprise. <laughs> what a character. Oh, Mary, would you mind telling our beautiful young pilgrim maiden to put down her spinning wheel and direct a band number? Why don't you speak for yourself, Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> oh, go. Go ahead and play, will you? Uh, hold it, Prissy. <laughs> Come in. Telegram for Mary Livingston. Right here, bud. Give him a tip, will you, Jack? Give him a tip, give him a tip. Well, it's your program. Okay, okay. Here you are, bud. Oh, goody. A ticket to Miles Standish. <laughs> Get out of here. Every time I look at his head, I want to play tic-tac-toe. <laughs> Who's the wire from, Mary? It's from Mama. Dear Mary, program coming in fine. How can Jack have the heart to shoot a duck when he walks like one? <laughs> Well, the old battle axe is still punching them out. <clears throat> Belly Laugh Barton gave us that gag. Play, Phil. Why did she have to buy a radio? This time, The Dream's On Me, played by Pilgrim Harris and his Plymouth Rocks. <laughs> Plymouth meaning the boys have landed musically, and rocks meaning I wish I had some. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, as we announced last Sunday, the football season being in full swing, tonight, the Benny Athletic Actors will present their annual drama of the gridiron entitled, He Fumbled the Ball, or Who Tickled the Tackle? <laughs> Now, as usual, I will play the part of Dennis. Dennis, I wish you'd get here on time. I'm sorry I'm late, Mr. Benny, but I couldn't find a place to park my car. Dennis, you don't have to drive around the streets all day. There's a parking lot next door where you can leave your car for 15 cents. How do you know? I heard about it. <laughs> I can go along with a gag. <laughs> Now, where was I? Say, Mr. Benny. What? I heard a broadcast last night that made my blood boil. It ought to burn you up, too. Why, who was funny? I mean, what, uh... <laughs> well, what do you mean? Well, I was over at my girl's house necking with her, and she got bored and turned on the radio. Well, naturally. So? So we listened, and there was a guy on the air that sounded just like you, and he even used your name, Jack Benny. Uh, Dennis, uh, that was me on the air last night. I was doing a special broadcast for NBC's 15th anniversary. Then who played the part of Don Wilson? That was Wilson himself. 
And if you'd have been with us, I'd still have to explain it to you. Gosh, was that really you and Don? Certainly. We did a comedy act. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Gee, it was so lousy, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Look. <laughs> Look, uh... Look, kid. Kid, you just... You just didn't get the idea of our act. We were very good. Then why did my girl turn off the radio and go back to me? I don't know. <laughs> what a kid. And now, ladies and gentlemen, getting back to our drama, I will play the part of Flash Benny, the famous football coach of Flatfoot College. Oh, Jack, why don't you let someone else be the coach? You don't know anything about football. I don't, eh? Let me tell you something. When I was on the team at Waukegan High, they used to call me Tiger Benny. That's because you scratched everybody with your long fingernails. They called me Tiger because when I played, I was a snarling, vicious animal. Like on payday? <laughs> what was that, Dennis? What was that? Watch out for those fingernails, kid. No oh, quiet. Now, let's get back to our casting. Phil, you're going to be right end. Dennis, you're going to be left end. And Don... Yes, Jack? You're going to be everybody in between, so loosen your belt. Now, Mary... You mean I'm going to be right guard, left guard, right tackle, left tackle, and center? Yes. Well, I must be quite an actor. Uh, take it any way you want to. Uh, now, Mary, inasmuch as we're short of men, uh, you'll have to play on the team, too. I'm not going to be a man. You are, too. I'm not going to wear football pants. And you're going to wear football pants. They better have lace on them. Never mind. Ooh, what she said. <laughs> Dennis. No use talking. I must have a talk with that kid. Now I play. Now I... Dennis, did you ever see our wilderness? You must see it sometime. Now our um, our play, ladies and gentlemen. We'll go on immediately after... I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. Well, what is it? I was looking at those ducks you shot yesterday, and you know, boss, they're pretty small. Yes, they are small. In fact, they ain't ducks at all, they're pigeons. <laughs> Look, Rochester, I ought to know what I shot. What makes you think they're pigeons? One of them's got a message on his right leg. <laughs> What? Just took Manila, signed Dewey. <laughs> Dewey? Boss, those birds are gonna be tough. Oh, some kid must have put that message on for a gag. I still insist they're ducks and we're gonna have them for Thanksgiving. Uh-huh. Now take them out of the icebox and dress them. I'll have to wait till you get here, boss. They're so full of buckshot, I can't lift them alone. <laughs> Well, then, then ask Mr. Billingsley to help you. Where is he? He took the message and he's flying to Washington. <laughs> well, well, for heaven's sake, stop him. Stop him. Too late now. He put the electric fan on his head and jumped off the roof. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And what happened? His feet are sticking out of the rain barrel. <laughs> well, get him out of there. I'll be home soon, so hang up. Okay. So long, boss. So long. Oh, say, Rochester, I've got good news for you. The next time we go duck hunting, you won't have to swim out for them. I'm buying a dog to do it. Thanks, boss. I was getting tired of chasing that ball anyway. I just did that to keep you in practice. Goodbye. Hmm. Of course, if I buy a dog, I'll have to get a dog house and a license. Sing, Dennis. Then if he bites the mailman, I'll be in trouble. Go ahead, kid. I have to think that over. <laughs>
but for one so gay and gone the hopes held so long dusk was slowly falling on the leaves the birds were hushed in every tree suddenly so sweet so a lonely shepherd play It was a haunting melody Ah, I heard the music clearly say Ah, that he was happy as could be Played any play, the world was forgotten. Like castles in air, my every care began to fade. La 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 la. If he would only play forever. A Shepherd Serenade sung by Dennis Day. Very good, Dennis, and quite a novel arrangement. Say, Phil, I notice you put a harp in the orchestra for Dennis's number. And the harpist is a most attractive young lady. Yeah, she goes with my guitar player. Oh, the harpist and your guitar player. Is it serious? Nah, they're just stringing each other. Ha, 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 it's a Lulu. <laughs> oh, Pris, still love. Mmm. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our drama of the gridiron entitled, We Can't Lose, or We Can't, eh? <laughs> the scene is Flatfoot College in the town of France. The first half has just ended in the annual game with Meatball Tech. And Coach Flash Benny is giving his team a pep talk in the locker room. <laughs> now, listen, men. In this next half, we gotta go out there and fight. You're playing like a bunch of jellyfish. You've been out there 30 minutes, and what's the score? I ask you, what's the score? Notre Dame, seven, Northwestern, six. <laughs> That's the trouble with you guys. You're not concentrating on this game. Now, I don't want that portable radio out in the field while we're playing. <laughs> it's confusing. Well, I'm doing the best I can, Coach. Listen, Livy. All during the game, you've been tackling Meatball's quarterback and slapping him in the face. What's the idea? That's Jim. The rat never sends me pretty flowers. <laughs> never mind the romance. Just stick to the game. You said it, coach. And you, left guard, right guard, left tackle, right tackle, and center. <laughs> A fine game you've all been playing. Uh, none of your lipper will walk out, won't we, fellas? You're darn right. Yes, you said it. <laughs> Cut that out. And you, Day. Yes, Coach? Every time you get the ball, you fall down. Why don't you run? I keep tripping over the lace on my pants. You're wearing the wrong one. <laughs> now, look, men. We've still got a chance. The game isn't over. All we got to do is get rolling. Why, the score is only... Only... 65 to nothing. <laughs> 65 to nothing? Hey, when did we get a nothing? <laughs> we started with that. Now, come on, men. I'm going to play with you this next half and show you something about football. We'll win this game or my name ain't Roy Well, 
here we are, folks. The score is Meatball 65, Flatfoot nothing, and the second half is about to begin. Meatball is already on the field, and here comes Flash Benny and his Flatfoot team. Jello, Jello, hey, 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 best dessert in the USA. Flavor never goes away. Put it in, and it's there to stay. Hooray! Ah, listen to those cheers, folks. There must be 18 people here today. <laughs> There's more than that on the team. Oh, go shoot a pigeon. Those were ducks. <laughs> Darn that guy. Now, men, we've got nothing to worry about. I'll call the signal. Dale will carry the ball and crash through for a touchdown. Who, me? Yes, you. We're depending on you, Dave. You're the best player on the team. That gives you an idea, folks. <laughs> All right, men, let's go. Here we go, folks. Meatball's about to kick off. Flatfoot's lining up to receive. And there's the whistle. <laughs> well, there's the boat, the Catalina. <laughs> On your toes, man. Well, there's my boat, folks. So I'll now turn the microphone over to that famous sports announcer, Mr. Raymond Radcliffe. Thanks, Captain Henry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Raymond Radcliffe speaking. Oh, fine. I will now describe the last period of this thrilling football classic. <laughs> classic? Lefty Wanfield of Meatballs making the kick. And there goes the ball. Last Benny of Flatfoot receives the ball on his own 30-yard line and is nailed in his whack. Well, I didn't make much gain that time, fellas. But how can I with a fur ball? Your toupee fell on it. Oh. <laughs> All right, men, this time we'll pull our famous hidden ball play. You know how it goes, uh, Dave? No, hum a little of it. <laughs> it means that you carry the ball. Now, come on, men, line up. This is our chance. Signal. Hey, Wilson, pull in your left tackle a little. You're offside. All right, signal. Ralph Ram, Brigitte French, Scrunch. Hey! <laughs> It's a Kawasu play. West Benny grabs the ball and we weighs it to Howard. No, it's to Wilson. Wilson Waddles today. Day grabs the ball and look at that fellow one. Run, Day, run. Day is crashing through the line. Look at him one, look at him one. It looks like he's off for a touchdown. He's 11 yards from the goal. And what's this? He's tackled. Day is thrown on the three yard line and he's knocked. Joey. Oh, that poor kid. Oh. Oh, my goodness. He's out cold. Look at him laying there. Day. Day, speak to me. Say something. Say something. A twerk at me. Get the license number. <laughs> oh, for crying out wild. Play, Phil. Here's an unusual dessert, friends, that's unusually delicious. It's called Hawaiian Sunburst, and a grander-looking, grander-tasting dessert never decorated a table. Picture a brilliant mold of rich red raspberry jello surrounded in a sunburst effect by juicy wedges of golden Hawaiian pineapple. Sounds mighty good, doesn't it? And nothing could be easier to make. Simply dissolve a package of jello imitation raspberry flavor in one and one-half cups of hot water. Then add one-fourth teaspoon of salt and one half cup of the juice from the canned pineapple slices. Chill in individual molds, and in serving, circle each mold with a wedge-shaped piece of canned sliced pineapple. Now, most grocers are featuring canned pineapple and raspberry jello all next week. So get them both tomorrow and treat the family to this swell, distinctive dessert. Just remember to enjoy this dessert at its best. Be sure to use jello, because only jello's new locked-in flavor Gives you all the flavor, always. This is the last number, I mean the last number of the seventh program in the current Jell-O series. And we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. I want to wish all of you a very happy Thanksgiving. Say, Mary, I'm having a big Thanksgiving dinner Thursday at my house. Would you like to join us? Who's coming? Well, there'll be Robert Taylor and Barbara Sandwick and Clark Gable and Carol Lombard, Mr. and Mrs. Henry Fonda, and the Fred McMurrays, and, uh, 
And maybe Moe Lee. Him, you're sure of. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, folks. You know how delicious, how downright good Jell-O is. Well, you'll feel just the same way about Jell-O puddings. Three luscious, creamy puddings that are made by the same people who make Jell-O. There's Jell-O butterscotch pudding, simply brimming over with the buttery brown sugar flavor of golden butterscotch. And just as smooth and rich as the homemade kind that Grandma used to make. Yet how easy and inexpensive it is. Tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, ask for Jell-O puddings in all three flavors. Chocolate, vanilla, and creamy golden butterscotch. Jell-O puddings are just like Grandma's, only more so. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O puddings, coming to you from the Presidio in San Francisco, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with the K-Sounds go rolling along. Never in all the 40 years or more that folks have been buying Jell-O has Jell-O tasted more delicious. And the reason? Jell-O's wonderful new locked-in flavor. By means of an exclusive Jell-O process, Jell-O's swell, tempting flavor is locked in to give you extra goodness, new delight, richer enjoyment. For Jell-O today is better than ever. Now that its tangy, tantalizing flavor is locked right into the tiny Jell-O particles, Jell-O offers you new high in pleasure. More than ever, its intriguing goodness brings to mind the grand, refreshing flavor of the juicy, ripe fruit itself. More than ever, Jell-O gives you real dessert delight. And all because of this new Jell-O process that locks in the magic of Jell-O's glorious flavor. You can prove for yourself that this delicious Jell-O flavor actually is locked in. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice there's no sweet, fruity odor, no telltale aroma to warn of escaping flavor. And then dissolve the jello and notice how its marvelous captive goodness comes pouring out in a rich gush of fragrance and flavor. So ask your grocer tomorrow for several packages of jello and discover for yourself how much better and richer jello is now that its famous flavor is locked in. Songs go rolling along, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, inasmuch as we are broadcasting from the U.S. Army post at the Presidio in San Francisco, and this being the birthday of George Washington, it is only fitting that we bring you a man who fought heroically for that great general at Valley Forge, Jack Benny! <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Jello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, that was the most ridiculous introduction I ever heard. Imagine saying that I fought at Valley Forge. Why, it's absurd. But Jack, you told me to mention your war record. I meant the World War. <laughs> the Battle of Valley Forge took place over 160 years ago. My goodness, that would make me older than Fred Allen. <laughs> Much. Now, wait a minute, Jack. Fred Allen is younger than you are, and you know it. What did you say, big boy? Uh, what did you say? I said Fred Allen is younger than you are That's a military secret And I'm going to tell the colonel on you <laughs> You heard him, fellas Allen younger than me I'd like to have muscles as hard as his arteries <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, Don, it's uh, nice being up here in Frisco As they don't say <laughs> Isn't it, huh? Ah, yes, Jack, it certainly is. And by the way, Don, as long as I'm paying everybody's expenses on this trip, uh, 
May I inquire where you're stopping? Oh, uh, the little woman and I have a lovely suite at the Fairmont Hotel. Uh, a suite, eh? That's, uh, that's several rooms, isn't it? Huh? Uh, yes. You see, Jack, I'm a pretty big man, and when I take my belt off at night, I spread out. <laughs> I don't care if you overflow like a volcano Get into one room <laughs> You don't need a suite But Jack, Peggy and I have a lot of friends here in town And we wanted a place where we could serve tea in the afternoon Oh, tea, eh? Well, from now on, brother, your friends can lip their Lipton's in the lobby <laughs> Get into one room hmm? All I say is what's good enough for me is good enough for my cat Well, perhaps you're right By the way, Jack, uh, where are you stopping? Who, me? Oh, um... Oh, Dennis and I have a beautiful room at Ye Ocean Spray Auto Court. <laughs> uh, over at, in Alameda. It's a lovely place. It's run by a retired ferry boat captain. Well. In fact, that's what it is, an old ferry boat. <laughs> uh, we're living in what was formerly the poop deck. <laughs> Of course, it's been redecorated, you know. Well, that sounds quite novel. Have you a private bath? Uh, what was that, Don? I said, have you a private bath? Well, there's a bolt on the door, if that's what you mean. <laughs> you, uh... You must uh, come over sometime, Don, huh? Ye Ocean Spray Auto Court. Is that right on the ocean front? Uh, no, it's not exactly on the ocean. It's very nice, though. Well, can you see the ocean? No, you, you can't actually see it, Don. But when the west wind is blowing over those mud flats, you just know it's there. <laughs> and if the breeze is, well, if it isn't Miss Livingston, uh, say hello to the soldiers, Mary. Hiya, boys. Let's hear some noise. Uh, you asked for it, and you got it. I can't understand it, Mary, but every time we entertain the soldiers, you get a much bigger reception than I do. Why is that? I guess my legs are prettier than yours, huh, cutie? <laughs> oh, I don't know about that, young lady. Now, I'll leave it to any... Oh, roll down your pants. Who cares? <laughs> well, you started it. By the way, Mary, as long as you're here, I want to settle something right now in front of Don Wilson and all the fellas here. Uh, who is older, Fred Allen or me? I don't see any insurance men chasing either one of you. I can still get fire and theft, Smarty. <laughs> and anyhow, just because I have a few gray hairs doesn't mean I'm an old dodo. Doesn't mean you're cutting teeth, either. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Mary, because it so happens that I have a brand new tooth coming in. So there. Where's it coming in from, Sears and Robux? <laughs> No, it's not coming in from Sears and Roebuck. They don't even handle them. Oh, you checked on it, eh? <laughs> okay. Now, let me tell you something else. The next one that mentions Fred Allen has to pay his own expenses in San Francisco. By the way, Mary, uh, where are you stopping? Oh, I have a lovely suite at the Sir Francis Drake. Hmm. Listen, Mary, you could very well have taken one room instead of two. I've got three. Yikes! <laughs> What do you need three rooms for? Well, I've got a lot of friends in town, and I have to have a place where I can serve tea in the afternoon. Tea, tea. Everybody giving tea parties. Funny thing, I'm never invited. But Jack, how can we reach you? Yeah, you haven't even got a telephone on that broken-down ferry boat. You could wigwag, sister. <laughs> you could wigwag. You got the wig. How could we wag it? <laughs> I mean with flag. You may laugh at ye ocean spray auto court, Mary, but it's lovely there, isn't it, Dennis? I said it's lovely there, isn't it, Dennis? Do you mind if I take a bow first, Mr. Benny? No, no, go right ahead. <laughs> yes, lovely there. What? Oh, oh, you mean the auto court, yes. Yes, it is. Hmm, what a kid. Well, Dennis, this is your first trip to San Francisco, isn't it? I suppose you've been sightseeing and everything. I'll say. I went to Seal Rocks in Chinatown and Twin Peaks in Chinatown and Flyshacker Zoo in Chinatown and... What do you keep going back to Chinatown for? I left my hat there someplace. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, well, I, I hope you find it. Me too. Am I sick of chop suey? <laughs> Dennis, you, you don't have to eat every time you go there. Uh, what else did you do, Dennis? Well, now, let's see. Oh, yes, last night I went over to Treasure Island to see the World's Fair. <laughs> The, the World's Fair. Save your money, brother. It ain't much. <laughs> Dennis. Dennis, there isn't any World's Fair. It's been closed for two years. Gee, I could swear I saw a fan dancer. <laughs> a fan dancer. You know, kid, I'd give $1,000 for your imagination. At your age, it's a bargain. <laughs> Oh, sure. Well, Dennis, now that you're here, I think the boys would like to have you do a song. Uh, what's it going to be? I'm going to sing a brand new number called Private Buckaroo. Good. Let's have it, kid. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? On behalf of the officers and the men of the Presidio, I would like to present you with this regulation army uniform. Say, thanks. But it's awfully big for me. It, it's so large. Well, we thought you might want a place where you could serve tea in the afternoon. <laughs> Get a load of his head, fellas. There's a G.I. haircut if I ever saw it. <laughs> a G.I. means government issue, folks. Sing, Dennis. Some cowboy in the West, he was known as Slim. Now in the army, they've a new name for him. Private Buckaroo. We out on a range that he's a stranger to. Dreams he hears the cattle lowing, but it's just the bugle blowing. Blue private buckaroo. There in company Q, away from corrals and all the pals he knew. Won't be having any hand in this year's roping, this year's branding. Blue private buckaroo. Each night beneath the evening star, he strums on his old guitar. Till it's get along, buckaroo, you're in the arms. Sad and blue But there's nothing he's afraid of Got the stuff a cowboy's made of Through the rules So saddle up, lad, there's a roundup of a bear Get your lariat ready You've some two-legged doggies to snare. And we'll keep the campfires burning till the day that you're returning. Private Buckaroo sung for the first time on the air by Dennis Day. Swell, Dennis. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Say, Mr. Benny. What is it, kid? We sure had a lot of excitement at the Streets of Paris Cafe the other night, didn't we? 
Yes, yes. And now, ladies and gentlemen... But why did they throw you out? You didn't do anything. Uh, for, uh, forget it, kid, forget it. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Wait gen a minute. I want to know what happened at the streets of Paris the other night. Oh, there was a little argument, that's all. Dennis and I were out for an evening of fun, so we walked into this cafe with a couple of cute girls. Yeah, we followed them for miles. <laughs> We caught up with them at the bottom of the steps. <laughs> well, anyway, we, uh, we all went inside, and uh, Dennis, uh, Dennis asked for a glass of milk, and I ordered a lemon phosphate. At the streets of Paris? They sent out for us. <laughs> anyway, as we were sitting there with the girls, chatting and laughing, a couple of great big guys walked over to us, and one of them said, uh, what are you two punks doing with our girls? So Dennis jumped up and said, uh, you want to make something out of it? Yeah. <laughs> you little rascal. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, I was laying out on Mason Street. <laughs> it, could, it could happen to anybody. Say, whatever became of you that night, Dennis? Oh, the boys got a girl for me and we all went out. Oh, good, good, good. Hmm. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, fellas. Were you worried about me? Were you worried about me? There's the only marcelled ham I ever saw. <laughs> well, Phil, here we are in San Francisco. The old town's as peppy as ever, isn't it? Yes, sir, and I'm sure getting a kick out of broadcasting for the soldiers here at the press of Tidio. <laughs> That's Presidio. Presidio. All right, how far did I miss it? <laughs> that's right, for you, that's a bullseye. <laughs> By the way, Phil, I'm doing a little checking up around here. Uh, where are you stopping in time? <laughs> well, I got a suite over at the Palace Hotel. You got a what? Well, here we go again. <laughs> you can sing that, sister. Listen, Harris, uh... Harris, what's the idea of getting a suite? Well, I got a lot of friends in town, and I need a place where I, I can... I know, I know, a place where you can serve tea. Tea? What's that? <laughs> oh, uh, pardon me, you wouldn't know. Uh, a tea, Phil, is a beverage that you can serve up in your room all afternoon, and no furniture will be broken. <laughs> Catch on? They took all the furniture out of my room, wise guy. <laughs> Oh, yeah, just a carpet and a bucket of ice. That's Harris, huh? <laughs> hey, fellas, you want to hear something? This is the town where I started out 15 years ago on my musical career, in the uh, old Rose Room at the St. Francis Hotel. At the Rose Room, huh? Yeah, and the only guy that's still with me is Frank Remley, my guitar player. No kidding. How come Frankie's been with you so long? Look, Jackson, if I had on you what he's got on me, I'd be the star of this show. <laughs> Oh, ho, I always thought that guitar had a dictaphone in it. I... <laughs> well, let's have a band number, Phil, and show the boys here how you've improved in 15 years. Okay, Jackson. Wait a minute. Nobody's playing anything until I read my poem. Mary, what is this? Every time we visit a camp, you have to write a poem. That's right. Well, you're not going to read one today. I forbid it. Colonel Montanu said I could. Oh, he did, eh? Listen, Mary, who's running this post? Me or the... Uh-oh, what am I saying? <laughs> Gosh. Boy, are you gonna peel potatoes? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mary, if the Colonel wants to hear your poem, I'm only too happy to oblige him. Uh, uh, what's the title of it? I Like a Soldier. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she, uh, she means I Like a Soldier Boy. I know what I mean. Okay. <laughs> okay, read, uh, read your poem. <clears throat> I love soldiers, they're so gay, and they're charming, I might say. So give me a soldier any day, or any night, if he can get away. <laughs> hey, not bad. Continue. I went dancing at the Y, and I saw a handsome guy. I dropped my hanky trimmed with lace. He picked it up and wiped his face. <laughs> you, uh, you mean he passed you by? He passed me by without a glance. So I spoke to him and took a chance. Say, buddy, would you like to dance? 
I'd love to, miss, but I ripped my shirt. <laughs> but you ripped it? Yes. <laughs> Mary, that doesn't rhyme. <laughs> it rhymed at rehearsal. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's, um, that's a very good poem, Mary. Now, Phil, let's have a... Oh, wait a minute. Last verse, all out. Good. <laughs> if you listeners all could see these young men in front of me, you'd buy some bonds and buy some more and win the war with a great big score. The end. Well, Mary... Mary, that last verse really made sense, and I'm sure everybody will dig down and get those defense bonds. And incidentally, ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to announce that our program this evening is being short-waved by radio station KGEI to Alaska, Hawaii, Australia, New Zealand, to the United States Fleet in the Pacific, to the American Expeditionary Force in Java, to General MacArthur and his men, and I do mean men, in the Philippines... Also, also to the American volunteer flyers guarding the Burma Road. So go ahead with your number, Phil, and I don't have to tell you to play loud. You will anyway. you played by Phil Harris and his Golden Gate Orchestra. Golden meaning golden notes pour forth from their instruments, and gate meaning they may soon get same. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... Well, that's a fine thing to say after what we went through to get up here. <coughs> what do you mean? Well, me and the boys work at the Biltmore Bowl in Los Angeles. We worked there last night until 2 a.m., and then tired and weary, we got on a bus and started out for San Francisco. <laughs> Uh-huh. And 473 miles of tough driving across deserts and mountains. And then we went through rain and storm, little knowing what dangers lurked ahead of us. Danger? And when we arrived this morning hungry and thirsty and disheveled, our first thought was to rush over here and rehearse three hours for this broadcast. Gee. Can you imagine all that trouble just for one lousy number? <laughs> Yeah, don't seem right. Hungry, thirsty, and disheveled. Well, that's loyalty for you. Yeah, remind me, Phil, when we get back to Hollywood, I'll give the boys a bonus. They do look disheveled. Those guys look disheveled every week. <laughs> Come to think of it, they're thirsty every week, too. Forget that bonus, Phil. <laughs> and now, folks... You mean to say you're really going to give the hand out a bonus? Yes, I was going to hand out a bonus. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You wouldn't give a dog us a bonus. <laughs> Mary, one more crack is like that is, and a floor walker at the May Company will be your new straight man. <laughs> I wish you'd go to Sausalito. All right, Don, I wish Mary would go to Sausalito. Oh, Jack, this is the most ridiculous one yet. Don, I wish Mary would go to Sausalito. It's a nice little town across the bay. I know where it is, and I'm not going to do that silly commercial. Don, I'm warning you, Sausalito. Oh, very well. Ladies and gentlemen, the next time you... No, no, I won't do it. Don Sausalito. Oh, all right. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the next time you go to your neighborhood grocer, why don't you ask him for a package of Jell-O? Jell-O is economical. In fact, you never saw some marvelous value for Sausalita sum of money. There you are. Now get this clever switch, folks. Don, if Mary doesn't feel like going to Sausalito, she can go to Berkeley. This I won't do. Don, Mary can go to Berkeley. You can go to... Don! <laughs> Berkeley. Now go ahead. Oh, I'm hooked, I guess. <laughs> Try Jell-O, folks. You will enjoy every one of those delicious flavors. Straw Berkeley, Raz Berkeley, <laughs> cherry, orange, lemon, and lime Berkeley. <laughs> lime Berkeley, you ruined it. You ruined the cleverest commercial I ever wrote. I can't understand it. I can't understand it. You can't understand what? All these men under arms, and you haven't been shot yet. <laughs> What are you talking about? It was a brilliant piece of writing, wasn't it, Phil? Well, to tell you the truth, Jackson, I thought it was pretty corny. Oh, you did, eh? What'd you think of it, Dennis? Well, personally, I thought it was very. <laughs> very what? You'll slug me. <laughs> I will not. Hey, maybe you fellas didn't get the gag. Now, look. Sausalito is a pun for such a little. So, naturally, when Don said that... Wait a minute, I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. What do you want, Rochester? Say, boss, I think you ought to check into a hotel tonight. Why, what's the matter? You know that old ferry boat we've been living on? Yes. Well, the tide came in and it went out. <laughs> what? Why, that's impossible. That boat was on dry land. It had roses growing around the door. The barracuda's nibbled on them now. <laughs> well, I guess there's nothing we can do about it. I'll tell you what, Rochester. Bring my trunk and suitcases over here, and I'll go to a hotel tonight. Uh-oh. What are you oh oh about? Don't tell me you left my trunk and everything in the boat. Don't tell me I didn't. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, boss, at the time was the unexpected launching. <laughs> yes. Due to no women and children, I got off first. <laughs> Imagine leaving my trunk and all my stuff on the boat. I bet you even left my washing hanging up on the mat. Yeah, you ought to see it, boss. The sun shining through your shorts is a vision of sheer beauty. <laughs> the heck with the beauty, I want my clothes. Now, let's see, there's no rowboat around there. I got it. Rochester, can you swim? What's that, boss? I said, can you swim? No, sir. You can, too. Not with a trunk on my back. I can read your mind. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Rochester. I'll be through here pretty soon. Then when we, uh, we can rent a motorboat and go out and get it. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? After we get all straightened out, can I have the night off? Why, where are you going? Well, I got some friends in Oakland, and they invited me over for tea. Tea? Yeah, only we're going to break up the furniture. <laughs> I thought so. Well, all right, if we get through early enough. So long. So long, boss. Can you imagine anything like that? What's the matter, Mr. Benny? You know that ferry boat you and I were living on? Yeah. Well, your blue third suit will be passing the Bay Bridge any minute now. Play, Phil. And now for a new Jell-O dessert that's really swell. Something different and something mighty delicious, too. It's a tempting new treat called Terry Cubes with Pineapple, a brilliant combination of golden canned pineapple and rich crimson Jell-O cherry Jell-O. Here's a clever Jell-O re receipt that is simply unrivaled for lovely shimmering color and delightful flavor. Yet it's one of the easiest desserts you ever made. All you have to do is dissolve a package of Jell-O imitation flavor and one pint of hot water and hot pineapple juice. Turn into a loaf pan and chill until firm. Then cut into cubes and pile in sherbet glasses along with three slices of canned pineapple diced. The result will be a grand treat, a dessert that the whole family will love. Golden nuggets of canned pineapple deliciously blended with tiny glistening cubes of bright red cherry jello. So get a package of cherry jello tomorrow and make up this gay, colorful treat. Just remember when you buy to be sure to get genuine jello because jello's locked in flavor gives you extra richness. We're a little late, so good night, folks.
Friends, every time you order Jell-O from your grocer, ask him for Jell-O puddings in all three flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. There's Jell-O vanilla pudding, gloriously creamy and full of rich homemade flavor that makes every spoonful a mellow delight. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles. Use Seal Coat Liquid Nail Protector. Seal Coat protects nails and aid to longer nails. Seal Coat protects polish from chips and mars. Seal Coat adds luster to polish. 25 cents. Seal Coat your nails today and every day. J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with one on the house. The biggest dessert news in years. That's what folks everywhere are calling Jell-O's new locked-in flavor. Never has Jell-O tasted so rich and delicious. Today, it's even better than ever, and all because of a wonderful new process that locks in all of Jell-O's grand flavor, keeps it from fading, keeps it at full strength till the moment you use it. Today, Jell-O's vivid original goodness is locked right into the tiny Jell-O particles where time can't touch it. It's protected against fading or changing in any way, and it comes out of the package just as rich and full-flavored as it went in. Prove it for yourself. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice that there's no heavy, fruity aroma, no sign of escaping flavor. But when you dissolve the Jell-O, you unlock its captive goodness, and out it pours for your pleasure. To order Jell-O tomorrow, look for the big red letters on the box, and be sure to get Jell-O. The flavor never goes away. We put it in, and it's there to stay. That was one on the house played by the orchestra. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to take you back three days and show you how Jack Benny entertained the gang on Thanksgiving. The time, 2 p.m. last Thursday. The scene, the kitchen of Jack's home in Beverly Hills, where we find Jack, Mary, and Rochester preparing the dinner. Take it away. Now, what else? Oh, yes. Uh, Rochester, hand me those little plates there, will you? Here you are, boss. Let's see. A black one for Phil, a green one for Alice. A black one for Don, a green one for Mrs. Wilson, a black one for Mary. Say, Jack, make mine a green one. I don't like ripe olives. <laughs> uh, all right, I'll switch you and Don. There. I'm hungry. I think I'll eat mine now. Drop that. <laughs> I don't want you to spoil your appetite. You know, we're having wild duck for our Thanksgiving dinner. No chip beef this year, eh? <laughs> Not unless we run short Rochester, uh, what are you putting in that dressing? I thought a dash of gin would snap it up a little <laughs> What? Who ever heard of putting gin in dressing? On Central Avenue, it's a must <laughs> Well, I don't want it in this dressing And put that gin back in the first aid kit <laughs> Oh, Mary, take a look in the oven and see how the ducks are coming along. Okay. Uh, what was that? They're not quite done yet. Now, look, that noise came from some live ducks I've got in the basement. These ducks here should be done by now. Uh, what time did we put them in the oven, Rochester? About 10 o'clock last night. Let's see, that's 16 hours. They're done all right. They sure look tender, don't they, Mary? Tender? The middle one looks like Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> what an imagination. Now, Rochester, take each duck and stuff the dressing in it. I ain't gonna touch old Humphrey. <laughs> Cut that out. Now, get busy and stuff those ducks. Okay, where's the shoehorn? You don't need a shoehorn. Now, let's see, a green olive for me, a black one for... Say, Jack, why don't you give those olives a little company and put some celery on the place? 
Celery? Okay. Open the icebox and get some. I don't know the combination. <laughs> it's 45 right, 23 <laughs> back, and 10 right. That's it. Can I borrow your pencil, boss? Don't bother writing it down. I'm changing it tomorrow. <laughs> now, where was I? Oh, yes, a green one for me, a black one for Billy Getz. <laughs> that must be Dennis. Open the back door for him, Rochester. Yes, sir. Send that kid on an errand. He takes all day. Where'd he go, Jack? Over to Ronald Coleman's to borrow something. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You're always borrowing from Mr. Coleman. That works both ways, Mary. Within the last year, he's borrowed over a dozen of my best eggs. Your eggs? Yes. His chickens laid them in your garage. <laughs> that doesn't make any difference. That's the same thing as the grapefruit near the fence. What hangs over is mine. Even Coleman's lawyer admits that. <laughs> well, don't ever hang your head over the fence or Coleman will pick your toupee. Ha, 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 I'm screaming. Here's the punch bowl you wanted, Mr. Benny. What is that? Here's the punch bowl you wanted. Thanks, kid. And what have you got in that bag? Some corn. Mr. Coleman says please feed it to his chickens. <laughs> I've been feeding him plenty. Now, Dennis, the gang will be here pretty soon, so rub some of this burnt cork on your face. Okay. Burnt cork? What's that for? Uh, Dennis is going to help serve dinner tonight. It's an emergency. I hired Rochester's brother, and he didn't show up. Uh, what happened to him, Rochester? I was wrong, boss. He got 60 days instead of 30. <laughs> oh, well, I can use him New Year's Eve. Now, Dennis, uh, Rochester will be busy here in the kitchen, so it'll be your job to... Whoop, there's the front door, and here's your chance to practice. <clears throat> See who's at the door, Sylvester. I'm going, Mr. Benny. I'm going. <laughs> Say, that's all right. That boy does the worst blackface I ever heard. Not so easy. I'd like to hear you do Irish sometime. <laughs> Come on, Mary. We'll sit in the music room until the gang gets here. A jukebox and an old fiddle, and you call it a music room. <laughs> Don't run down that jukebox, Mary. And incidentally, I wish you'd stop playing it with lifesavers. <laughs> got it all sticky. Mr. and Mrs. Wilson are here, Master Colonel Benny. Don't overdo it. <laughs> well, hello, Don, Peggy. Welcome to the Chateau Benny. Oh, hello, Jack. Hello, 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 Mary. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Well, you're looking fine, Peggy. Uh, take Mrs. Wilson's coat, Sylvester. Yeah, the yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> I wish he'd hold it down a little. Huh? Well, two servants tonight. You're kind of putting on the dog, eh, Jack? Well, it's a big party. Gee, Peggy, I'm sure glad you and Don were able to come to dinner today. Yes, I am, too. Don's been gaining weight again, and I'm so happy he's someplace where he can't overeat. <laughs> <laughs> a good, good. <laughs> Well, I hate to disappoint you, Peggy, but there's going to be plenty of food on that table. Yes, and I love chipped beef. We're having wild duck. Now, let's have a little music while we're waiting. Mary, uh, put a nickel in the jukebox. I've only got one. I'm saving it for the apple machine. <laughs> All right, I'll put one in. That is, if I've, um, if I've, uh... Here's a nickel, Jack. Thanks. Uh, say, here's one of Phil's records, uh, Chattanooga Choo Choo. <laughs> he uh, sings the chorus on this one. Very cute, too. Wait till you hear it. Pardon me, boy, is that the Chattanooga Choo Choo? Track 29, then you can give me a shine. I can afford to board a Chattanooga Choo Choo. I've got my fare and just an inkling to spare. You leave old Pennsylvania Station about a quarter to four. Read the magazine, the menu you're in Baltimore. Dinner on the diner, nothing could be finer than to have your ham and eggs in Carolina. When you hear the whistle blow an eighth of the bar, then you know the Tennessee is not very far. Hurry up and call in, gotta get a rolling. Hoo hoo, Chattanooga, there you are. There's gonna be a certain party at the station Satin and late. I used to call funny things She's gonna cry 
until I tell her that'll never wrong. Ooh, Chattanooga choo-choo, won't you choo-choo me home? There's gonna be a certain party at the station, sad, sad, satin and lace. I used to call my bunny, honey, funny face. She's gonna cry until I tell her that I'll never roam. So Chattanooga choo-choo, hooey, hooey. Chattanooga choo-choo, hooey, hooey. Chattanooga choo-choo, won't you choo-choo me home? Isn't Phil a ham? He even puts applause on the record. <laughs> that was a good number, though. Yes, indeed. Uh, by the way, Peggy, I don't believe you've been in my music room before, have you? No, I haven't, Jack. And you've got some lovely old pieces here. Who furnished it? Harry Talk Shop. <laughs> I only got the melodeon there. You know, Peggy, if you look around, you can get some of the... Uh-oh, here comes your border. Yeah. I wonder what happened to him. His arm's in a sling. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Billingsley. Hello, Mr. Benny. Having company for dinner, I see. <laughs> yes, yes, the others will be here pretty soon. Uh, won't you have a seat? Oh, thanks. I never touch them. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. uh, by the way, Mr. Billingsley, I noticed your arm's in a sling. Uh, how did you happen to break it? I was putting on my long underwear this morning, and I fell off the ladder. <laughs> Oh, well, why do you have to climb a ladder to put on your underwear? When I say long, I mean long. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Uh, won't you join us for dinner, Mr. Billingsley? We're having wild duck. No, I'll have a glass of dressing later. Good night. <laughs> hmm. It's getting more eccentric every day. But who else would pay me $800 a week for room and board? <laughs> An amazing character, you know. Mr. Benny, can I speak to you confidentially? It's very important. Oh, now what? Excuse me, folks. What is it, Rochester? Boss, those ducks ain't never gonna get tender. Why, what happened? I just stuck a fork in one of them and it kicked gravy all over me. <laughs> now, that's ridiculous. It probably slid in the pan. That's all. You may be right, boss, but I don't think it would hurt to shoot him just once more. <laughs> don't you dare. I shot those ducks. All you've got to do is cook them. I want dinner served as soon as Mr. and Mrs. Harris arrive. But, boss... Now, get back to the kitchen. dum beam bum bum ba beam ba bum Dum -de -dum -dum -de -dum -de -dum -dum. Oh, sorry, folks. What's the matter, Jack? Oh, Rochester's having a little trouble with the ducks. It seems... <laughs> uh. Well, everything will be all right now. <laughs> yes, sir. Jack, what was that noise? It sounded like a gunshot. How do I know? Well, folks, just as soon as every... There's someone at the door, Sylvester. Sylvester, answer the door. That's dough, boss. All right, answer the dough. <laughs> and don't shuffle, just walk. Say, Don, would you like a cocktail before dinner? Eh, Don? Definitely no. Hmm, well, <laughs> I can see who wears the pants in that family. With Don's, there's room for both of them. You said it. <laughs> Announcing Mr. and Mrs. Phil Harris. Phil! Hiya, Jackson. And Alice. 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 Hello, Alice. Hello, Alice. Phil. Hello, Alice. Well, well, Alice, I'm sure happy you were able to come to dinner. Oh, I wouldn't have missed it for anything, Jackson. Jackson. <laughs> she calls me Jackson. <laughs> you know everybody here, don't you, Alice? Hello, Alice. Oh, why, Peggy, I haven't seen you since our trip to New York. And Alice, uh, you know Mary Livingston, huh? Oh, well, of course I do. Hello, Mary. So nice seeing you again. Hello. <laughs> Hello? That's a fine greeting. Who cares how many fan clubs she's got? 
Mary. Don't pay any attention to her, Alice. You see, Mary is always jealous of any girl that shines up to me. Well, who's shining up to you? <laughs> well, I mean that you... I mean... Explain that, Jackson! <laughs> don't get excited, Phil. Now, look, fellas, let's not have a brawl. I don't want duck stains all over the furniture. <laughs> Well, well, this is the uh, first time you've ever been to my house, isn't it, Alice? Yes, and I, I think it's furnished in very good taste. What did you mean, Phil, I should wear my old clothes? <laughs> Why, Phil, you little rascal. Uh, say, Mary, call up Luella Parsons and tell her Alice Faye is visiting me. She'll never believe it. She will, too. And call Harrison Carroll. Say, Phil, I want to congratulate you on your performance last night and the courtship of Miles Standing. Yeah, it's the best play our night school ever put on, Don. <laughs> oh, yes, Phil, you were excellent as Priscilla. But as long as you were playing the part of a girl, why didn't you shave before you went out on the stage? I didn't want people to think I was on the level. <laughs> well, it spoiled it a little for me. Uh, by the way, Phil... Uh, use the ashtray, Peggy. These rugs are expensive. Uh, by the way, Phil... That's a girl. Uh, by, uh, uh, by the way, Phil... Uh, uh, did you... <laughs> Phil, did you, uh, did you get those flowers I sent you before the performance? Oh, yeah, thanks for the Christmas anthemums. <laughs> Christmas anthemums? Phil, I told you last night it's one word, chrysanthemum. Oh, lay off, honey. I don't want no lecture on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Behave yourself, Phil, or I won't read that book to you anymore. Oh, what book are you reading to him, Alice? Oh, you know, Jack. A is for apple, so round and red. <laughs> B is for butter. You spread it on bread. What? Are you kidding? C is for crackers. You eat them in bed. I know them all. <laughs> See, you'll... You'll be up to the Rover Boys pretty soon. <laughs> well, I don't know about you folks, but I'm going to have a cocktail before dinner. Oh, don't, Jack. You always act so silly. I do not. One cocktail and it's... Look, fellas, I'm a Spanish dancer. Oh. A Spanish dancer? By that time, he's wearing a lampshade. Well, someone's got to put a little life in the parties around this town. Oh, Sylvester! Yeah, the, yeah, the boss! Hmm. Go out in the kitchen and tell Rochester we're ready for dinner. I have a gwine. Hold that barn! Lift that bed! Oh, shut up! <laughs> well, Alice, I hope you're good and hungry. I'm on a diet myself. You see, uh, I have to be on account of the new picture I'm making. I knew he'd get around to that. Quiet. You see, I'm working opposite Carol Lombard, and I must look my best. Well, Jack, I've seen you in pictures before, and as I recall, you always look very nice. Yes, I imagine I do, but of course, I look much younger on the screen. Oh, much, much, much. <laughs> Mary. You know, Alice, now that we're both at 20th Century Fox, maybe you and I will be working together soon. <laughs> Who knows? I think we'd make a swell team. Yes, you with your youth and beauty and <laughs> me with my suave, debonair charm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're right, Phil. He is hammy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Alice, the next time I see Mr. Zanuck... Dinner is served, folks. Walk. Do not run to the dining room. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Oh, 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 this way. Oh, this way, everybody. Betty, now, Don, up. you take Alice, Phil, you take Peggy, and Mary... Oh, Mary, call up Hedda Hopper and Jimmy Starr and Herb Stein. Tell them that Alice Faye's having dinner with me today. Okay. And call Sidney Skalski, too. Skalski? Yes. Who's going to boost him up to the telephone? <laughs> He's got a ladder like Billingsley. All right, everybody, grab your seats. And take your time now. There's plenty for all. Come on, come on. We're all Hmm, boy, what a dinner. Say, this dressing is delicious, Jack. I'm glad you like it. Oh, Rochester, serve Mrs. Harris some more duck. Will you have another piece of duck, Alice? No, thanks. I'm still chewing on my first piece. <laughs> well, you've got beautiful teeth. Use them. <laughs> I, uh, I think the duck is very tasty, don't you, Mary? Yeah, but the next time you go out shooting, be more careful. Mine's full of buckshot. Mary, that's what that bowl is for. Dump the buckshot in a bowl. 
Oh. That's it. Personally, I think this is the finest meal that Pass I... me that bowl, will you, Mary? Here you are, Phil. Thanks. <laughs> well, I really banged away at that one, didn't I? But I still say this is a lovely dinner. Yeah, everything from soup to lead. Never mind, and have another cranberry. One cranberry? You're supposed to have cranberry sauce. Well, squash it. Are you helpless? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> What's the matter with you, anyway? Oh, Rochester. Yes, boy? Uh, bring me a sharper knife. I got Humphrey. <laughs> Say, Alice. Alice, I have a real treat for you. After dinner, I'll take you downstairs and show you Carmichael, my polar bear. Oh, that's swell. I love animals. You do? Have you got any pets, Alice? Oh, just Phil, my little reformed wolf. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. <laughs> yes, sir. Some more, uh, some more dressing, Don? No, thanks. By the way, Jack, where's Dennis? Didn't you invite him to dinner? Yes, I wonder what happened to the kid. Me too. <laughs> Mary, don't give it away. Oh, Sylvester, have we heard from Mr. Day? Yeah, the he phoned and left word that he was having dinner with Miss Hetty Lamar. Hetty Lamar? <laughs> that boy sure gets around, don't he? <laughs> All right, Sylvester, stop leaning on the table and get busy. Enjoying the food, Peggy? Oh, it's fine, Jack. And the dressing's delicious. What's in it? I really don't know. Oh, Rochester? Yes, boss? What's in this dressing? Woody! <laughs> He's like all good chefs, Peggy. Just won't give away his secrets. <laughs> Get another bowl, Rochester. This one's full. <laughs> Everything all right, Alice? Mm-hmm. Oh, I've never been to such a novel dinner party. Imagine, Phil, I got a prize in my dressing. A prize? Uh-huh. Look, a shoehorn. <laughs> <laughs> That is a novelty, isn't it? I got a red cross button in mine. <laughs> well, hand it over. I joined yesterday. That reminds me everybody should, especially this year. Rochester, I think we'll have our dessert and coffee in the music room. Okay, boy. That is, if everybody's had enough duck. Well, come on. Come on. Let's go in the music room. Uh, what are we having for dessert, Jack? What do you think? I'll bet a thousand dollars it's jello with that new locked in flavor. You win, Don. The flavor never goes away. They, they put, put it in and it's there to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Say, let's have some entertainment while we're waiting for the coffee. Yeah, what do we do? Well, we can. Oh, I know. Hey, look at me, fellas. Jack, yeah, take that bowl of fruit off your head. You don't look anything like Carmen Miranda. <laughs> well, somebody's got to entertain. Well, what about Alice singing a song for us? Yeah, what about it, Alice? Come on, Alice. Yeah. Why don't you sing a song Come on. Come on. You hear that, Alice? Will you sing for us? Uh, wait till I finish chewing this duck, huh? All right. Now, tell you what. If you sing, I'll accompany you on the violin. No, 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 Jackson. No, not that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Come on, Alice. Uh, what's that song? <laughs> Alice, what's that song you did in your new picture, Weekend in Havana? Oh, you mean Tropical Magic? Yeah, that's it. You sing Tropical Magic, and I'll pull rabbits out of a hat. <laughs> Quiet, everybody. Alice is going to sing. <laughs> Playing 
tropical magic You'll have me saying Adios to my heart Anyway, folks, that's just about what happened to Jack's house last Thursday. Alice sang her song, and then we all played games and had a swell time. And just as we were leaving, we could hear Rochester calling Jack. Benny! Mr. Benny! What is it, Rochester? What do I do with all this dump that's left over? Well, we can have it tomorrow night. Uh, make... What about the mashed potatoes and all this... Be very tasty. Okay, uh... Well, make a pie out of them. Cranberry pie is delicious, you know. Okay. Oh, say, boss! What? I think we ought to turn this buckshot over to the government for national defense. <laughs> That's a very good idea. It's early yet, so I'm going out to see a movie. Is that still playing around? I don't mean Charlie's aunt. <laughs> see you later. Good night, boss. Good night, Rochester. <laughs> One of Mary Livingston's favorite Jell-O desserts is a swell treat called peach and banana mold. Because I think you like it too, I'm going to pass it right along. It's an easy recipe to remember. Its main ingredients are canned sliced peaches, sliced bananas, and lime Jell-O. And you combine them like this. Make up one package of lime Jell-O as you usually do. Next, arrange one half cup of canned sliced peaches on the bottom of the mold and pour the Jell-O over them. Then slice one banana into the jello and chill until firm. When you unmold it, you'll have a beautiful three-layer dessert. Golden peach slices on top, sliced bananas embedded on the bottom, and in between them and surrounding them, clear, glistening emerald lime jello. Many grocers are featuring canned sliced peaches and lime jello all next week. Get both and make up this grand treat. Just be sure when you buy to ask for jello. Because Jell-O's new locked-in flavor gives you all the flavor, always. This is the last number of the eighth program in the current Jell-O series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday at the same time. Well, Alice, it was awfully sweet of you to come over tonight and show the folks what happened last Thursday, and your song was really wonderful. Oh, thanks, Jackson. Jackson. She called me Jackson. Good night, folks. Alice Clay appeared on our program tonight for courtesy of 20th Century Fox Pictures. In gelatin desserts, it's Jell-O. In puddings, it's Jell-O pudding. And every well-stocked pantry should include them both. Jell-O puddings are rich, luscious desserts that you make with milk. And they come in three popular flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. Jell-O chocolate pudding is a pudding that even Grandma would be proud to make. It has a smooth, creamy, homemade goodness all its own. A mellow chocolate flavor developed exclusively for Jell-O puddings by the famous Walter Baker chocolate people. Tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, ask for Jell-O puddings. They're just like Grandma's, only more so.
This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI, Los Angeles. J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny. With Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Free For All. Here, there, and everywhere, folks are praising Jell-O's wonderful new locked-in flavor. They're finding that Jell-O's six delicious flavors are now more delicious than ever, thanks to Jell-O's new process of locking the flavor right into the tiny Jell-O particles. Up until now, gelatin desserts lost flavor all the time they spent in the package. Often by the time you used them, you found their flavor had faded and become flat. And sometimes the desserts you made with them just missed being as good as you had expected. But today, Jell-O has changed all that. No more fading flavor. Every last bit of Jell-O's original richness is locked into Jell-O's crystal-like particles for keeps. And time can't touch it, can't steal it, any of it away. Your next package of Jell-O will prove it. Just open the package. Notice there's no heavy fruity aroma. No sign of escaping flavor. But the instant you dissolve the Jell-O, you unlock its captive flavor, and out it rushes in all its full, thrilling goodness. Order several packages of Jell-O tomorrow. The flavor never goes away. We put it in and it's there to stay. played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you our versatile master of ceremonies who started work this week on a new motion picture. Yes, sir. A man who is as much at home in front of a camera as he is before a microphone. Like you said, I'm versatile. Say. (laughs) A man who has a profile like John Barrymore, and have you seen him lately? Jack Benny. Uh, Jello again, this is Jack Benny talking And Chubby, uh, you can rip me uh, You can rip me about it all you want to But it sure feels good to be making a picture again I tell you, Don, that's really my racket Well, Jack, I must admit that I do enjoy you on the screen immensely I really got a big kick out of your last picture uh, You know, the the one you made with Fred Allen With Allen? Uh, Wait a minute, that wasn't my last one, Don See, I made Charlie's aunt after that Remember when I was dressed like a lady? Oh, yes. Well, to tell you the truth, Jack, I didn't get to see that one. You didn't see Charlie's aunt? (laughs) Hmm. No, I meant to, but somehow I just didn't get around to it. By the way, Jack, who's the director of your current movie? Is it someone you've had before or somebody new? Hmm. Didn't get around to it, eh? (laughs) Now, look, Don... (laughs) I hesitate bringing it up right now, but you've been on this program eight years, and and you know our rule about not seeing my pictures. (laughs) So, uh, so what about it? Oh, yes, Jack, I forgot. Here you are. Thanks. Now, I, um, <clears throat> I, uh, I hate, uh, <laughs> I hate to, uh, I hate to do this, Don, but if I make an exception of you, they'll all expect it. You know, rules is rules. Anyway, answering your question, oh, here's your change, Don. Thanks. <laughs> um, answering your question, the director of my latest screen vehicle is none other than Lubitsch, Ernst Lubitsch. Lubitsch? Well, that's wonderful. That's a great break for you, Jack. It is? Why, certainly. You know, there's a saying in Hollywood that Lubitsch can even make a lamppost act. Don. <laughs> Don, any resemblance between me and a lamppost is purely coincidental. <laughs> I'm slim, yes, but that's all. 
Anyway, Don, as I was saying, it sure feels good to be in front of a camera again. Right back where I belong. Uh, what was that? Oh, hello, Mary. Hello. Uh, what was that you said? I was telling Don I'm very happy. I'm right back where I belong. Oh, selling suits, eh? <laughs> I mean pictures. I'm making a movie. Oh, that's right. You haven't sold a suit since you worked in your father's store in Waukegan. Of course. That's over 20 years ago. The one you're wearing held up nice. <laughs> Mary, one thing about my father's merchandise, it lasted and lasted. In fact, Dad used to have a slogan, buy this suit and you'll get sick of it. <laughs> we sold plenty of them that way. Well, I'll have to admit, Jack, that outfit you're wearing is very snappy. Certainly. How do you like the pants? Get a load of the cuffs. You look like puss in boots. <laughs> When my feet get cold, I roll them down. I can go along with a gag, sister. <laughs> and incidentally, Mary, instead of coming in here with those wisecracks, why don't you congratulate me on the start of my new picture? You know, uh, Cara Lombard is my leading lady. Oh, boss, come now. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Cara Lombard is my love interest. Lombard and Benny, hey, that's quite a team. Have you many romantic scenes with her, Jack? Yes, <laughs> lucky girl. Imagine. <laughs> so look, imagine I, I make love to her all day long, and then at six o'clock, she drives home to Gable. <laughs> <laughs> but say, that Gable is a pretty good leading uh, man himself. You know, he's no slouch. Oh, Jack, you're just as attractive to women as Clark Gable any day. Well, I wouldn't say that, Mary. That's sweet of you, but... Clark is a pretty handsome guy, you know. Oh, you're just being modest. You don't hear women talk about you like I do. Oh, now, Mary, stop, will you? I, I, I'll admit I'm not homely, but, uh, but uh, what, uh, what do the women say about me? You ask for it, brother. Never mind. <laughs> you, you always have to start something, don't you? Always. Say, Mr. Benny, I heard you talking before, and you think Carol Lombard is pretty good looking, don't you? Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello. Uh, <laughs> what was that you said? I forgot now. <laughs> what a brain. Dennis, you said something about Carol Lombard being very good looking. Oh, yes. Well, I go with a girl that's better looking than any movie star you ever saw. Oh, you go with a girl? She is. Well, say. What's her name, Dennis? Thelma Gray, Crestview 7071. <laughs> Oh, well, you, you didn't have to give me your telephone number. I might as well. You'll force it out of me later. <laughs> now, now, hold on, young man. When did I ever threaten you to get a girl's phone number? Remember in New York when you took me to the top of the Empire State Building? Never mind. And you held me over the edge by one leg? <laughs> I was just showing Al Smith how strong I was. <laughs> anyway, you're lucky you didn't go out with that girl. You've still got your watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, so much for your love life, kid. Now, uh, how about a song? Okay, I'm gonna sing Carry Me Back to the Lone Prairie and I dedicate it to the Palm Springs Vaqueros. Who cares, you little squealer? <laughs> go ahead with your song. Crestview 7071. <laughs> I must remember that. Hold it a minute. Answer the phone, Mary. Okay. Hello? Jello program, why aren't you listening to it? <laughs> Mary, find out who that is. Hello? Hello, this is Barton speaking. Belly Laugh Barton. Is Grandma there? <laughs> Just a second. It's for you, Jack. It's that kid you hired for a gag man. Oh, oh, Belly, huh? Oh, oh, hello, Belly. Uh, what's on your mind? Listen, <laughs> I've got a terrific gag you can pull on Phil Harris tonight. Is he there yet? No, no, what's the gag? Well, this afternoon I told him to ask you how many hairs on a monkey's face. Uh-huh. And when he asks you, you say, the next time you shave, count them. Oh, oh. Well, now, wait a minute, Belly. That's kind of an old gag, isn't it? Look, you know it and I know it, but the younger generation never heard of it. <laughs> well, uh, 
Well, maybe you're right, Belly. Are you sure, uh, are you sure Phil will ask me that? Yeah, and when you pull the answer, you'll never know what hit him. Yeah, he'll really burn. Thanks, kid. And listen, I'll call you up after the show, let you know how it went over. Uh, where can I reach you? Crestview 7071. <laughs> What? Hey, wait a minute, Belly! Hey, Belly! Hmm. Oh, well, that's a good gag he gave me anyway. The next time you shave, count them. I must remember that. Sing, Dennis. I can hardly wait. <laughs> I'm a roving cowboy Far away from home Far from the prairie Where I used to roam Where the doggies wander And the wind blows free Oh, my heart is yonder On the lone prairie Oh, carry me back to the lone prairie Where the coyotes howl and the winds blow free And when I die, you can bury me Neath a western sky on the lone prairie Give me back my saddle, give me back my gun, give me back that bronco that I used to run. Let me spread my blanket by a peaceful stream. Hear the cowboy sing. By the campfire's gleam Oh, carry me back To the lone prairie Where the coyotes howl And the wind blows free And when I die You can bear Carry back to the Lone Prairie sung by Dennis Day. And Dennis, I must say that your voice is improving every week. No kidding. Someday you'll be another Bing Crosby. All right, Don. Dennis has a voice like Bing Crosby. Thanks. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> All right, Don. Bing Crosby. Oh, Jack, this one is so ridiculous. <laughs> Don, go ahead. Why don't you do it yourself, you coward? I'm not the announcer. Now, go ahead, Don. Bing Crosby. Oh, all right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the next time you're in the mood for attempting an economical dessert, why don't you go a Crosby Street to your neighborhood grocer? <laughs> yes, yes. And Bing home a package of Jello. <laughs> there. See? There, there you are. Bing home Jello. Well, I haven't talked like that since I was three years old. <laughs> Oh, act your size, Willow. <laughs> that happens to be a very clever idea for a commercial. Did you think of it yourself, Mr. Benny? Who else? That's right, who else? <laughs> well, I like it. I think of that kind of stuff all the time. My mind runs that way. I wonder if your father can make a straitjacket to match those pants. <laughs> Mary, let me analyze it for you. In the first place, well, look who's here. I'm so glad you were able to make it tonight, Phil. Sorry I'm late, pal, but I was out in my car listening to the program. Oh, listen to the program, eh? Well, how is it? Jackson, you need me. <laughs> hmm. 
Well, um... Well, for your information, Phil, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, Benny need Harris like apple need worm. <laughs> and incidentally, that glint in my eye is Jimmy Dorsey. <laughs> You know, I heard him last night. Ah, oh, don't get excited, Jackson. It was only a rib. Uh-huh. Hey, what's all this ballyhoo about you making a new picture? That's right, Phil. I started working on it this week. Well, here, I ain't gonna see it. Thanks. <laughs> hmm. The picture isn't made yet, and already it's gross $10. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> But I, uh, I must tell Alexander Corder about that. Um, but I wouldn't jump to a conclusion, Phil. You see, Carol Lombard is in it, and Lubitsch is the director. Not Ernest Lubitsch. No, not Ernest. The name is Ernst. Ernst. <laughs> <laughs> Look at his pivot tooth go around. <laughs> Well, if it stops on the red, you win. <laughs> you know, I can go along with a gag. <laughs> Believe me. Say, Mr. Benny. Yeah? Is that the same Mr. Lubitsch that directed Marlene Dietrich and Margaret Sullivan and Maurice Chevalier? Yes, sir. And Claudette Colbert and Gary Cooper and Greta Garbo? <laughs> yep. And now he's directing me. Is he slipping? No. <laughs> No, he's not slipping. The trouble with this gang, you're all too close to me. You don't realize I'm a good actor. Say, Jackson, how'd you ever land a big director like that? You mean Lubitsch? Jack held him over the Empire State Building until he signed the contract. <laughs> oh, stop. I hear you talk. You think I was the strongest guy in the world. Now, let's cut out this nonsense and go on with the program. Let's have a number, Phil, before Miss Livingston dreams up something else. All right, what do you want to hear? Music, but I'll take what I can get. <laughs> No. <laughs> now go ahead Okay Oh, by the way, Jackson I want to ask you something Yeah? Yeah, what is it? How many hairs on a monkey's face? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Phil Oh, my goodness I forgot the answer <laughs> Mary, Mary Get me belly laugh on the phone quick The number is Crestview 7071 You didn't forget that, you wolf <laughs> Oh, never mind. It's too late to pull the gag now. Let's see. Phil is supposed to say to me how many hairs on a monkey's face. I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. Oh, what do you want? Boss, this is the last straw. Either you get rid of Mr. Billingsley or I'm going back home to Arabia. <laughs> Oh, don't get so excited. What's our border done now? Well, you know that suit of armor we got in the hall? Yes. And you know how it's holding that big spear? Yes. Well, I was waxing the floor in front of it just now, and the first thing I knew, I took off. <laughs> oh. Oh, Mr. Billingsley is in it, eh? What in the world is he doing in that suit of armor? This week, he's King Arthur. <laughs> King Arthur? Yeah, better come home early. He's going to hold court in the dining room tonight. Well, that's just silly. If you remember the legend, King Arthur's knights gathered at a round table. Our table is square. It's round now. He saw it on the corner. <laughs> well, this is your fault, Rochester. You know how eccentric Mr. Billingsley is. How did he ever get a hold of a saw? A friend sent it to him in a loaf of bread. <laughs> That table is a genuine antique. Save the corners, Rochester. I'll think of something. Now, look, I'll be home soon, so let Mr. Billingsley wear that suit of armor. What was that? What happened? King Arthur just fell off his horse. Horse? What horse? He's got a saddle on Carmichael. Oh, my goodness. Well, look, Rochester, I'll be home soon, so humor Billingsley. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? I finished making those Christmas cards for Mr. Lubitsch. 
All right. All right, hang up. He'll like him, boss. Right under the Santa Claus, I got his name in big silver letters. Ernest Lubitsch. That's Ernst Lubitsch. Ernst... Now do them over. How many T's in Ernst... <laughs> Just one, it sounds like more. <laughs> now, goodbye. Hmm, if you want anything done right, you gotta do it yourself. All right, Phil, let's have your band number. Okay. Wait a minute. Answering your question, Phil, the next time you shave, count them. Ha <laughs> ha, I knew I'd think of it. <laughs> That was Wham Bang Crash Zowie, <laughs> played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. <laughs> Phil, I've got to say one thing about your arrangements. You certainly take care of the brass section. Now, wait a minute, Jackson. I got three violins in the band, and they're playing all the time. Yeah, but who can hear them? <laughs> Another thing, two pianos. What do you got two piano players for? They're Siamese twins. <laughs> oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And now, ladies and gentlemen, gee, I didn't know that. The Siamese twins, eh? Didn't you see the three of us dancing at Charlie Foy's the other night? <laughs> yes, but I thought I was drunk. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... Yeah, I couldn't understand it. I only had ginger ale. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce that next Sunday, we want you all to listen in because we're going to present our annual drama of the gridiron. Yes, sir, we're all going to play football. We're really going to kick it around. We kick it around every Sunday. <laughs> Never mind. And I would also like to announce... Say, Jackson, uh, look, do you mind if I leave now? I've got a friend waiting for me out in the hall. What? Well, he just got in town a few days ago, and I'm having dinner with him. I'm sorry, Phil, but your friend can very well wait till the program's over. That's a fine way to treat Leo DeRocha. I don't care who... Leo DeRocha? You mean the manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers? Yeah, he's sitting right out in the hall. Well, what are you waiting for? Bring him in. Bring him in. Sure, a guest star for nothing. <laughs> Mary, I just want to say hello. I know him very well. Bring him in, Phil. Okay. So, Leo, Leo's in town, eh? Say, Mr. Benny, who's Leo DeRocha? I just told you, he's manager of them bums. <laughs> Don't you remember, Dennis? I bet you $5 Brooklyn would win the World Series. Oh, yes. How did that ever come out? <laughs> I'll tell you later, kid. Hmm. Well, fellas, here's that man. Well, come on in, Leo. Hiya, Jackson. Glad to see you. Hey, this is quite a surprise, Leo. I, I didn't think you'd get in town until next week. Uh, where are you staying? I'm living over at Georgie Raff's house. Oh, Raff's, eh? Well, uh, well, why didn't you come over to my place, Leo? You'd love it there. Quiet surroundings and... Only 10 minutes from Hollywood, and I've I got a 40-foot heated swimming pool. Now, I know. I got your folder. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, well, then what made you pick out Raft's place? Well, you don't understand, Jackson. I'm Georgie's guest. I'm living there for nothing. Oh! Oh, I see. Guys like Raft that are ruining the tourist business. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, Mary, I wanted Leo to be my guest, too. I wasn't going to charge him. Oh, Leo, this is Mary Livingston. Well, hello, Miss Livingston. Or may I call you Mary? I've listened to you so often on the radio, I feel I almost know you. Thanks. Gee, how can such a sweet fellow slug an umpire? <laughs> Mary, it's easy, sister. <laughs> good, 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 good. And Leo, uh, Leo, uh, good, good. Leo, uh, <laughs> Leo, this is Don Wilson, our announcer, and Dennis Day, our young tenor. Hello, fellas. Oh, glad to know you, Leo. Say, I was wondering about the World Series, Mr. DeRocha. Who won, the Dodgers or the Yankees? Is that Mick looking for trouble? <laughs> no, no, no. No, forget it, Leo. It's a long story. But, Leo, remember when I saw you that first game at the Yankee Stadium and I said to you, how does it look, kid? And I said, we'll moiter him? Yeah. And then you lost four games out of five. What happened? Well, you can't tell about those things. It's like your radio program. You don't have a good one every week, do you? No, but we... We don't have four bad ones out of five. Look, Jackson, you've been called bums as often as we have. <laughs> oh, I... Look at I... I didn't look at it quite that way. Come know? on, Leo, let's go. Let's get out of here. Now, wait a minute, Phil. I want to talk to him. Say, Leo, uh, didn't I hear you... I mean, weren't you on Fred Allen's program a few weeks ago? Yeah, what a sweet guy. I got laughs on his show. Get laughs here if you'd read your lines right. You know? <laughs> Don't ad live with me, brother. I'm pretty fast on those answers. Now, go on. You don't even know how many hairs on a monkey's face. Oh, yeah? Well, the next time I shave, I'll count them. <laughs> Wait. What am I saying? That was wrong. Give me that again, Leo. Come on, Leo, will you? Let's go. Georgie's waiting for us across the street at the tropics. Come oh. on. Okay. Georgie, is Raft having dinner with you two guys? Yes. You want to join us? Sure, I'll be glad to. Oh, Don, carry on with the show, will you? Who am I going to talk to, Dennis? Mary is here. Stick out your stomach, and she's good for three jokes. <laughs> Come on, Leo. Let's go, Phil. Come on. Well, Leo, I'm sure glad you came out to Hollywood. No hard feelings, even though I lost a little dough on the Dodgers. Reminds me, I owe Jesse $50. But I want to tell you something, Leo. You got a great ball club there. And next time, you'll be right back in the series. I know I'm going to bet on you, and I'll bet on you every time you play. That's me. I'm a stick with you. Here's a dessert, friends, that certainly does live up to its beautiful name. It's called Hawaiian Sunburst. And you've never seen a dessert that's more glamorous and attractive. Just picture it. A shimmering mold of deep crimson raspberry jello surrounded in a sunburst effect of shining wedges of golden Hawaiian pineapple. And how easy it is to make. You just dissolve a package of jello imitation raspberry flavor in one and one half cups of hot water. Then add one fourth teaspoon of salt one half cup of the juice from the can of pineapple slices. Chill in individual molds and in serving, circle each mold with the wedge-shaped pieces of canned sliced pineapple. What a delight to the eye and a treat to the taste. So get them both and make up this lovely, luscious dessert, but be sure when you buy to ask for Jell-O, because only Jell-O's new locked-in process gives you all the flavor, always. We're a little late, so good night, folks. Did you know that the folks who make Jell-O also make three of the most delicious puddings you ever tasted? Jell-O chocolate, Jell-O vanilla, and Jell-O butterscotch puddings. And are they swell? Take Jell-O vanilla pudding. Why, even Grandma would be proud to make a pudding as smooth and rich as this one. Its wonderful homemade flavor lends itself to luscious puddings, cream pies, tarts, cakes with cream fillings, and lots of other grand desserts. And it takes only a few pennies to buy, a few minutes to make. Tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, ask for Jell-O puddings, too. Jell-O puddings are just like Grandma's, only more so. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. KFI, Los Angeles. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O puddings, starring Jack Benny. 
With Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with Free for All. <laughs> Such swell, rich flavor. That's what you're going to say, friends, the very first time you taste the new Jell-O. Because Jell-O today is extra rich thanks to a new and exclusive Jell-O process. By means of this amazing process, Jell-O's glorious goodness is locked in, protected for your pleasure. And never before has Jell-O tasted so downright grand. Never before has it been a more perfect dessert, a more delicious treat. You'll enjoy it more than ever now that Jell-O's famous flavor is locked right into the tiny Jell-O particles. Just try it and see. Prove for yourself that Jell-O's flavor really is locked in. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice that there's no telltale odor, no sweet, fruity aroma to warn of escaping flavor. But the instant you dissolve the Jell-O into a grand Jell-O dessert, out pours its captive flavor to make that dessert a wonderfully rich, tempting treat. So order several packages of Jell-O tomorrow. Remember, Jell-O's new locked-in flavor makes Jell-O more than ever the dessert for you. played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, daylight saving time goes into effect tomorrow and clocks throughout the country will be moved one hour ahead. That's right. So, without further ado, we bring you a man who will have only 11 hours sleep tonight instead of his usual 12, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Jalo again, this is Jack Benny talking. And Don, I don't know where you got the impression that I sleep 12 hours a night. I'm up bright and early in the morning, the same as everybody else. Yes, Jack, but look at the time you go to bed. By 9 o'clock every night, you're in dreamland. And not on Wednesday nights. They don't raffle off the Plymouth at the Oriental until 9.30. <laughs> By the time I get through arguing with the manager, it's usually 2 in the morning. What's the idea of arguing with the manager? Listen, Don, I've been going to that theater for years now. It's about time I want a slab of bacon or something. <laughs> Anything. Huh? You mean as often as you've gone there, you've never won a prize? Well, my number was called on two different occasions, but, um, oh, forget it. No, 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 Jack. No, Jack, what happened? Well, you see, Don, when they call your number, you have to get up to the stage within 60 seconds. Uh-huh. Well, the first time, I didn't get there fast enough. And the second time, I was disqualified for wearing roller skates. <laughs> I missed out on a case of minute tapioca. <laughs> uh, anyway, Don, getting back to your introduction, you'll have to admit that it was hardly fair. Oh, come now, Jack. Just because you get to bed late on Wednesday nights, that doesn't make you a night owl. Well, it's not only Wednesday, big boy. Uh, you know, uh, you know what time I hit the hay last night? 4 a.m. 4 a.m.? My goodness, were you out night clubbing? Uh, no, it was Mr. Billingsley's fault. He was playing soldier outside my bedroom door, and just because I didn't know the password, he wouldn't let me in. <laughs> uh, I'll know it, uh, I'll know it tonight, believe me. What is the password, Jack? Well, it's it's not exactly a word, Don. I just have to go... A couple of times. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. What are you... about? 
Oh, it's just a password. Thank heaven. I thought radio had finally smacked you down. <laughs> no, no, nothing like that. My ears ring frequently, but that's about <laughs> all. I... That's good. Say, Jack, did you tell Don the bad news? Not yet. What bad news? Well, on account of daylight saving next week, Jack is going to dock us all one hour's pay. One hour's pay? It's only for the duration. <laughs> You'll get it back as soon as the war is over. The hour or the money? Both. <laughs> it's wartime. And if there are any more objections, just read your contract. Who can read it? You've got one whole page written in Eskimo. <laughs> well? Mine, too. Now, what's the big idea? Because when the contracts were drawn up, my lawyers happened to be Smith, Smythe, Mullen, and Mooseface. <laughs> now, drop it. Leave it to Benny to get a lawyer that can spear fish for him, too. Mary, I retain Moose Face by the year. What's he going to do when someone isn't suing me? Just sit around? Be reasonable. Say, uh, Jack, what does that Eskimo clause in our contract mean? I I've never had it translated. I have. It says that uh, actor who want rays can put high heels on snowshoes. <laughs> well, that's not a literal translation, but that's the gist of it. And I don't want you all reading your contract. If I hear another word about contracts, I'll scream. <laughs> Uh, Virgil, Virgil, just make with the noise a no dialogue. You're only the sound man here. Well, I get more fan mail than you, you old tin type. <laughs> get away from that microphone. I'll beat it. Oh, Jack, stop picking on Virgil. He's very important to our show, and you know it. Important? Yes, in all our plays, he opens doors, rings bells, shoots guns. Oh. And when you're supposed to walk down the street, Virgil walks for you. Virgil walks for me? Well, any sound man can do that. With your flat feet? That's hard, Daddy. <laughs> Virgil, I told you to get away from that mic. I never saw a guy with such Hey, a... Jack, here comes night school Joe. Oh, yes, our, our French student. Hello, Phil. Bonsoir, folks, bonsoir. Hello, Jacquees. <laughs> Jacquees. And Marie and Dune. Dune? Phil, a dune is a great big pile of sand. But I guess you're right. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, uh, why don't you cut out that French? The stuff you say doesn't even make sense. Well, I learned a new one this week. Get a load of this, Jackson. Ma, orchestre, travail, don, dune, soupier. Hmm. What does that mean? My orchestra works in the soup tureen. <laughs> Your orchestra works in the soup tureen? Yeah, that's as close as I could get to Biltmore Bowl. <laughs> Oh, well, Phil, don't you think that before taking up a foreign language, you ought to learn how to speak English? And what's wrong with my English, may I ask? You're kidding, of course. <laughs> and now, folks... No, I ain't. What's wrong with my English? Phil, I met a Fiji Islander once with a ring in his nose who had only been in this country three weeks, and he speaks better English than you do. Much better. Well, then I gotta get one of them rings. <laughs> Won't help you, believe me. Let him get one. This is an emergency. Mary, if Phil ever puts a ring in his nose, Alice will sna snap a leash on it, sure as anything. And now, folks, Phil Harris and his 18 dreamboats will entertain us with a band number. Hit it, Phil. Wee oui, wee, oui, amigo. <laughs> Phil, amigo is Spanish. You're talking Spanish now. Then I want more money. Oh, play. <laughs> play, go ahead. Hold it a minute. Come in. Benny? Yes? Do you recognize me? No, I don't. Well, that's my fault. I should never have taken that ring out of my nose. <laughs> Get out of here. He's a Fiji Islander, all right. Look at that bushy head of hair. <laughs> Play, amigo.
that was a medley of Deep in the Heart of Texas and the Eyes of Texas Are Upon You, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra, who may be heard nightly except Sunday in the soup terrine of the Biltmore Bowl. <laughs> Say, Phil, uh, that medley was really thrilling. Uh, how'd you happen to play it? Well, I got a lot of pals in Texas, and I don't want them to forget me. Oh, yes. You and the boys work down there every summer, don't you? Yeah. Last year, we did one-night stands in Fort Worth, Dallas, and Galveston, and then we played three months in Van Horn. <laughs> three months, eh? Yeah, that's what they gave my guitar player for stealing the cow. <laughs> Uh, uh, stealing a cow. Well, he didn't exactly steal it. He tried to elope with it. You know how frank he is when he drinks. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He he must have eloped with that guitar, too. It's got Gene Autry's name on it. (laughs) Now, let's see, um... Let's see, where are we? Well, it's about time for my play, isn't it, Jack? Oh, yes, yes, your play. And now, folks, uh, Mr. Don Wilson, that eminent American author, has written another of his famous one-act plays. Take it, Dune Wilson. (coughs) Ladies and gentlemen, the scene is the honeymoon cottage of a young couple who have just been married. The bride, played by Mary Livingston... (coughs) Mary. is awaiting the arrival of her husband, for whom she has just prepared her first dinner. We take you now to the home of Mr. and Mrs. Typical American. Oh, dear, it's 7 o'clock and my husband isn't home yet. Ah, here he comes now. Hello, sweetheart. Hello. Did you have a busy day at the office, Typical? (laughs) <laughs> oh, awful That fresh boss of mine had me sitting on her knee all day I'm a secretary, folks Well, look what's on the table Are you working a jigsaw puzzle, darling? Uh, no, that's your dinner Yipe! <laughs> so you surprise me, eh, darling? Yes, yeah, sit down, Tippy. My, this looks so good. Uh, What would you like with your dinner, sweetheart? Coffee, tea, or milk? Milk, please. Okay. (laughs) Virgil, the cow is milked already. (laughs) The milk's in the bottle. Now pay attention. Well, look at those homemade biscuits. Look at those homemade biscuits. Did you make them yourself? Yes, take this hammer and butter them. They are. <laughs> they are a little cementy. And my goodness, look at this platter of meat. You'll love it, dear. It's Swiss steak. Swiss steak? Ole, ole, hee-hoo! <laughs> Virgil, what's the matter with you? You're spoiling the illusion. Now sit down and take that alpine hat off your head. The cheese, too? Yes. <laughs> The whole darn outfit. Now let us alone so we can eat. 30 minutes later. Calling all cars, calling all cars. Go to the home of typical American. He has a beautiful wife and a cute indigestion. (laughs) Ooh. Darling, what's the matter? Typical. Typical, speak to me. Ooh. Poor boy. Well? It looks like I'll have to eat this bowl of tempting and economical jello all by myself. Oh, no, you don't. Give me some of that, too. Even you can make jello right. I thank you. Don, that was really marvelous. How did you ever think of such a clever commercial? Well, I was sleeping on my back last night, and I dreamt it. Well, tummy down tonight, please. <laughs> uh, not, uh, not that I didn't like it, Don, but, well, I thought you were lost, Dennis. Where were you, kid? I'm not a kid anymore. I just fell in a manhole. <laughs> oh, fine. He fell in a manhole. Fell in a manhole, that makes him a man. I suppose if you you fell in a gopher hole, you'd be a gopher. Yeah. Jack's 
fell in a rat hole once. Oh, quiet. <laughs> anyway, I'm, uh, I'm glad you got here, Dennis. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Oh, say, Mr. Benny, have I got a surprise for you? Have I got a surprise? Uh, later, later, kid. For our feature attraction, this... What do you mean, surprise? Here, read this. I cut it out of a radio column. Let's see it. So, so, this. Well, I'll be darned. Get a load of this, fellas. It is reported officially from New York that starting March 8th, Fred Allen will switch the time of his broadcast from Wednesday to Sunday night. Imagine. Well, I knew that. He's replacing the Sunday evening symphony hour. Allen's replacing the symphony hour? Well, they better tell everybody in advance, or when they hear Allen's voice, they'll think it's an old bassoon left over. <laughs> Anyway, if Alan goes on the air Sundays, I'm going off. I can make a darn good living out of pictures. Oh, how many postcards of your house do you sell a week? <laughs> Plenty, sister. Anyway, I don't want Alan on the air the same day as I am. But, Jack, there are a lot of comedians besides you on Sunday night. One more won't hurt. A lot of comedians? Name one. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. That's two. Name one. <laughs> No, I, I, I dare you. Oh, Jack, you know very well that Edgar Bergen plays both parts. McCarthy is a dummy. Oh, oh, so you're falling for that stuff too, eh? <laughs> I happen to know that Charlie McCarthy is just as much flesh and blood as I am. On flesh, I won't argue. <laughs> no argument on blood either. I got plenty in my veins. Mr. Benny is right. I gave him a transfusion yesterday. <laughs> you didn't give me anything. I paid you $5 a gallon. <laughs> Be quiet. Gee, I'm so weak, I can hardly stand up. <laughs> well, well, it's your own fault. You didn't say when. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, I've, I've got to do something about Alan. Gosh, I'm dizzy. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, eat liver. You'll get it back. <laughs> I know what, Mary. Mary, get me Mr. John Swallow on the phone. His private extension is 309. Okay. I'm going to nip this in the bud. He's the program manager. I'm going to straighten out this Allen Sunday night situation. I don't get mad often, but when I do... Hello? Hello, uh, Mr. Swallow. Oh. Hello, Mr. Swallow. Why didn't you get back from Pat's <laughs> Give me that phone. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mr. Swallow, this is Jack Benny Say, I just found out something and I'd like to talk to you about it Now, I'm not going to stand for any... I'm glad you called, Jack what? Mr. Williams, the, uh, the censor, tells me he's been having a little trouble with you Trouble with the censor? Who, me? Yes, now, Jack, when he tells you to take a joke out of your program, don't argue about it Take it out What? Wait a minute, Mr. Swallow are you referring to the gag we were going to do about cooking flapjacks on a griddle? I certainly am, and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Well, well, for heaven's sake, what's wrong with cooking flapjacks on a griddle? The word griddle sounds exactly like girdle. <laughs> <laughs> sounds exactly... Mr. Swallow, I defy you, Mr. Williams, or Oscar of the Waldorf, to cook flapjacks on a girdle. <laughs> It can't be done. That's not the point. The line is still double entendre. And don't pull that Phil Harris stuff. <laughs> I like that griddle gag very much. Well, it's definitely out. All right, all right. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hmm. Harmless little gag about hotcakes, and I can't even do it. Well, come on, Dennis. Sing your song. Well, what'd you do about Fred Allen? Who? Oh, my goodness. I forgot all about him. I'll take it up later. Well, come on. Come on, Dennis. Let's have a song. Okay. So burned up lately, I must be getting high blood pressure. With my blood, yes. <laughs> oh, quiet, Sting. There must be some way of fixing that Sunday night thing. <laughs> this 
this love of mine goes on and on. All life is empty since you have gone. You're always on my mind. Oh, Was this love of mine sung by Dennis Day? And very good, Dennis. Sure, and it was wonderful, Begotta. And now, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Dennis, your blood is working on him. <laughs> yes, it is at that. Yeah, I wish I wasn't such a tightwad. We'd all get a raise. <laughs> Hooray, I've got an alibi. And now, folks. Hey, uh, Jack, what are you going to do about the Fred Allen situation? Yeah, you going to let that guy get away with it? Well, I've been thinking it over, gentlemen, and I'm going to form a little group that'll take care of him the S A A L C. What's that stand for? Sunday Artists Against Low Comedy. <laughs> I'm going to send letters to Bergen, Abbott and Costello, Phil Baker, Gildersleeve, and all of them. What about me? I'm a Sunday artist. You're a Sunday... Well, I'm having enough trouble with Mr. Swallow. <laughs> but I'll have my lawyer send you a letter anyhow. It only costs $10 to join. That Eskimo isn't getting any $10 out of me, Sugarfoot. <laughs> Who asked you? Now, get this straight, Virgil. You're not a comedian. You're a sound man and not a very good one at that. I don't know why I don't yank that wig right off your head. <laughs> you lay one hand on me and you'll... Oh, Jack, stop pointing at your glasses. He won't hit you. <laughs> Never mind. I got more important things to do than argue with this guy. Until March 8th, I'll be working day and night. You mean to say that you're going to all this trouble just to keep Alan off the air Sundays? I owe it to the public. It's a crusade. That's what it is. Well, gee, I don't know what all this fuss is about. Personally, I think Mr. Allen is wonderful. Dennis, you're fired. <laughs> anyway, Don, get out, get out, scram, kid. <laughs> anyway, Don, I think I'll send you... Leave the music here, Dennis. It's not yours. <laughs> Anyway, Don, get back in the manhole cover. <laughs> I think, Don, I think I'll send you, a, I think I'll send you an application blank, too. And then if we all stick together, we, I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. What do you want? Boss, I always thought that border of ours was cuckoo, and now I know it. Mr. Billingsley, what's the trouble now? He's playing soldier again. This morning, he locked me in my room for three hours. Well, why didn't you give him the password? It's little, 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 little. That was yesterday. Today is... <laughs> oh, so he, so he changed it, eh? Well, I'm glad you told me. I don't want to have to go to a hotel tonight. 
Now, uh, Rochester, you just humor Mr. Billingsley and let him play soldier. He's perfectly harmless. What about that shotgun he carries around? That shotgun isn't loaded. It ain't, eh? No. You know that big picture we got in the library of George Washington crossing the Delaware? Yes. Well, he'll never make it in that boat. It's full of holes. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Rochester. He's going to pay for that painting. He paid for it already. Good. You ought to see his new $5 bills. He's got my picture on them. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. And you know what else, boss? What? You're secretary of the treasury. <laughs> oh, well, he's just having fun. He prints them on Kleenex. He can't be a counterfeiter. Well, Rochester, I'll be home pretty soon, so don't worry. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, oh, say, Rochester, where's Mr. Billingsley now? He's out in the garage squeezing orange juice. Squeezing orange juice in the garage? Yeah, he nails an orange on the wall and then backs the Maxwell into it. <laughs> oh, well, I'll see you in a little while. So long. So long. I was wondering where those yellow spots on my garage wall came from. I thought there was something wrong with my eyes. Play, Phil. <laughs> If you have a family that loves rich, tempting desserts, then don't wait another day to serve this one. It's a delightful jello treat called Imperial Peach Mold, a grand-looking, good-looking dessert that's not only delicious, but easy to make. Here's all there is to it. Simply dissolve one package of orange jello in a pint of hot water and peach juice and chill until slightly thickened. Next, fold in one cup of canned sliced peaches drained. Or, if you wish, use one box of quick-frozen sliced peaches freshly thawed. Then mold and chill until firm. And there's a really special treat, a rich, shimmering combination of juicy sliced peaches and sunny orange jello. So get a can of sliced peaches or a box of quick frozen sliced peaches from your grocer tomorrow and treat yourself to this swell dessert. When you make it, be sure to use genuine jello because jello is extra delicious thanks to its new locked in flavor. We're a little late, so good night, folks. <laughs> Remember this name, folks. Jell-O Butterscotch Pudding. It's the name of one of America's most popular desserts. The name of a grand pudding that's sure to become one of your special favorites. Jell-O Butterscotch Pudding is marvelously smooth and luscious with a swell homemade goodness. And it's full of golden butterscotch flavor. So tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, get Jell-O puddings in all three flavors. Chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. Jell-O puddings are just like grandma's, only more so. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles. Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour.